The Attractor Factor. Five easy steps for creating wealth or anything else from the inside out. By Dr. Joe Vitale. For Bonnie and for Marion, who passed away as I completed this book, I love you. The author's true confession. I admit it. I never wanted to publish this book or make it available to a wide audience. I was scared. I wrote this book for one person, my sister. Bonnie had three kids, was unemployed, and was on welfare. It hurt me to see her suffer. I knew her life could be different if she knew the five-step process I developed for creating whatever you wanted. I wrote this material for her and only for her in 1997. She's now off welfare and doing fine. She's got a house, a car, a job, and a loving family. She's not rich yet, but I think I've shown her a new way to live life. I never wanted to make this book public because I was nervous about how the world would perceive me. I've written 17 books so far for such well-known and conservative organizations as the American Marketing Association and the American Management Association. I also have an audio tape program with Nightingale Conant. I figured if I told the world about my interest in spirituality, people would ridicule me, clients would fire me, and these organizations would shun me. So I played it safe and kept this book a secret. But in June 1999, I felt the inner urge to give a copy of the rough manuscript to Bob Proctor at the beginning of one of his Science of Getting Rich seminars. Bob read it and loved it, and then he did something shocking. There were 250 people in that seminar in Denver. They all wanted to know how to create wealth. Bob stood before them and read off all of my book titles, and then introduced me to the crowd. I stood and the crowd applauded. They treated me like a celebrity, and I loved the attention. But then Bob told everyone about my new book, my unpublished book, about this book. I was surprised. I wasn't ready for this. I held my breath. And then Bob told them the title, which at that time was Spiritual Marketing. There was such a hush throughout the crowd that chills went up my spine. Not only did people favorably react to the book, but they all wanted it right then. At least 50 people came up and said they wanted to buy the book on the spot. Bob Proctor later said he wanted to record it, and one publisher in the seminar said he wanted to publish the book sight unseen. My concerns about publishing this book vanished. I could see that the timing was right to release these ideas, and I saw that I would be safe in doing so. So here I am. As with most things in life, there's little to be afraid of, and wealth and glory await right around the corner. All you have to do is step forward and do the things you're being nudged to do from within. Bob Proctor nudged me in front of 250 people. As a result, I released the e-book called Spiritual Marketing in 2001. The book was an instant success. It became a number one bestseller at Amazon on June 4th and 5th, 2001, which are my parents' birthdays. This book was translated into seven languages. People wrote me from all over the world, attesting that the five steps explained in the book helped them to get a job or heal something incurable or raise money or find true love and more. It was pretty staggering feedback. I began to think, if this material really changes lives, then I must get it out in the world in a bigger way. I need to expand the book and better explain the five steps, and I need a strong publisher, too. I set that statement as my intention, and now you're reading this book. Obviously, I expanded it, updated the information, and found the right publisher as well. That's how the attractor factor works. But before I explain the five-step process, let me say a few things.
Miracles Never Stop. More miracles have happened to me since writing the little booklet in 1997 that evolved into what you are now listening to. Here are a few of them. When I first wrote this book and described the car of my dreams, the car of my dreams at that time was a Saturn. I've now upgraded my dream and my car. I'm now driving a BMW Z3 2.8 Roadster. I've never in my life had so much fun driving. As I grew in my life and became bolder about going for my dreams, I also naturally wanted a different vehicle. I was led to the Z3, which symbolizes the major changes in my life, and it is a hoot to drive as well. You truly can have anything you can imagine. When I first wrote this book, I was still married to Marion, whom I had been with for more than twenty years. Since then, we decided we had grown apart. There was nothing negative about the experience or the decision at all. Marion decided she preferred being alone. I decided to look for another partner. I found one too in Nerissa, who I am deeply in love with. I'm still friends with Marion, and both are now in my heart. I'm a lucky man. Major changes in life can truly be easy and effortless. When I first wrote this book, I made a goal that I wanted passive income. I wanted money to come to me easily and effortlessly, always, consistently. No matter where I was or what I was doing, I was then led to meet Mark Joyner, then CEO of Aesop Marketing, who asked if he could put one of my books online as an e-book. I was skeptical, but I gave him hypnotic writing, a manuscript I wrote many years ago. Mark put it online, marketed it, and the sales blew my socks off. Even now, years after the book went online at www.hypnoticwriting.com, orders keep coming in. Since there is no book to print, stock or mail, all the money is passive income. Every month I receive a check, sometimes for staggering amounts. And since I now have over a dozen e-books out there, including the bestseller "How to Create Your Own E-Book in Only Seven Days" at www.sevendayebook.com, the checks are even bigger. Now I smile a lot. I know that when you set an intention, you set the forces of life to bring it to you and you to it. When I first wrote this book, I was living in Houston, Texas. After I met Nerissa, I moved to Austin. I then began the process of attracting our dream home. After a few months, we found a beautiful two-acre, two-story, hill country property with wandering wild deer and rabbit, and an outside pool, between Austin and San Antonio, located in a small spiritual artistic community called Wimberley, Texas. Finding this home was a matter of having a clear image of what I wanted, while following every intuitive impulse I had. The result was a miracle. I could go on. For example, a man I studied some twenty years ago was Dr. Robert Anthony. His famous books and tapes changed my life. After I came out with an early version of this material, he read it and contacted me. Now the man who was once one of my gurus is now one of my business partners. I ended up producing, recording, and marketing his terrific audio program, Beyond Positive Thinking. I think it's the greatest self-improvement material of all time, and I'm involved with it. Attraction works. I just sat down with Nerissa and talked to her about the ongoing miracles in my life. It happens to you all the time," she said. She mentioned that just the other day I wanted to book us a flight to Ohio to see my family. Tickets were nearly one thousand dollars. I simply expected to get a better deal while being willing to accept the going fare. When I called the airline back, they told me I had enough frequent flyer miles to get both tickets for just over one hundred dollars. Way cool. And Nerissa reminded me of the time I wanted to complete my collection of rare books by P. T. Barnum, a man I had studied and written a book about. 
I found the last book I needed, but my intuition said not to pay the high price the bookseller was asking. So I let go. I waited. A few days later, the bookseller lowered his price. That's almost unheard of. And yes, I bought the book. And Nerissa reminded me of the time I looked for one book for nearly seven years and couldn't find it. I gave up. But I decided I would attract it, somehow, some way. Then, out of the blue, an email friend in Canada wrote me that he had the book. I begged to buy it. He declined. But a few days later, he suddenly decided to just send me the book, at no charge. And Nerissa remembered that a year or so ago, when I couldn't find a friend of mine that I loved and missed, I gave up and hired a private investigator. He couldn't find my friend either, so I quit looking. But I made a decision to attract her back into my life. Then one day, simply following my intuition, I walked right up to my friend at a yoga class. I found her without breaking a sweat. Nerissa also reminded me to tell you what happened just yesterday while writing this very preface. I have been studying the Sedona method for months now. It's a very simple method for releasing any emotion or negative experience in the way of your being happy right now. I like the method and have told many people about it through my monthly e-newsletter. I was reading a book by Lester Levinson, the founder of the Sedona Method, just yesterday morning. I sat in my easy chair, reading, feeling happy, wondering how I might learn more about Sedona and Lester. I remember thinking, gee, it sure would be nice to meet some Sedona people and learn more about what they do. That same day, I checked my email, and to my delighted surprise, there was a message from the director of the Sedona Institute. He had heard about me through the grapevine and wanted to talk to me about how I could help promote their website at www.sedona.com. Wow! And then there are the countless times when I want more money for something or other, and I get a brainstorm that pulls in an abundance of money fast. One time when I needed to raise $20,000, I almost led a seminar on spiritual marketing to get it. Instead, I felt guided to see if anyone would sign up for it online and take it as an e-class. I announced that the class would only be done by email, would last only five weeks, and would cost $1,500 per person. Fifteen people signed up, bringing me a whopping sum of money in one day. Very nice. I have since taught my e-class system to others. They have made upwards of a quarter of a million dollars per year with it. In most cases, I received almost half as payment for my consulting. You know I like that. You have miracles happen all the time, Nerissa repeated to me. Why do you think that is, I asked her. It certainly wasn't always that way. Because you now practice the attractor factor, she explained, you make yourself a magnet for whatever you want. Once you decide you want something, you get it, often almost instantly. Well, there's no question about it. If I tried to document all the miracles that keep occurring in just my life alone because of the attractor factor, I'd never stop writing this book and never get around to releasing it to the public. My point is this. The five-step formula you are about to discover works. And because it works, I want you to have it. I once told Nerissa that there is an easy path through life and a hard path. When I first met her, she was crawling up the rocky side of the mountain. I pointed out that there is an escalator through life, too. You can take the hard path or the easy path. It's all your choice. When I first met Nerissa, she was unhappy, battling a lawsuit against construction workers who messed up her roof, fighting with her mother almost every day, hating her job, and more. Within a few months of discovering the attractor factor, she ended the lawsuit, found common ground with her mother, 
quit her job and now has two ebooks out there and a growing internet business. She's now known as the Video Queen. She also lives with me in our country estate. She says she is happier now than at any other time in her life, ever. Again, there is a rocky road through life, and then there's an escalator. Which do you prefer? The attractor factor shows you the way to glide through life. Why not step up and enjoy the ride? What are you dismissing? I had lunch with a dear friend the other day. Although I enjoyed the company and the food, I left feeling a little lower in energy. When I thought about it, I realized my friend was brilliant at dismissing every book, concept, guru, self-help method, or healing approach he had read or heard about. He was not directly negative or purposely critical. He sincerely wanted something that would work in his life. But he was unconsciously dismissing everything that came his way. At one point, I told him about a spiritual teacher I had studied over two decades ago. I told him that people said my teacher was obviously enlightened. He radiated it. My friend cut in, saying, "I'm sure there are people who saw that guru and didn't think he was any smarter than a paper bag." Well, my friend is right, but my friend is also unhappy. I think there's a lesson here. When we dismiss people and ideas because the entire world doesn't agree with them, we get to be right, but we also get to stay empty inside. By dismissing what could work, we dismiss our own growth. We dismiss what's possible. It doesn't matter if the book you read and love is loved by anyone else. It doesn't matter if the teacher you admire is admired by anyone else. It doesn't matter if the healing method that worked for you doesn't work for everyone else. What matters is you, your happiness, your health. Your healing, your well-being. The truth is, no method works for everyone. No teacher is right for everyone. No book is going to inspire everyone. It all comes from within. You are the first and final authority on your life. Rather than dismissing what is possible so that you can be right, what can you accept? So that you can grow. Dismissing is often a way to deflect the messages. It's a self-defense mechanism. If you dismiss the book, idea, or method offered to you, you get to be right and stay right where you are. Doctor Richard Gillette, writing in his wonderful book *Change Your Mind, Change Your World*, states. Disapproval is surprisingly the most reliable indication of a hidden belief system. Quite often, the only way disguised beliefs show themselves is through moments of emotional judgment or disapproval. All the successful people I know have accepted new tools into their lives over the years, spent thousands of dollars on personal growth and self-study, and never regretted any of it. The key is not dismissing or disapproving, but digesting. For example, Nerissa and I had dinner with friends recently. One friend was complaining about her job. From her perspective, there was no way out of the misery she felt at her place of work. Bad boss, bad hours, bad pay—you name it, it was bad. Later, we were joined by other friends. As chance would have it, one of the new friends had connections where our complaining friend worked. He gave our unhappy friend a name and said he could help her resolve her issues. He went on to say that this connection was a supervisor, head of many departments, and could possibly resolve whatever was wrong. I was stunned. So was Nerissa. We were seeing magic happen right before our eyes. But what did our unhappy friend do with her new lead and new hope? 
she dismissed it. She didn't write down the name or the number or show any signs that something wonderful had just occurred. Now, do you see how this works? Sometimes we can self-sabotage the things we say we want. We simply dismiss the good. People often write and ask me what one single product can they get that will transform their lives. When I tell them I so love Dr. Robert Anthony's material that I financed, recorded, and now market his Beyond Positive Thinking CD set, they are sold. They go to www.beyondpositivethinking.com and buy it. Yet, some people complain. It costs $99. Uh, of course it costs money, and that's incredibly low for a studio-quality, life-changing set of six audios. Are you going to pay it and get what you want, or are you going to dismiss the greatest self-help material of all time? Do you want the good you say you seek, or don't you? Let me end this with another example. Yesterday I received a letter in the mail about a new audio program about dissolving illusions. I read the piece, but dismissed it. I figured it was simply stuff I had already heard before and probably even recorded elsewhere myself. Then today, I got another mailing. This time it was from a different source, but selling the exact same audio program. I read it over closely. I thought, this is interesting, but I bet there's little new in it. I then placed the mailing aside. But an hour or so later, as I was reviewing this very chapter you're listening to right now, I suddenly realized that I was doing the very thing I am warning you not to do. I was dismissing an opportunity to learn. I dug out the mailing, filled out the order form, and dropped it in the mail. The audios are on the way. Now, the point is not that you buy everything that comes your way but that you don't dismiss everything that comes your way. Sometimes a dismissal is a mask. It's your self-sabotage at work keeping you where you're at. To grow, you must be open. Again, you are the final authority on your life. Tune in to yourself and do what's right for you. And as you do this, be alert to those times when you may be dismissing the next gift to come your way. Let your guard down and let life in. How to Attract Money What do you do, I asked. I was standing in a line of 700 people in a hotel in Seattle, waiting to spend a day listening to an author and spiritual teacher. I do energy work, the woman beside me replied. It's hard to explain. It's different for each person. Do you have a business card, I asked. No, she said, slightly embarrassed. I was shocked. Let me ask you a question, I began. There are over 700 potential clients here for you. Why don't you at least have business cards? A woman beside her smiled and told her, You were just hit by an angel. Well, I'm not an angel, but I was curious why this businesswoman was missing a huge marketing opportunity. As I talked to a few more of the 700 people at this event, I realized all of these people were in business for themselves, and they all needed help in marketing themselves. That's when it dawned on me that I could write a concise handbook on spiritually-based manifesting. No one else seemed better qualified. I'm the author of the AMA Complete Guide to Small Business Advertising for the American Marketing Association, and I have over 15 years of experience in metaphysics and spirituality. I've interviewed many self-help spokespeople and have had some of them as my clients. Besides, I had already created and tested a secret five-step process for attracting anything you wanted. I also knew that those 700 people at the seminar represented a still larger group of people who need help with their businesses and with their lives. I further knew that they were all doing something inside themselves that was creating their outer results. 
In other words, their inner state of being was creating their business or lack of it. Put more simply, the woman who didn't have a business card had an inner insecurity about her business that showed up in her life by her not having business cards. Her attractor factor was attracting no business. And taking this logic a step further in the direction I want to take you later in this book, if that woman were truly clear about her business, she wouldn't even need business cards. Business would just come to her. Her inner spirit, her attractor factor, would do her marketing. That's what this book will reveal. I've learned that we are human beings, not human doings. When you reach a clear inner state of being about your service to the world, the world will almost come to you. When you are clear about the car, person, house, job, or anything that you want, you will start to attract it to you. As one successful person said, angels now hand out my business cards. Confused? Well, that's okay. Therapist, author, and friend Mandy Evans says, Confusion is that wonderful state of mind right before clarity. Fundamentals of Prosperity Maybe the following story will give you a glimpse of what I'm talking about and set the stage for what is to follow. I once read a delightful old book from 1920 entitled Fundamentals of Prosperity by Roger Babson. He ended his book by asking the President of the Argentine Republic why South America, with all of its natural resources and wonders, was so far behind North America in terms of progress and marketing. The President replied, I have come to this conclusion. South America was settled by the Spanish who came to South America in search of gold. But North America was settled by the Pilgrim Fathers who went there in search of God. Where is your focus? On money or on spirit? On the goals you want or on the spirit that brings them? How to Become a Millionaire Years ago, Scrawly Blotnik conducted a study of 1,500 people. They were put into two categories. Category A said they would pursue money first and do what they really wanted to do later. Over 1,245 people went into that group. Category B, made up of 255 people, said they would seek their interests first and trust that money would follow later. What happened? Twenty years later, there were 101 millionaires from the entire group. Only one came from Group A. The remaining 100 millionaires all came from Group B, the group that said they would pursue their passions first and let money come later. Right there is another clue on how to attract money. Where is your focus? On money or passion? Welcome to the Attractor Factor. In this book, I offer a new way for you to easily and effortlessly increase your business, find your love, improve your health, attract more money, or anything else you can imagine. It's based on timeless spiritual principles. It will reveal how your inner state of being attracts and creates your outer results, and what to do about it so that you can have, do, or be whatever your heart desires. I call it the attractor factor. It is truly a spiritual formula for success that never fails. Do the techniques work? The proof will be in the pudding. Try them and see. Oh, I can tell you about the successes I've had, and I do in this recording, but nothing will be quite as convincing to you as using these simple ideas and seeing your own amazing results. I could tell you that this method will help you manifest anything you want. You'll read about people who created cars and homes, healed themselves of cancer, created new relationships, and attracted more money. 
but I'm focusing on attracting wealth in business because there appears to be a serious lack of spirituality in business. And I'm going to let you discover the magic of marketing with spirit because nothing will be more powerful than your own first-hand experiences. So pull up a chair, get comfortable, take a deep breath, relax. Let's talk about how you can increase your wealth and achieve anything else you may desire through the magic power of the attractor factor. It all begins with understanding that your life can be another way. It can be another way. Before I became a marketing specialist and author, I was an inner world journalist for over 10 years, writing for several leading edge magazines. As a result, I've seen miracles with my own eyes. For example, I interviewed Mier Schneider, a man who was diagnosed as blind. He was given a certificate saying he was incurably blind, and yet today he sees, he reads, he writes, he drives a car, and he has helped hundreds of people regain their vision as well. I once spent time with Barry and Susie Kaufman at their Option Institute and saw and heard of miracles there. Their own child was born autistic. They were told to give up on him, but they didn't. They worked with their son, loved him, nurtured him, accepted him, and healed him. Today he lives as an above-average, happy, successful adult. I've sat in dozens of workshops where I saw people heal their relationships with their lovers, their parents, their kids. I've interviewed gurus and mentors, talked to people who have had incurable problems dissolved, and I've experienced miracles firsthand in my own life. I've come to believe that nothing, nothing is impossible. The Healer's Healer For more than 10 years, I worked with Jonathan Jacobs, a man called the Healer's Healer, because his track record for helping heal people is so stunning that doctors referred their own patients to him. I've seen Jonathan take people with everything from money problems to back injuries to cancer and help heal them, often in a single session. I've tasted this myself. For most of my life, I struggled with money. When I lived in Dallas some 30 years ago, I was homeless and starving. I shoplifted to eat. And when I moved to Houston 25 years ago, I found it a frustrating nightmare to come up with $200 a month to live in a dump. It was hell. Yet I went through it for nearly 15 years. 15 years! Then, after doing a few sessions with Jonathan, I somehow let go of my old beliefs about money, installed new ones, and now my finances are so amazingly different that I am often in awe that I have so much. New cars, new home, world travel, more clients than I can handle, and a constant stream of cash that keeps me above water at all times. I pay every bill that arrives, when it arrives, and I never experience lack. I attract money easily now. What happened? How can Mier cure the blind? The Kaufmans heal autism. Jonathan help people with any list of problems. How can I have money when for a decade I had next to nothing? It begins with knowing that it can be another way. That's what I want you to understand right now. That no matter what is happening in your life, no matter what you think will happen, it can be another way. The direction you appear to be headed can be altered. Nothing is set in concrete. In fact, as you'll see, everything in life seems to be plastic. You can mold it to fit what you want and where you want to go. Even right now, as you listen to these words, you can begin to play with new possibilities. What do you want to be? do or have. Win the lotto? Why not? Increase your business? Why not? Heal something? Why not? Have more money? Why not? A friend of mine asked, how do you know what is impossible? I replied, 
How do you know what isn't? Shore leave. I believe our planet is what was described in an original Star Trek television episode called Shore Leave. When Kirk and his team land on a planet to check it out before sending the rest of the crew down for some much-needed rest and relaxation, they begin to experience odd events. McCoy sees a huge white rabbit. Sulu sees an ancient samurai who chases him. Kirk sees an old lover and an old rival classmate. After experiencing the joys and sorrows of these events, it finally dawns on the crew, thanks to Spock, of course, that they are on a planet that reads their thoughts and creates what they think about. I think Earth is that planet. What you hold in your mind with energy and focus will tend to be created in your reality. You'll attract it. It takes a little longer to experience results because we keep changing our minds. Imagine going to a restaurant and ordering chicken soup. But before it arrives, you change your order to wonton soup. And before that arrives, you change your order back to chicken soup. You'll sit there and complain, saying, I can never get what I want, when in reality, you are the reason your soup is late. Most of us do that every day. Our indecision makes attracting what we want nearly impossible. No wonder you end up feeling that you can't get what you want. Yet it doesn't have to be that way. Consider what Francis Larimore Warner wrote in Our Invisible Supply, Part 1, in 1907. Spirit is substance which forms itself according to your demands and must have a pattern from which to work. A pan of dough is as willing to be formed into bread as biscuit. It makes as little difference to spirit what we demand. That's the foundation of the five-step process I'll describe in this recording. Knowing that life can be different for you, and that life itself will support you in what you want. It's called the attractor factor. Here's a clue to how it works, written by Genevieve Bayran in her 1921 book, your invisible power. Try to remember that the picture you think, feel, and see is reflected into the universal mind, and by the natural law of reciprocal action must return to you in either spiritual or physical form. A shortcut to attracting whatever you want. Let me tell you a little secret. You don't need to practice the five steps in this recording to manifest your desires or attract more wealth. Nope. There is an easier way. I'll tell you what it is if you promise not to spread this secret around. Deal? Here's the secret. What I call the shortcut to creating the life the way you want it. Be happy now. That's it. If you can be happy right now, in this moment, you will have achieved whatever you want. Why? Because underneath everything you say you want is the desire for happiness. In 1917, Ralph Parlette wrote in his book, The Big Business of Life, Whatever we do, we are doing it to be happy, whether we realize it or not. You want a new car, so you'll be happy. You want more money, so you will be happy. You want better health, so you will be happy. You want that loving or lusty relationship, so you will be happy. Happiness is your goal. And here's another secret. You don't need to have anything else in order to be happy right now. You can choose to be happy. I know that's a tough one to grasp. Just today I received a call from a nurse caring for my best friend. The call was disturbing, to say the least. I was told my friend may need drug rehabilitation. This news was causing me to go into a tailspin, right into unhappiness. A few hours later, I went out for an acupuncture appointment. As I drove through the Texas country hills in the beautiful area where I now live, I realized that I could be happy anyway. My unhappiness wasn't going to help me, or my friend, or my driving. I could choose to be happy. 
Does that sound like a wild thought? We're taught that outer circumstances dictate how we are to feel. What I've learned is that the outer is simply the illusion. Oh, it seems real enough. I agree. But what created the outer is your inner. And that's where the attractor factor comes into play. As Paul Ellsworth wrote in his 1924 classic book, The Mind Magnet, Consciousness is Cause. Let me explain this further. An Introduction to the Attractor Factor A friend and I were having lunch in my hometown, Niles, Ohio, one day. I was there visiting my parents. My friend wanted to know the key secret to manifesting your own reality and attracting more wealth. I thought for a moment and then said, The hardest concept for most people to grasp is that they are the sole reason they are experiencing whatever they have in their lives. They are totally responsible. I could see my friend's head rear back. How is that possible, he almost shouted. I'm not responsible for a car accident I might get into or for losing my job or anything else that life deals my way. Whew, I took a deep breath. This wasn't going to be easy to explain, but I wanted to give it my best shot. Spirituality is all about taking full responsibility for whatever occurs in your life, I said. Good or bad, it has all come to you from you. Joseph Murphy used to say your life is an outpicturing of your inner pictures. My friend blurted out, I don't sit around picturing car accidents. Well, maybe not consciously, I said, but do you watch the news? Yes, he said. Wouldn't you say the news is all about negative stuff, from accidents to murders to crises in countries we never heard of? Yes, but your mind is soaking up that programming, I explained. And have you ever noticed how movies plant ideas in your mind? What kind of ideas, he asked. Well, ever notice how big business is always the bad guy? You mean like in movies like Wall Street, he asked. Yes, those movies teach you that money is bad, or that it corrupts, or that wealthy people are bad, I went on. The point is, all of this is programming your mind to attract the very things you'd prefer not to experience. My friend was quiet for a minute. I think what you're saying, he began, is that we are all robots, or maybe machines. I've got to admit that's a pretty accurate explanation, I said. Until we wake up, we attract things into our life unconsciously and then declare we didn't do it. I don't know about this, my friend mumbled. I don't know. That means I chose to be an AA and to make a mess of my life. Well, it does mean that, I said, and you did it for your own reasons. Maybe you wanted the challenge to make yourself stronger. Maybe you wanted the experience to help you understand life in certain ways. I don't know. You know, though, somewhere inside you. My friend asked, But what about all the people who come into my life and argue with me or make our lives miserable? Well, my view is that everything in your life is an outpicturing of what is going on inside you, I said. Huh? I smiled, but I knew these were not easy concepts to explain. I often have to reread my own books or much of the success literature out there to grasp the concept of unconscious manifestation or blind attraction. Look, I began, I know a woman who has feminist sensibilities. Because she thinks men are out to rip her off, you can send her to any store by herself, and if a man waits on her, she'll experience him being a chauvinistic pig. Well, maybe the guy is a pig, said my friend. Well, he probably is. But send a woman without the belief that men are out to get her into the same store, and she'll either not get waited on by the guy, won't notice his personality, or will simply not experience what he might otherwise do. So you're saying we're creating it all? All of it? my friend asked. Well, it's like this, I began. This very conversation is a co-creation. 
You wanted to hear someone explain the secrets of the universe. I wanted to articulate these secrets for my new book. We co-created this very conversation. My friend nodded but said, I can see what you mean on something like this, but what if we were in an angry situation and we were fighting over these ideas? What can I say? I knew what he was asking. You probably are asking the same thing. What does it mean when people confront you or you have a fight with your relative or spouse or neighbor? You created that too? You created all of it, I explained. What you see is an outpicturing of what you believe inside yourself. I call it the attractor factor. Well, I don't get it, my friend said. Again, this very conversation is reflecting what I think about this spiritual approach to success, I went on. You mean you created me, my friend asked? I created this moment in our conversation, I said. I needed it for my new book. I attracted you here so we could create this reality. Well, glad to be of service to you, he mumbled. Well, what about where I disagree with you? You create that too? I thought and replied, that's a tough one to accept, but it's true. Your disbelief reflects areas in me where I don't believe everything I'm saying. Joe, this all sounds pretty strange, he said. If this is true, once you are clear about what you believe, then my own doubts will vanish? Well, either that or you simply won't air them to me. My friend said, I got to think about all this. I went on to say, this is the attractor factor. It means you are the source of the experiences you see. You co-created them to have experiences for your own reasons. The world is a mirror of you. Well, it seems like I'd create a prettier world, my friend said. Well, you can now, I said. Now that you are becoming aware of your own inner power, you can begin to consciously create circumstances. You may not do it overnight or master it in this lifetime, but you can begin it right now. How, he asked. Ah, the question I had been waiting for. It all begins with the five-step formula I developed, I explained. It's pretty easy, and you can even shorten the steps once you master them. But the five steps are where it all begins. Well, are you going to tell me the five steps, or do I have to go buy your book, he asked. I'm going to tell you the steps right now, I replied, and then you can go buy my book. What's your prosperity IQ? Before you dive into the next sections of this recording, pause a moment. Take this quick little quiz by prosperity expert Randy Gage and see if you have been infected with lack in limitation programming. This can reflect where your current attractor factor is at work. Here are the questions. 1. Do you secretly fear that if you became wealthy, your family and friends might not like you anymore? 2. When you grew up, were you ever told things like, we may not be rich, but at least we're honest? 3. Did your religious upbringing teach you that it is noble to sacrifice now and that your reward will come in the afterlife? 4. Did you or do you feel guilty when you started to earn more than your parents did? 5. Were you raised to fit in and not do anything to stand out? 6. Did you grow up liking shows like Dallas, Dynasty, Gilligan's Island, MASH, and the Beverly Hillbillies, where rich people were always presented as unscrupulous and conniving or pretentious and bumbling? 7. Do you have chronic health challenges that doctors can't seem to solve? 8. Did you ever get jealous of people with expensive clothes, cars, and houses? which may have led you to develop a subconscious hate-the-rich mentality? 9. On some level, do you think it is somehow noble, romantic, or spiritual to be poor? 
10. Did you ever end a negative relationship, then immediately replace it with another one with a person just like the last one? 11. Have you sometimes used judgmental expressions like poor as a church mouse, filthy rich, or obscenely wealthy? 12. Have you ever made excuses for failure by saying things like, you have to have money to make money, you have to know someone, or you have to get in at the top? 13. Do you relish being the underdog and fighting against the odds all the time? 14. Is it possible that you are experiencing health challenges, financial challenges, or business failures in order to evoke sympathy and attention from the people you are close to? 15. Are you in a stable relationship, have enough money to meet your needs, and basically healthy, but just feel like life is passing you by? How did you score? Tally your results and enter the score of how many yeses and how many noes. If you answered no to 13 to 15 questions, you have a very strong prosperity consciousness and can probably pass this quiz along to someone else. If you answered yes to three or more questions, you likely have some issues of worthiness on a subconscious level. You may be in a holding pattern, afraid to leave your comfort zone. You're probably not radically unhappy, but there is no passion and excitement in your life. You know something is missing, but you may not know what. If you answered yes to five or more questions, you are quite likely in a stagnancy cycle. You make small advances, but also experience setbacks so that you are not really breaking through to the real success and happiness you desire and deserve. If you answered yes to seven or more questions, you are headed toward or already experiencing a definite downward track toward serious emotional, physical, and financial challenges. This is the kind of victim cycle Randy Gage was on when he lost everything when he was 30 before transforming his life and becoming a multi-millionaire. It is imperative that you take immediate action to break the pattern and stop the failure cycle. This will involve uncovering the limiting beliefs you possess on a subconscious level and radically reprogramming yourself with positive ones. Now, if you fall into one of the last three categories, Randy Gage's Prosperity Power Experience can definitely help you. Visit www.myprosperitysecrets.com for help in prosperity thinking. Cause new people to contact me. All of these people had their own network of people. More often than not, these networks were at a higher level than anything I had ever touched before. Here's another example. When I wrote my book on P.T. Barnum called There's a Customer Born Every Minute for the American Management Association back in 1997, I managed to get the attention of famous tycoons like Donald Trump and Kenneth Feld. Clearly, I had been introduced to a new level. If you want to succeed in phenomenal ways today, you need to go up a level or two in the status scale of networks. The good news is email makes this a snap to begin. Anyone alive can be reached through email with some persistence and cleverness. That's how I first reached marketing superstar J. Conrad Levinson, direct mail legend Joe Sugarman, and even Gonzo Daredevil Evil Knievel. I did it all by email. People write me all the time for favors. I'm now perceived as an expert, an authority, and an internet marketing pioneer. They want to associate their name or product with me. I love to help people, so I usually at least give people a chance. But I never endorse anything without seeing, using, and loving what they have. This is important for me to maintain my level. 
and now people write me from higher levels, too. For example, Dr. Robert Anthony is a man I studied 20 years ago. Last year, he wrote me after reading my book, Spiritual Marketing. Today, we're co-authors. I just produced and recorded his legendary audio program, Beyond Positive Thinking. Two decades ago, I was way below his level. Today, we're partners. Keep in mind that going up a level is different from thinking out of the box. You can be creative and still stay on your current level. Brainstorming with your neighbor is most likely different from brainstorming with, say, Richard Branson, the flamboyant owner of Virgin Records. The point is this. To achieve goals you've never achieved before, you may need to rise in levels and participate with new people on a new playing field. So the lesson in this section is to consider your current level, consider your goals, and consider what people outside of your network can help you achieve them. You may have to step out of your level and comfort zone to do it, but the step is well worth taking. To look at this another way, the people closest to you will hold you down or help you up. As Randy Gage points out, the five people closest to you will influence your success. They will either be focused on step one, the I don't want this stage, or they will be focused on step two, what do you want? The people around you will help you with your focus. So, where do you want your focus to be? Socrates' Advice I love this story, attributed to Socrates, on how to handle negative people. One day, a man rushed up to Socrates, saying, I have some news to tell you. Socrates put up his hand to stop the excited man. First, let me ask you three questions, Socrates said. Uh, er, okay, said the man. Is the news you are about to tell me something you personally know to be true? Well, no, replied the man. I heard it from a good source, though. Then let's go to the second question, Socrates said. Is the news you want to tell me about someone you know personally? Well, no, the man said, but I think you know the person. I see, said Socrates. Then let me ask you the final question. Is this news positive or negative? Well, it's negative. Let me see, said the wise Socrates. You want to tell me some news that you don't know personally to be true about someone you don't know at all, and that is negative. The man said, well, it sounds bad when you put it like that. Socrates said, well, I think I'll pass. Where are your thoughts? Again, the attractor factor is always at work. It is spirit giving you what you focus on. Focus on lack, you get lack. Focus on your bad back, you get more of your bad back. So, for step one, all you want to do is notice what you have been focusing on. Where are your thoughts? Where is your conversation? Your answers will become the springboard to take you to the next step in this miracle-making process. Step 2. Dare Something Worthy Pull up a chair and let me tell you a story or two. This will set the stage for Step 2 in this miraculous formula for making your dreams come true. Exceed You when I was a teenager, one of my heroes was Floyd Patterson. Floyd was heavyweight boxing champion of the world twice. He was also the youngest man in history to win the title. He was a nice guy in an often bad business. He wrote his autobiography and titled it something intriguing, Victory Over Myself. I love the title because of the ideal it conveys. Instead of trying to beat the world, just try to improve yourself. Runners call it exceeding your personal best. In other words, if you aren't happy with yourself, find a way to be victorious over yourself. There is no competition. There is no enemy. There is only the desire to improve yourself. As you improve, the world improves. Floyd Patterson knew this, and he became one of the most famous and lovable boxing champions of the world. 
I met Floyd when I was maybe 16 years old. It was right after about in Cleveland, Ohio. I managed to crawl over bleachers, jump a rail, and stand in the path where Floyd would be headed back to his training room. He looked at me with this gentle, kind smile. I reached up and patted his massive shoulder as I congratulated him on his win that night. I never forgot it. Floyd was in boxing because that was the job that took him out of poverty. But he knew the only real opponent in the world were the things in himself he didn't like. He worked to have victory over himself. Floyd succeeded. Ask yourself, what do you want to improve in yourself? Peace Pilgrim Peace Pilgrim may have been the Mother Teresa or the Gandhi of the United States of America. This kind woman spent 28 years of her life walking for peace. She dropped her real name. She owned nothing but the clothes on her back. She only ate or slept whenever someone along her path gave her food or shelter. She walked over 25,000 miles for peace. She walked in total trust that what she was doing was making a profound impact on the world. She was interviewed by the media, seen on television, heard on radio, and read about in the newspapers. Yet she was simply following her own calling. She dared to do something worthy. She wrote, The most important part of prayer is what we feel, not what we say. We spend a great deal of time telling God what we think should be done, and not enough time waiting in the stillness for God to tell us what to do. Peace Pilgrim died in 1981, but her spirit lives on. Her life and words can be found online at www.peacepilgrim.net forward slash pphome dot htm. She was and continues to be an inspiration to millions of people. Now I'll ask you to ask yourself, how does Peace Pilgrim inspire you? Or... What is the nudge within you urging you to do? Be a trillionaire. As you'll see in this section, knowing what you want, knowing your calling, your goal, your ideal, your challenge, your dream, is the next step to attracting your desires. Most people have no idea what they want, or if they do, they think small. I want you to think bigger than you've ever thought before. I want you to ade aliquid dignum, or dare something worthy. For example, why not become a trillionaire? According to my friend Brad Hager, CEO of Millionaire Magazine, there are $22 trillion of personal wealth floating around in the world. Yet there are, so far, no trillionaires. Why not choose to be the world's first trillionaire? Well, actually, that's my goal, but you can pursue it, too. One thing you'll learn in this recording is that your mind can be directed to find answers for you. When you ask questions, such as, how can I become the world's first trillionaire, your mind begins a search and find mission. Your question directs it to find a solution. Step two in our attractor factor process involves choosing what you want and doing it in such a way that you activate your mind to complete the job for you. Let me explain. What do you want? If you realize you can have anything, be anything, or do anything, then the question becomes, what do you want? Here's the secret. The trick is in turning every one of your complaints around to something you do want. Start focusing on where you want to go, not on where you were or where you are. I don't want this headache becomes, I want a clear head. I don't want this backache becomes, I want a strong back. I don't want these bills becomes, I want more than enough money for everything I desire. I don't want to struggle in my business becomes, I want business to come to me easily and effortlessly. Now, there's an art to rewriting what you don't want into what you do want. All I do is write the opposite of my complaint. Turn the sentence around 180 degrees. If I say, I'm tired of being interrupted when I write, the opposite would be, I want to write in a place that is safe, 
quiet and without interruptions. You're probably wondering what this has to do with anything. Why write these sentences if they won't help you pay the bills or heal your problems or anything else? Well, good question. The answer, refocusing on what you do want will take you in the direction of what you want. As Deepak Chopra wrote in his book, The Spontaneous Fulfillment of Desire, all we really need is clarity of intent. Then if we can get the ego out of the way, the intentions fulfill themselves. The Magic of Intention My friend, Kent Cummins, master magician, great speaker, and co-author of The Magic of Change, knows about the power of intention in business. He ran a sandwich shop business in Austin, Texas for 15 years. One day, he decided to run a radio ad offering free beans with any po' boy, encouraging customers to purchase the larger size sandwich. Now, don't ask me why he thought beans would be a draw. All he remembers is that the business had found a source for some very tasty beans. So they stocked up on beans. They placed an ad with a popular local radio station. And the day the shop opened for business, there were so many customers he had to turn some away. Business exploded. He couldn't keep up with the orders. But here's the odd thing. When Kent called the radio station to thank them for running his ad, he was shocked to hear, we were going to call you and apologize. We never ran the ad. Now, how did Kent get so much business from an ad that never ran? It's all in your intention, he told me over dinner. I intended for new business, and that was the signal that attracted people. Apparently, the intention was more important than the actual ad. That's not the only time Ken has experienced the power of knowing what you want in business. Recently, he decided to implement a publicity campaign for his summer camp, the Kent Cummings Magic Camp. He read books, attended a seminar, drafted a plan. His intent was to get publicity but he got busy with operational details and never actually implemented the plan. He forgot to do it. Well, it didn't matter. One of the former camper parents turned out to be a writer for the Austin American Statesman newspaper. He called Kent and asked for permission to write an op-ed piece for the editorial page. A stunning story about their counselor training program ran within weeks of the idea. One of the local TV stations called and asked Kent to appear on their morning show to promote the camp as an interesting idea for their viewers. Kent appeared, demonstrated some magic, and answered questions about the camp. Kent then discovered that the Magic Camp had been nominated for recognition by Big Austin, a city-sponsored nonprofit organization for small business. To his surprise, he won the Most Creative Small Business in Austin for 2004 award a recognition that included some $4,000 worth of prizes. The Business Success Center had already asked him to speak on entrepreneurship. He would speak at the Lakeway Breakfast Club about the camp. Austin Family Magazine notified him that the Magic Camp had been designated in a reader's poll as the best specialty camp in Austin. Finally, Kent discovered that one of his counselors had sent in a magic trick from the camp to The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, and they used the piece and paid the camper $100. Not bad results for a publicity campaign that was never implemented. Kent calls it the magic of intention. As you'll see throughout this recording, the clearer you are about what you want, the easier it is to simply attract it into your life. For example, how I raised $22,500 in one day. One day, I pulled up beside a truck delivering new cars. One of the cars on this flatbed made my heart leap and my blood dance. I had never had a piece of machinery turn me on before. This one did. I fell in love. It was a BMW Z3, a roadster, a luxury sports car one of the sexiest cars ever known to man and made by gods. Okay, maybe I'm overplaying it. But the point is, this car spoke to me. I wanted it, and I wanted it bad. I also knew BMWs are pricey. So the first thing I did was try to win one. I entered two contests where Z3s were the big prizes. 
I knew I would win. I was destined to have that car. But I didn't win. Alas, so much for the laws of chance. It was time to create my future by attracting it. So I decided I would just buy the car and that I would pay cash for it. I had just completed an e-book on how to create miracles called Spiritual Marketing, and I figured I would prove to myself that I could create a Z3. I used my own five-step method to get the sexiest car of my hottest dreams. I began by setting an intention for getting that car. Oprah once said, Intention rules the earth. I know it. My car's license plate holder says, I am the power of intention. Once you declare that something will be so, you send a signal into the universe that begins to move that something to you and you to it. Call it real magic. Call it the attractor factor. I call it one of the most powerful steps in the manifestation process. From that step alone, miracles can happen. After I set my intention to have that car, I then acted on the hunches that bubbled up within me and the opportunities that came my way. To be more exact, here's what happened. One day it occurred to me to offer a seminar on the subject of my new book. I could rent a hotel, write a sales letter, invite everyone I knew on my online and offline list to attend it. I could make a killing in a weekend, that's the ticket. But then it occurred to me that I don't like to market seminars, that I didn't know if it would sell, that postage and printing to promote it would cost a fortune, and that I'm not such a big fan of speaking in public anyway. And here's where the shift occurred. I began to play with the idea that I could hold the seminar online. I would simply announce an e-class to my email list. It would cost me zip. If no one signed up, so what? But, but, if they did sign up, I could teach the entire class by email. Every week, I would send out a lesson. I would give assignments. They would complete them and email them back. I would then comment on their homework. It would all be nice and neat, easy and convenient. Sounded good to me. I decided to teach five weeks of classes, mainly because there were five chapters in the original book. I would send out one chapter a week as a lesson. I would add assignments to each one to make it more of a legit course. Then I wondered, what do I charge? I spent a lot of time on this question. Most people give away their e-classes if they teach them at all. A few charge low fees. But I wanted a BMW Z3. They cost thirty to forty thousand dollars each. Yikes! Well, I decided I wanted fifteen people in my class. Now, that was an arbitrary number. I just figured if 15 people actually did their homework over a five-week period, I would have my hands full reviewing it. So, like everything else in the developing of this first E-class, I simply made up the class size. I then divided 15 by how much I wanted to raise for my Z3. If 15 people paid me $2,000 each, I'd have enough to pay for the car in cash. But two grand a person seemed a bit high, so I settled for $1,500 a person. I then issued a sales pitch invitation to sign up for the class to my email list. I had about 800 good names on my list at that time. I had no idea if anyone would bite. I even feared I would be flamed to death. But I decided to take the risk. I sent the letter to my list. What happened? Sixteen of them immediately signed up for the class. Talk about easy money. I made $24,000 in one day. The class was easy to do, too. The students loved the lessons, my assignments, and my feedback. Only one person immediately asked to bow out, saying the E-class wasn't for him. So I ended up with 15 people. After all, I made $22,500. I was happy. But I didn't stop there. A few weeks later, I announced another e-class, this one on how to write, publish, and promote your own e-book. I just followed the same model that already worked. I issued an invite to my email list. I went after 15 people. I charged $1,500 per person for a five-week class. I got 12 paying customers. I made $18,000. 
Now, at this point, I had been thinking about writing a sequel to my best-selling ebook, Hypnotic Writing. But I didn't want to write it and just hope it would sell. I wanted paid to write it. So I created yet another e-class. This one would be on advanced hypnotic writing. It would be three weeks long, rather than five, because I wanted to take it easy this time. I guess I was getting lazy. I still charged $1,500, and I still went after 15 people. I then announced the class to my email list. Here's where something wild happened. Almost 18 people immediately signed up for the class. But when I asked them to pay the $1,500 fee, every single one of them said they thought the class was free. I was stunned. I reread my invite. It clearly said there was a hefty fee. All I can figure is that people skimmed the letter, got excited, and just shot back emails to enroll in the class. Or maybe they read the word fee as free. Go figure. But that's not the only odd thing that happened with this class. I had trouble filling it from my own email list. So I went and asked a person with a giant email list if he would promote my class to his people. He would for 50% of the pie. Wow. That was a lot, but I wanted to get paid to write my sequel to Hypnotic Writing, and I'd still end up with good money anyway, so I agreed. Well, 20 people signed up. And the really odd thing is that no one, no one did their assignments. So I got their money, half of it anyway, $15,000. I got paid to write my advanced hypnotic writing ebook, and I had no homework to review or grade. Now, what a cool business. Most recently, I announced yet another e-class. I was about to buy a large country estate and wanted more money fast. This new class is on my new proprietary marketing formula called Guaranteed Outcome Marketing. I raised the price on this five-week e-class to signal its value. I asked for $2,500 a person. Since I normally charge $50,000 to create a guaranteed outcome marketing strategy for someone, asking for only $2,500 to teach someone how to do it seemed very fair. I lowered the class size because I wanted to be sure to give each student personal attention. I promoted this class to only my own email list. I got five students, which meant I raised $12,500. Not bad for a month's work. And yes, I bought the country estate. I went on and taught my method for teaching classes by only email to several people. Copywriter and internet marketer Yannick Silver has made over $90,000. Executive coach Paul Lindbergh has made over $100,000. And Tom Pauly, author of I'm Rich Beyond My Wildest Dreams, I Am, I Am, I Am, has made over $250,000 so far. And in nearly each case, I made as much as 50% of what they made for helping them promote their e-classes online. Now, all of this began because I implemented step two in the attractor factor method. The moral here, there are several. One. Intention rules. You can float with the circumstances life brings you, or you can create your own direction and your own circumstances. It begins with a decision. What do you want? Decide. Choose. Declare. My motto is, dare something worthy. This is the power of step two in the attractor factor formula. Two, break the model. Just because others are selling their services for a song doesn't mean you have to as well. Respect yourself. What are you worth? Three, go for something other than money. Wanting my Z3 caused my mind to stretch in new ways, to raise the money needed to get the car. If I were just going after money for money's sake, I might not think so boldly in my ideas or my pricing. What do you really want? Four, you can do this too. Just look at what you know that others would pay you to learn. Then turn it into an e-class, complete with lessons and assignments. After the class is over, you might even compile the material into a book or a tape set. Or think big. What would you teach if you had no fears? You can attract wealth when you are fearless. Your wealth may be hiding right behind the very thing you are reluctant to do. Five, 
the spiritual is not separate from the material. Since I focused on money in this example, it may be easy to declare my focus was only on the dollar. Not so. I used spiritual principles, as will be explained in this very recording, to attract wealth. Once you realize that the spiritual and the material are two sides of the same coin, you are free to have happiness as well as cash. As it says on the dollar bill in your pocket, in God we trust. Well, do you trust? Finally, yes, I attracted my BMW Z3 right into my garage. I bought it off the showroom floor. It's a 1999 Montreal Blue stunning piece of rolling beauty. Since BMW no longer makes that particular model, it's also a collectible, too. I've had it for years now. I've never had so much fun in my life driving. In fact, I think I'll aim it up and down some Texas country roads right now. The number one thing people do wrong. I admit it. I'm frustrated. I'm tired of getting emails from people who write, I can't do what you did because, or I can't attract wealth into my life because, just fill in the blank with whatever excuse you can think of. People say they can't write as many books as I have because they don't have the time, or they're too old, or too young, or too married, or too single. People say they can't make their book a bestseller, as I did, because their book is different, or they're different, or the timing is different. People say they can't ask celebrities for endorsements, as I did, because they feel insignificant, or insulting, or imposing. The list of excuses is endless. Here are actual ones I've received. You're more famous than me. I could never write people and ask for their help, as they wouldn't give me the time of day. Well, I started asking people for help, advice, input, suggestions, and direction when I was a teenager. I have letters from FBI King J. Edgar Hoover, boxing legend Jack Dempsey, and master magician John Mulholland. I was certainly unknown then, yet people have always helped me. I've managed to connect with Evil Knievel, Donald Trump, Jimmy Carter, best-selling authors, and more. And I did it before anyone knew my name. I simply asked for their help. They were kind and replied. Today I'm doing the same thing for anyone who writes me who sounds sincere and respectful. Here's another excuse. You have a large network of people to ask for things. Well, yes, I do now, but I didn't when I first started. I developed my network by building relationships. I reached out to people, helped them. They helped me, and trust was formed. Because I've nurtured my relationships online for almost 10 years now, a bond is set. When I announce that I want contributions for a new book, my network responds. When they want something, I respond. I was able to compile all the information for one of my most recent books, The E-Code, 47 Surprising Secrets for Making Money Online Almost Instantly in Less Than 7 Days, all because I asked my network for help. Here's another excuse I hear. You have a big mailing list. So you can sell things faster. I went online with no mailing list. None. I didn't even recognize the importance of having my own list until one day when I offered my first e-class to my then tiny list and made $22,500 in one day. Then I woke up. I've been working on building my email list ever since. Anyone can do it. And while you're waiting to do it, you can always joint venture with people who already have mailing list. How? Just ask. One day, some person in Norway wrote me. He wanted to know if I would help him sell his new software. Well, I liked his program and agreed. He didn't have a list. I did. He had software. I liked it. I did a mailing and split the profits with him. It was a win-win. Here's another excuse I hear. You are more talented as a copywriter, so you can sell better than me. I learned to be a copywriter by investing time, money, and effort into studying the greats and getting out there and doing it. My first sales letters were garbage. I still write and rewrite to make my letters as hypnotic as I can. I wasn't born writing, reading, or even walking. I learned it all. Can't you? Another excuse I receive is... I don't have anything to offer free to get people to buy what I am selling. There are a million things for free online. You can find thousands, thousands of free ebooks online. 
Just grab a few and offer them as your incentives to get people to buy your product or service. Anyone can do this. Just look around online. The fruit is there for the picking. I've seen people take classics of literature, now in the public domain and available as ebooks, and offer them as incentives for prospects to buy their product. It works. How do you find them? Search. Another excuse I hear is, I can't teach an e-class like you because I have no credentials. Hmm. Your credentials are you. They are your life experiences more than anything else. Few today care about whether you have a degree or any other credential. They care if you can deliver on whatever you promise. My life mate, Narissa, is about to teach an online video editing class. Anything you can teach offline can be taught online. With video, audio, graphics, text, and chat rooms, you can have a virtual classroom on anything you can imagine. Why not? Still another excuse I hear is, I can't make money selling my stuff on the Internet. Oh, look around. The Internet is so big and vast and even incomprehensible that truly anything can be sold online. I've seen people sell tumbleweeds and buggy whips, greeting cards, and computer-generated art. Anything sold offline can be sold online. Go look at eBay. People sell cars, used clothes, dirt, used wedding dresses, and even snow there. I once sold an Elvis mermaid on eBay. You can see a picture of it at www.mrfire.com. Are there really any limits to what can be sold online? Another excuse I hear is, I missed the right time to sell my idea. Really? Just look at the title of one of my books. There's a customer born every minute. A new crowd of prospects appears every single day. You can sell virtually anything at virtually any time if you think of what people want and cater to them. Sometimes you have to think of other uses for the same product or other audiences than what you originally had in mind. But the best time to sell what you have is now. What are you waiting for? Yet another excuse is, you live in America and I live in Mexico and selling doesn't work here. Give me a break. Friends of mine always go to Mexico and other countries said to be behind us and they come home with truckloads of things they bought. Besides that, with the Internet, where you live is almost meaningless. Take your product and go online. Then you're not selling to the poor neighbors, but to the entire planet. Think big. The list goes on and on. To me, excuses are the number one thing people do wrong, online and off. While all of these excuses seem legit to the person saying them, they are virtually all hogwash. Excuses are beliefs. If you buy into them, you're stuck. If you believe instead that there's always a way around whatever the excuse is, then you'll move forward. My philosophy is, there is always a way. So let me try to help you here. First, what are your excuses? When I began this section by asking the question, I can't do what you did because, what did you say? How did you complete the sentence? Those are some of your excuses. Second, ask yourself if there's any way on earth to get around your excuses. In other words, are the excuses you stated real or imagined? Have you tried to get past any of them? Has anyone else ever gotten past the same excuses? Finally, what would you do if you had no excuses? Whatever your answer, that's a clue to your biggest goal. Leave your excuses behind and you will begin to attract wealth. Leave your excuses behind and you can achieve success too. Leave your excuses behind and your life will begin to soar. If you don't act now, why not? Whatever your answer, that's an excuse. Are you going to let it stop you? Who directs your life? You see, we seem to create our lives out of our perceptions. If we focus on lack, we get more lack. If we focus on riches, we get more riches. If we focus on excuses, we attract more blocks. Our perception becomes a magnet that pulls us in the direction of where we want to go. If you don't consciously select where you want to go, you go where your unconscious wants you to go. 
To paraphrase the famous Swiss psychologist Carl Jung, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life, and you will call it fate. In that regard, most of us are on autopilot. We simply haven't realized that we can take the controls. Knowing what you want helps you aim your life in the direction you want to take it. But there is a little more to it. For what purpose? I just had lunch with a delightful friend of mine. She had a session with Jonathan Jacobs last week, and she was still glowing. Her eyes were large and alive, full of passion for life. She reminded me that even though you may think you know what you want, you may have to probe deeper to discover what you really want. She had gone to see Jonathan with the intention of creating a successful business for herself. Jonathan asked, "For what purpose?" After dodging the question for a while, she realized that she wanted a successful business to prove I am a worthwhile person. She said. I remember saying I wanted to write books that were colossal bestsellers. Jonathan asked me the same famous question: "For what purpose?" At first, I squirmed and said things like, "I deserve it," or "I want the money," or "My books are good enough for it." But the real reason, the underlying motivating factor, was that I wanted best-selling books so people would love and admire me. When I said it, I felt a shift within myself. I knew I had reached the real thing I wanted. My goal, my intention, was to feel love. Most people live their entire lives being driven by an unconscious, unacknowledged need for something. The politician may be a child who never got enough attention. The businesswoman may be a youngster who still doesn't feel equal to her peers. The best-selling author may still be trying to prove he's smart or lovable or admirable. Freedom and power come from knowing what you want without being a prisoner to what you want. But there's another reason for knowing and stating your intention. When you declare it, you begin to discover all the things in the way of its happening. You may say you want to pay off your house, so you are free of those big payments. But suddenly here come all of the objections. I don't make enough money to pay off my house, or no one ever does that. To what will my parents think? You know what I mean. It's easy to come up with objections. The trick is to dissolve those objections until you are clear inside. When you are clear, manifesting whatever you want will be easier. Let me explain. How you create reality. A woman went to see Jonathan because she was going to have a cancer operation on Monday. She saw him on Friday. She was terrified of the operation and wanted to get rid of her fears. Jonathan helped her release all of her fears, and two hours later, when she sat up on his table, she felt healed. But she still went through with the operation. On Monday, when the doctors opened her up, they could not find any cancer. It was gone. What happened? Again, our beliefs are powerful. The woman believed she could remove the beliefs that were causing her fear. And she did, but she didn't know that the fear was what created the cancer. When she removed the fear, the cancer left. It no longer had a home in her body. She had taken conscious control of her life by choosing to see Jonathan and take care of her negative beliefs. She knew her life could be another way. Beliefs are how we create reality. I'm not sure how to explain this to you in a way that makes sense. You've probably noticed that people seem to have reoccurring problems. Did you ever wonder why it was the same problem for each person? The person with money problems always has money problems. The person with relationship problems always has relationship problems. It's as though each person specializes in a disorder. Beliefs, unconscious or not, are creating those events. Until the beliefs that create the events are released, the events will continue to reoccur. I know a man who has been married seven times. He hasn't gotten it right yet. He will continue to marry and divorce and marry until he removes the underlying beliefs that caused the events to happen. And while he continues to marry and divorce, he will blame other people for his problems and maybe even blame fate 
or God. But as you read earlier, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life, and you will call it fate. What are your beliefs? Look at your life. What you have are the direct results of your beliefs. Not happy, in debt, poor marriage, not successful, bad health. There are beliefs that are creating those experiences for you. In a very real sense, some part of you wants what you have, problems and all. I remember motivational guru Tony Robbins talking about a schizophrenic woman who had diabetes when she was one personality and was healthy when she was another personality. Beliefs make up personality. The woman with diabetes had beliefs that created the diabetes. It's obvious that if you change the beliefs, you change the situation. But how do you change the beliefs? It starts with selecting what you want for your life. As soon as you select what you want to be, do, or have, you'll discover beliefs in the way of it. They'll surface. They'll be your excuses. That swings back to what I was talking about earlier, that you can then restate your complaints so that they become goals or intentions for you. So, what do you want? What would make your heart sing? What would make you dance in the streets? What would make you smile right now just thinking about it? What would you do if you knew you could not fail? What would you want if you could have anything? Can you really have anything? What are the limits to our desires? I'm not sure there are any. You can argue for physical or scientific limitations, but I think those are limits based on current research. At one point, it was known that no human could run the four-minute mile. Now, many can do it. At one point, we knew lead would sink in water. Now, we build ships out of it. At one point, everyone knew we couldn't get to the moon. Been there, done that. At one point, people assumed the disabled could not participate in sports. Now, we have the Special Olympics. The list goes on. Again, I'm not sure anything is impossible. I'm not sure you can't have it all. Certainly, the goals, intentions, and wishes of the average person listening to this recording are within reach. You may not know how to achieve something, but you know the wish is doable somehow, some way. The only thing you need to be aware of is what the Buddhists call hungry ghosts. These are desires that run you rather than you run them. Desires for new shoes, when you have many pair and don't need more, might be a hungry ghost. Desires for more property, when you have plenty, might be a hungry ghost. Desire for more food, when you just ate, might be a hungry ghost, too. The hungry ghosts are driven by intense neurotic craving, writes Dominic Halder in Mindfulness and Money. Neurotic because the craving they experience is often the displaced desire for something else, something they are not consciously aware of. Now, I am not trying to stop you from desiring anything. Desire is good. It is what motivates you to get up, to live, to work, to grow, to love. It's built into your human system. You can use desire to transcend desire. But you also have to watch the mind. It can be like a wild monkey telling you to get this, and now that, and never letting you have any peace. You want to watch the hungry ghost. You want to honor the desires welling up from deep within you, the wishes that are from your core. When you come from that place, nothing is impossible, and you can have anything you can imagine. At that point, you are aligned with the universe itself. In many ways, the universe's desires will be your desires. The point is, you can attract anything you want. But the question remains, do you want your goals like a spoiled child in a candy store, or a wild monkey drunk on power, or do your desires come from the essence of who you are? I know a woman who used the five steps in this recording to win money in Las Vegas. 
Oh, the rush was wonderful. The accomplishment was wonderful. But she then misused the money and ended up in G.A., or Gamblers Anonymous. She now pays attention to the hungry ghost in her, and only uses the five-step attractor formula to do good in the world. I once used the attractor formula to win money in the Texas lotto. I found it took a lot of energy to win a little money and that the accomplishment was empty. Now I focus on joyfully creating books, courses, and audio recordings that bring me residual income while helping people. I make a great deal of money and feel wonderful about it. I'm following my calling. I'm making a difference, and I'm attracting wealth. What good do you want to do for yourself and others? Close your eyes. About 20 years ago, I attended a seminar by Stuart Wilde, author of The Trick to Money is Having Some, and many other books. I had interviewed Stuart over breakfast, found him fascinating, and he invited me to his event. One exercise in it stood out and is relevant to this second step in the attractor factor formula. Stuart led us through a remarkable imagery experience. We were asked to outline our own bodies in a ray of white light. Use a finger or a beam, Wilde suggested. Trace your body with the white light. I found myself centering remarkably fast. I felt myself relax into the here and now. All tension slipped out of my body. I let go. I felt present like never before. Stuart went on to say, Now make a beam of light from the top of your head to the floor in front of your feet. I did. I could see it like a walkway for ants. For some reason, I thought of the joke about the two mental patients who want to escape their prison. One says he'll turn on the flashlight, and the other can escape by walking on the ray of light. The other said, You think I'm crazy? I'll get halfway out, and you'll turn the light off. Well, Wilde now urged us to create a mental image of ourselves and shrink it down. He said, Now have that image walk down the ray of light from the top of your head to the floor. I did what I was told. Little Joe walked down my mental beam and got to the floor. I watched in my mind as this midget image of me walked around my shoes and looked around the room. Stuart Wilde continued with, Just observe what your image does. Well, my little guy seemed a bit confused. He decided he didn't know where to go or what to do, so I just sat on the edge of my shoe and watched Stuart Wilde with me. After a few minutes, Wilde had us bring the guy back up the light, grow to full size, and then merge with our bodies. What was that like for you? Wilde asked everyone. A tall man stood and said, It was confusing. My miniature image didn't know what to do. Do you know what you want to do? Wilde asked. Well, I think so, said the man. Someone else? Wilde asked. A woman stood up and said, My shrunken me had fun. She ran around to look for coins on the floor. Great, Stuart Wilde said. Anyone else? I stood up. I said, My little one just sat on my shoes and did nothing. Why nothing? Stuart asked. I guess he wanted to know what to do. Stuart asked, Are you caught up in right and wrong, Joe? If your image didn't know what to do, maybe he was afraid to make a move unless he knew what the right move would be. Is that how you live your life? Well, I don't know, I said. Think about it, Stuart Wilde said. Anyone else? Turns out that this little imagery technique was very revealing. Whatever the little person did at the end of the beam, or didn't do, revealed something about how we act in our day-to-day -day lives. We all learn something about ourselves from this unique experience. After that moment, some 20 years ago, I started to pay more attention to my own desires. You might use this imagery experience to see what your little self will do. And then ask yourself if you are being honest about what you really want in your life. As you'll see in this next section, you always know what you want, but you may not always admit it. What if you still don't know? 
Some people tell me, I don't know what I want. Oh, I know those people. I used to be one of them. When I asked Dr. Robert Anthony, author of many best-selling books and the great audio course Beyond Positive Thinking, what do you say to people who claim they have no idea what they want? He replied, I tell them they are lying. And he's right. You know what you want. You know it right now. If you are one of the few who say you don't know what you want, you are lying to yourself. Somewhere inside of you, right below what you are willing to admit, are your desires. You simply haven't spoken them. Dr. Robert Anthony told me, Everyone knows what they want. They are simply afraid to admit it. Once they admit it, they have to own up to the fact that they don't have it. They have to begin to take action to get what they want, or they have to make excuses for not trying. Both may be uncomfortable. To stay safe, people lie. You have the chance to achieve your desires. This book is designed to give you a special formula for success that never fails. The five steps in the attractor factor are already proven to work. With this information on your side, why not admit what you really want? Isn't it time? Think like God. Many years ago, I gave a talk called How to Think Like God. In it, I told the stories of how people have been cured of blindness or healed of autism or achieved great wealth where none seemed possible. I then urged the audience to take off their blinders, remove their inner mental limits, and to think as if they had superhuman or even super godly powers. This was a very empowering experience. People loved it. It released their restraints so they could think bigger than they ever thought before. God wouldn't worry, doubt, bicker, delay, stall, or think small. After all, what would you do if you had all the powers of God? No matter how you view God, you probably admit that your concept is a being with enormous power and no limits. Well, if you thought like that, God, what would you want for yourself? What would you want for the world? Start here. Take out a piece of paper and begin to write down what you would like to be, do, or have. A study by author Brian Tracy revealed that people who simply wrote down their wants and put the list away discovered a year later that 80% of what they wrote came to be. Write down your desires right now. Just stop the recording and spend a moment or two writing down your goals. Did you write down many goals? Sometimes people feel greedy when they start to ask for what they want. They feel they are taking from others. The best way around that limiting belief is to be sure you also want others to have success too. In other words, if you want a new house but don't want your neighbor to have one, you're stuck in ego and that's greed. But if you want a new house and think everyone ought to have one, then you are in tune with the creative spirit, and you'll pull or be led to that new house. You'll attract it. You see, there really isn't any shortage in the world. The universe is bigger than our egos and can supply more than we can demand. Our job is to simply and honestly ask for what we want, without wanting to harm or control another person. Never ask for a specific person or for a specific person to do something. Allow the universe, the power in everything, to arrange the right person, place, and time. Your job is to state your intention. The desire in you is coming to you from your inner spirit. On another piece of paper, honor your inner spirit by writing down what you really want to have, do, or be. Once again, just stop the recording and spend a moment or two writing down your true goals. Now, what would be even better than what you selected? In other words, you may have written down, I want $50,000 in the bank by the holiday. Well, what would be better than that? Wouldn't you prefer $100,000? 
The idea is to stretch yourself a little while still being honest with yourself about your desires. So again, stop the recording and write down a few desires that would be even better than the ones you've already written down. Now, write down one goal or intention, something that you would really like to have, do, or be. Focus brings power. Look over your list and see what goal or goals jump out at you. Which goal or intention has the most energy or charge on it? A goal should scare you a little and excite you a lot. And keep in mind that you can always combine goals. There's nothing wrong with stating something like, I want to weigh 120 pounds, own a brand new Corvette, and have $50,000 in the bank by this coming Christmas. So again, stop the recording and write down one powerful intention. Step 1. The Springboard Visit any bar and what will you hear? Gossip, complaining, bitterness, negativity. Visit any lunchroom in any big company and what will you hear? Gossip, complaining, bitterness, negativity. Eavesdrop on any family gathering around dinner time and what will you hear? Gossip, complaining, bitterness, negativity. I could go on. The point is, the vast majority of humanity is stuck on this level of consciousness. It's the level of the media. It's the level of most conversations. It's the level of low energy. And this very same level keeps people exactly where they are. Do I need to explain this one? Most people I talk to every day know what they don't want. I don't want this backache. I don't want this headache. I don't want these bills. I don't want to struggle in my business. You know the list. You have one of your own. Unfortunately, that's where most of us leave it. The nature of our conversations, our newspaper reporting, our radio and television shows, and our popular talk shows surround us with ideas of what we don't want. It feels good to complain. We don't feel so alone. We feel heard. We feel relieved. We even sometimes get answers that make our problems lighter. What we don't realize is we are activating the attractor factor in a negative way. When we say, I don't want these bills, our focus is on, you guessed it, bills. The spirit of life will deliver whatever you focus on. So if you are talking about your bills, you'll get more bills. You'll attract it by spending energy on it. Most people are on the level of fear. As Eleanor Moody wrote in her 1923 book, You Can Receive Whatsoever You Desire, let us remember that fear is only wrongly directed faith. We are having faith in things we do not want, rather than in the things we desire. Again, this is the level most people are on. It isn't bad, it just isn't very positive. And it probably isn't getting you the health, wealth, or happiness you want. But we seldom take this process to level two. It's a rare person who will stop complaining, fighting, or fearing long enough to focus on the opposite of what they are experiencing. Yet level two begins to bring on the miracles and manifestations that we really want. Knowing what you don't want is the springboard to your miracles. Knowing what you don't want is simply your current reality. And current reality can change. Remove negativity. One way to protect yourself from the negative influences of the world at large is to abstain from them. I remember reading how Mark Victor Hansen and Jack Canfield forbid any negativity in their offices. I love the idea. I don't watch the news or read the papers. After a while, you begin to see how you are fed one-sided, negative, heavy news. None of it is designed to help my well-being. But you also have to watch your friends. The people around you will share their views of the world with you. Sometimes it's not easy to separate their view from your view. 
You want to step up from the world of outside cause and turn into the world of attraction based on energy. One way to do that is to remind yourself that the world in general is on the level of complaining. You want to go up a level or two. Beware the five. Years ago, I attended networking meetings. These were usually breakfast or lunch business meetings where people exchanged business cards and tried to help each other get new clients. I spoke at many of these events. What I quickly noticed is that the same people seemed to be at the same meetings. One observant friend said, "It's the same people, and they're all starving." That's when I first learned about the concept of levels. That is, people tend to stay on the same level of business or social status. When they meet friends, it's usually in their circle of activity, whether church, work, school, or some club. As a result, they rarely get out of the level they are on. Now that's not bad. You can stay on the level you are at and do well. But if you want more, or if you find yourself starving on the level you're on, you'll need to go up a level or two. When I was speaking at these networking events, I was a notch above everyone in the room. Now this is not an ego thing; it's a social perception. I was seen as being at a slightly higher level than the audience simply by nature of being the speaker. I was the authority figure. As the higher teacher, I was elevated a slight degree on their level. But that's not good enough. If you want to achieve big dreams in business, you need to step out of your circle or network of peers and associates. You need to go to a group with wider, stronger, richer connections. You need to go up a level. How do you do that? Now, in my case, my books brought me to the attention of other circles of people and higher levels of networks. For example, when I wrote the AMA Complete Guide to Small Business Advertising for the American Marketing Association back in 1995, I was immediately put on a new level. I was now the author of an important book for a prestigious organization. Okay, here's the next step. Write your intention as if you already have it. In other words, I want to weigh 120 pounds, own a brand new Corvette, and have fifty thousand dollars in the bank by this coming Christmas. Becomes, I now weigh 120 pounds, own a brand new Corvette, and have fifty thousand dollars in the bank. If you want an alternative that may make you feel better, consider the approach Dr. Robert Anthony advises in his audio program Beyond Positive Thinking. He says it may be more powerful to write. I now choose to weigh 120 pounds, own a brand new Corvette, and have fifty thousand dollars in the bank. Do that now. Just rewrite your goal into present tense, pretending that you already have what you want, and using the word "choose" if you so desire. Stop the recording and write this down right now. Okay. Before we go on, add one more line to your request. Add the phrase "this or something better." This or something better is the loophole that allows you to get out of your ego. If you insist on getting whatever you desire, you are coming from pure ego. As you'll see in step five, letting go is an important element to success. The real secret to getting whatever you want is to want without need. This will become clear later. For now, add the freeing line "this or something better" to your stated goal. Stop the recording and do that right now. Now, before you complete this process, let's be sure this goal or intention is right for you. There is a way to test your intention. I'll explain that procedure next. Oh, and you're going to love it. Let your body speak its mind. Most people who do muscle testing do it wrong. I'll explain what it is and then teach you the right way to do it. Muscle testing, or behavioral kinesiology, is a way to ask your body questions. In short, if your body goes weak when you ask something, that something isn't good for you. If your body stays strong, that something is right for you. You may have seen this done before. 
Usually, one person stands, arms stretched out from their side, as another person stands in front of them. The testing person puts one hand on the other's shoulder and the other hand on the outstretched arm. While the person with the arm stretched out thinks of something, the other pushes down on the arm. If the arm goes down, the subject was thinking of something that weakened them. If the arm stays strong, the person was thinking of something that was positive for them. That's a simplistic explanation for an involved process, but you get the idea. People like Dr. David Hawkins have written numerous popular books, such as Power Versus Force, about their work testing a long list of everything from people to theories to time periods in history. All of it is fascinating reading. It has caused a movement in which best-selling authors such as Wayne Dyer tout the benefits of the muscle test. But again, most testing is often done wrong. People can smile and throw off a test. They test products by holding them when they have to hold them over their solar plexus to get an accurate answer. They push too hard or with their whole hand and any number of other things. If you do muscle testing right, you can find out if your goals are right for you. If you don't, you'll deceive yourself and pursue a path that is not right for you. So, how do you do muscle testing right? The right way to test. First, both people have to be clear. That is, both people involved have to be centered, calm, and open. You can see right here that this is a potential trouble spot. Few people are centered, calm, and clear. Anyone testing you better be, or they will unconsciously influence the test results. So the way to get clear is easy. You can drink a large glass of water. You can tap your chest over your thymus, upper heart area, a few times. You can tap the underside of your left hand, the karate chop area, as you say, I deeply love, accept, and forgive myself. All of these methods clear you so that you will be able to get an accurate answer. Both people involved in a muscle test need to do this. Second you need to do a control test. In other words, if you are being tested, the person about to press down on your arm needs to ask you a neutral question. Something like, my name is Joe, if your name is Joe, is a valid test. Obviously, you should test strong. If you don't, go back and do some clearing. Third, the person doing the pressing down needs to use only two fingers and gently but firmly give one quick push down. This is not a test of strength. This is not a contest. The Solo Testing Method There is also a way to test yourself by yourself. I wrote about this method in my ebook Hypnotic Marketing. Here's how you do it. The best one-person testing method I discovered works like this. Hold out your left hand with your fingers spread apart as if you were going to hold a softball or large grapefruit. Now take the thumb and index finger of your right hand and touch the thumb and pinky of your left hand. Are you with me? You should have your left hand wide open and your right thumb on your left thumb and your right index finger on your left pinky. Got it? Now all you do is try to squeeze the left thumb and left pinky together as you try to resist. Go ahead and do that now. You should have found it easy to resist. Now think of something negative, Hitler works every time, and try to resist as you also try to squeeze. Your thumb and pinky should have weakened. Now think of something loving, your favorite pet should work, as you resist your own squeezing. Your thumb and pinky should remain strong and apart. Do you see how this works? I know all of this must seem wild to you, but hey, no one is looking, and I won't tell. So let's keep going.
Test your goal. You now have the basics for doing a muscle test. What you will do next is test your written goal. It should make you strong. If it doesn't, consider rewriting it and testing it again. You want it to be right for you. A muscle test is one way to find out if it is a match for you. If it is, it will be easier to attract. Okay, at this point, pick up the goal you had written down earlier and then do a muscle test on it. You can do the muscle test with a friend or you can do the solo testing method. You want to find out if this goal is right for you. Now, after you've done the muscle test, rewrite your goal or your intention and then test yourself again. What you're trying to do is end up with an intention that is right for you. Carry your intention. You might now write the goal on a card and put it in your pocket or purse. By doing so, you will be unconsciously reminding yourself of your intention. Your own mind will then help nudge you in the direction of making your goal a reality. So relax. You have just planted a seed in your mind. The rest of this recording will tell you how to water it, give it sunshine, clear out any weeds, and let it grow. Prepare to attract your miracles. Step 3. The Missing Secret I was on a teleseminar with a marketing friend of mine. We were telling our listeners how important it was to watch out for self-sabotage in their lives. We were pretty impressed with ourselves as we told them that their unconscious beliefs would create their reality, that if they didn't get clear, they could manifest failure. Halfway through the call, we introduced our surprise guest for the evening. He was a famous self-help guru from another country. The guru came on and began by dismissing what my partner and I had just covered. Can I take this to a new level, he asked. Well, of course, we told him. You're the guru. He began by saying, you don't need to unearth your past or change your unconscious. All you have to do is focus on what you want and stay focused on it in each moment. I totally agreed with him, but also wondered how he expected people to stay in the moment, the greatest spiritual challenge of all time. But I kept quiet and let our guest tout his beliefs. He went on to say, I used to be a therapist and quickly saw that it was a waste of time to go into someone's past looking for the cause of whatever they were getting. All you have to do is pay attention to your feelings. If it feels good, go in that direction. If it doesn't feel good, stop. Now, I agreed with all of what our guru guest was saying, but I had to wonder if he was only seeing part of the big picture. I began to feel that he was making the same mistake every other goal-getting, self-help, self-improvement, new age guru type was making. So I had to ask a few questions. Here's my first one. What if a person sets a goal watches their feelings in each moment, and still doesn't get the result they wanted. The guru answered by saying, Then they have a conflict with their subconscious mind. They need to back off from their goal and go for something more believable. Well, I said, then we're right back to needing to unearth beliefs and get clear. The guru said, Well, you don't really need to do that. Just know your intention, follow your feelings, and adjust in each moment. Well, our guru friend missed the point. And from what I can see, so have virtually all of the current spokespeople on how to manifest whatever you want. So, what is the point? Let me explain with a story. Watch Spot. Spot was a stray dog I claimed as my own when I was in college. But he used to run off and tear up the neighbor's garden, run across the street, and make drivers slam on their brakes, and just make a nuisance of himself. So I put him on a small leash. But I felt guilt for keeping this wonderful friend on a three-foot leash. 
I bought a longer leash, six feet of freedom, and put it on Spot. I then walked six feet away and called Spot to me. He ran, three feet. He wouldn't go an inch beyond the length of the old leash. I had to walk over to Spot, put my arm around him, and walk him out the full six feet of new leash. From then on, he used all of that new leash. I think each of us has a limit we've placed on our freedom. We need a miracles coach to help us see that in reality we have no limits. Jonathan Jacobs does that with his clients. But he does it in a way that may seem pretty strange to you. Hang on to your seat and let me see if I can explain it to you. Touching the sky. The first time I had a session with Jonathan, I didn't know what to expect. I thought the man was a little strange because he couldn't articulate what he did. But I'd been a curious journalist for many years, so I jumped in and did a session with him. Jonathan asked me, "What's your intention for this session?" Well, what do you mean? He said, "You can have anything you want. What do you want to focus on?" I thought it over for a moment and then spoke. I want clarity on the book I am writing about Bruce Barton. What kind of clarity? He asked. I want to know what I'm supposed to do next. Okay, Jonathan said. Let's go upstairs. Jonathan had me lie down on his massage table. He gently guided me to breathe in different colors. He said, "Breathe the color red through the top of your head, and imagine it going through your body and out of your feet." We went through numerous colors. Jonathan asked, "What other color do you need to breathe in?" I said, "Gray." He then asked me to breathe in that color. After several minutes of my breathing deeply and relaxing on his massage table, Jonathan put his hand over my heart, and said, "Open this up." While I didn't consciously do anything, I felt a rush of electricity and energy shoot through me, almost blinding me. There was a strong white light surging through my body, blasting into my head, somehow illuminating the inside of my skull. Suddenly, I felt in the presence of angels, spirits, guides. I don't know how to explain it, but it was real. I felt it. I sensed it. I knew they were there, and these beings somehow worked on me, altering my beliefs, helping me realize I had more leash than I thought. I'm not sure how long I was in that altered state. Twenty minutes? An hour? I don't know. When I finally sat up on the table, I noticed that Jonathan had a tear rolling down his cheek. When the energy started to blast through me, he moved aside to let it do its work. But the beauty and miracle of what he was seeing deeply touched him. He was crying. As my head cleared and I got my bearings, I realized I knew the next step for my book project. I was to go to Wisconsin and continue my research by looking at the private papers of Bruce Barton at the Historical Museum. I had gotten my intention, but that's not all. Shortly after that first session with Jonathan, I began to notice other changes in my outer life. The book I had been working on began to take direction and became the Seven Lost Secrets of Success. I found a publisher for it. I found the money to complete my research. I bought a new car. I bought a new house. My income soared. How? Why? I had invited the other side to help me, and it did. The wise choice. As I record these words, I'm very aware that you may think I've lost my mind. After all, here I am, an adult, an author. A fairly well-known speaker and marketing specialist who advises business executives about their work, and I'm talking about spirits. But I also know that you know what I mean. Even the most atheistic among us has been touched by the miraculous, the uncanny, or the unexplainable. Although no one knows what awaits on the other side of this life, 
we all tend to believe something intelligent is there. Maybe it's worth mentioning that the book that helped me the most here was What Can a Man Believe by Bruce Barton. In it, he explained that there was little proof for heaven after earth, but that it was far wiser to believe than not to believe. In other words, while I can't prove that angels and guides are standing ready to help you, isn't it a much more delicious and comforting and magical thought to believe in them than to not believe in them? There's no concrete evidence to support them or deny them. But when you can use the belief in them to create miracles, wouldn't you be wise to do so? That Mysterious Something Yesterday a friend of mine called and said she wanted to believe in guides and angels and teachers from the spiritual side of life, but a part of her doubted they existed. That's okay, I said. I have my doubts, too. You do, she said. Sure, I said. If I had to go into a court of law and prove I had spirit guides, they would laugh me out of the courthouse. There's no proof for them, but also there's no proof against them. And then I remembered something I had read in a recent issue of Reader's Digest magazine where Larry Dossie talked about prayer. He said praying helped people recover from illness. In many cases, they recovered from what doctors had said were incurable illnesses. What these successful patients did was pray. Even the patients admitted they didn't know if the prayers were answered, but it was the belief in the praying and the act of praying that helped them anyway. Again, as Barton pointed out, it is wiser to believe than not to believe. Believing helps create miracles. Barton wrote the following passage in 1927 in his book, What Can a Man Believe? I've always loved it, as it seems to stir the very something he talks about within me. See what it does for you. In every human being, whether emperor or cowboy, prince or pauper, philosopher or slave, there is a mysterious something which he neither understands nor controls. It may lie dormant for so long as to be almost forgotten. It may be so repressed the man supposes it is dead. But one night he is alone in the desert under the starry sky. One day he stands with bowed head and damp eyes beside an open grave. Or there comes an hour when he clings with desperate instinct to the wet rail of a storm-tossed boat. And suddenly, out of the forgotten depths of his being, this mysterious something leaps forth. It overreaches habit, it pushes aside reason, and with a voice that will not be denied, it cries out its questionings and its prayer. So let's assume you don't have access to a healer like Jonathan. What can you do? Easy. Focus on what you want and make one of your intentions finding someone to help you clear yourself of old beliefs so that you can create the life you want. Help does exist. State your intention to the world and allow it to come to you. I feel it's important to have support from a mentor. It's too easy to fall back into the old way of thinking, to feel sorry for ourselves and play the role of victim. The vast majority of your current friends probably won't support your desire to create miracles. When I first started seeing Jonathan, I would visit him once a month. He and I quickly saw that we needed to stay in touch at least once a week. Jonathan and I made a pact that said, Whenever I'm not clear, I am to call him. Then, whenever I let something in life throw me for a tailspin, I would call him. Another woman recently asked me what it meant to get clear with my beliefs. I thought about it for a while before I could answer. The image that came to me was of a football team. If one of those players is hurting, upset, feeling neglected, angry because the coach overlooked him earlier, or his girlfriend dumped him, that one player can jeopardize or sabotage the entire team's success. You 
are like the whole football team. If all parts of you, all of the beliefs inside of you, are in alignment, no problem. You'll attract your wealth. But if any part of you, any belief in you, doesn't support your intention, it will jeopardize or sabotage you. That's why you may have had lousy luck at love, romance, money, or health. Some part of you doesn't want it. We need to heal that part. When you do, you are clear. And when you are clear, you are free to attract anything you can imagine. Are you clear right now? How do you know if you are clear right now? Think of something that you want to have, do, or be. Why don't you have it yet? If your answer is something negative, you aren't clear. If you say anything except an honest, I know it's on the way to me, you probably aren't clear inside with what you want. Another question to ask yourself is, what does it mean that you don't yet have what you want? Your answer to that question will reveal your beliefs. For example, if you say, I have to do such and such first, you have a belief that you have to do something before you can have what you want. If you say, my soul doesn't want me to have this, then you are stating your own beliefs about what you think your soul wants for you. If you say, I don't know how to get what I want, then you are revealing a belief that says you have to know how to get what you want before you can have it. The truth is, nothing means anything in and of itself. You and I apply meaning to events and call it truth. But our meaning reveals our beliefs. Sometimes those beliefs serve us, and sometimes they don't. How to locate your beliefs. Your beliefs aren't that hard to find. First, understand what a belief is. According to Bruce DiMarsico, creator of the Option Method, a brilliant tool for exploring beliefs, a belief is assuming something to be true, to be a fact. A belief is not caused, it is created by choice. A belief about a thing's existence is not the same as its existence. In other words, a shirt is not a belief. It's a fact. It's an existence. But saying a shirt is good for you personally or not is a belief. Self-help author Mandy Evans, an option method practitioner, says certain beliefs can lead to a very bad day. Beliefs cause stress, not your business or life situations. It's your perception of events that cause how you feel. Mandy says, there's what's happened to you in your life, and then there's what you decided it meant. Mandy is the author of Traveling Free, How to Recover from the Past by Changing Your Beliefs. Mandy says, change your conclusions or your beliefs about the events in your past and you can change the way you live your life today. Certain beliefs can really trip us up. Beliefs shape the way we feel, think, and act, Mandy says. She's an expert in personal belief systems. But you often can't change those inner systems until you know what they are. Mandy offers a list of the top 20 self-defeating beliefs in her book, Traveling Free, as a way to begin exploring them. As you look at each belief, Ask yourself if you believe it, Mandy suggests. If you do, then ask yourself why you believe it. Gently explore your own reasons for buying into any self-limiting belief. Here are 10 of Mandy's top 20 limiting beliefs. 1. I'm not good enough to be loved. 2. No matter what I do, I should be doing something else. 3. If it hasn't happened yet, it never will. 4. If you knew what I'm really like, you wouldn't want me. 5. I don't know what I want. 6. I upset people. 7. Sex is dirty and nasty. Save it for the one you love. 8. Better stop wanting. If you get your hopes up, you'll get hurt. 9. 
If I fail, I should feel bad for a long time and be really scared to try again. 10. I should have worked this out by now. Those are all beliefs. Sometimes you need another person to point out your beliefs. When my friend Linda and I had breakfast one day, I hired her to help me with some promotion, and she said, I'm afraid some of my friends will be jealous of me. Well, that's a belief, I said. Linda's eyes widened and her face lit up. It is, she asked. It had never occurred to her that her fear was a belief, a belief she could let go of. She needed another person to shine a light on the belief. Here's another example of what I mean. How to get a new car. The following happened many years ago, but I remember it well. I needed a car bad. The one I was driving was an old clunker that could only move if you pushed it. Okay, it wasn't that bad. But whenever the car broke down, I broke down. Paying the repair bills was killing me. And never knowing if the car would get me where I was going was stressing me out. I needed help. I called Jonathan because of my fear of car salespeople. I had been one once and knew of their tactics. I told Jonathan what I wanted. He said, What you really want is often under what you say you want. What would having this new car do for you? Huh? Jonathan went on to explain that what we want may be a feeling rather than a product. Focus on the feeling and it will help me get what I really want. What would I feel if I had a new car? Wow, what a mind stopper. I developed a brain squeezing headache just thinking about it. I got off the phone and my head began to throb as if it had been hit with a sledgehammer. Although I almost never take medicine, I ate a handful of aspirin like it was popcorn. It didn't help. I went to see Jonathan in person. Sitting in the presence of his accepting energy, letting my pain speak to me, I suddenly saw the ache between my eyes as a huge black ball of tightly woven thread. Mentally, a thread would loosen and I'd hear a belief. You can't afford a new car. I let it go, and another belief would unravel. What would your dad say about this car? And then another thread belief would slide out. How will you afford it? And then another, and another, and another. As these beliefs slowly came apart and left, the black ball of pain got smaller and smaller. Within twenty minutes, the headache was completely gone. I was healed. I was clear. I was happy. Now get this. Although I didn't think it was really possible, I followed my intuition and immediately went to the car dealership I felt led to visit. Consciously, I knew there was no way I could get a new car. I had never had a new car in my entire life, and my credit was lousy. But I let go. I trusted. I went to the car dealership, and the gentleman there let me look around. I told him what I wanted, and he said he had one car that fit the description. We walked out back, and he was right. It was perfect. It was gold and beautiful and new. I said, does it have a cassette player? He looked and nodded. Well, I said, let's do the hard part. Let's see if I can buy it. We filled out forms, and he asked me to place a deposit. I didn't. I wasn't confident enough to think I would get the car, so I put nothing down on it. I then left. I drove to a friend's outside of the city, and we played music all day, him strumming his guitar and me blowing on my harmonica. Later in the afternoon, I decided to call a dealership. You qualify, said the salesperson. I was stunned. I do? Are you looking at my paperwork, I asked? I'm Joe Vitale. He laughed and assured me he was. He then asked me when I wanted to pick up my car. I went and picked up the car in delighted shock that it was mine. Although I had no idea how I would make the payments, I did. In fact, I mailed my checks in early. And that's not all. As soon as I decided to get the new car, my life went into an upward spiral of magical coincidences. Suddenly, the money I needed appeared. Clients began to call. Classes sold out. 
I was invited to speak to groups I had never heard of, and two publishers gave me book offers on the very same day. In some real way, my allowing the car in my life sent a message to the universe that I was trusting. Instead of worrying and wondering how I'd pay the bills, I leaped off the mountaintop of fear and, to my surprise, I didn't fall. I soared. But I had to get clear inside before any of this could happen. Had I gone to buy a new car when I was still carrying limiting beliefs about what I could have afforded, my beliefs would have sabotaged my purchase. I would have attracted not paying for the car to support the beliefs I had at the time. The first thing that had to happen was clearing the beliefs. And for the record, I went on to buy four new cars from that same dealership over the next decade. Clearing beliefs can really pay off. Money Beyond Belief What do you tell yourself when you look at your business and see it isn't yet where you want it to be? Do you blame it on the economy, your salespeople, your marketing, on your own ability to accomplish anything? Whatever your answer, that is a belief. Common ones include, I must work hard for the money I earn. I need more money than I can generate. I feel helpless in changing my financial picture. I think my salespeople are loafing. I don't handle money and wealth well. What you want to do is replace negative beliefs with positive ones, such as, Money is a natural manifestation of the universe. It's good to be rich. I don't have to work hard for my money. I am destined for great wealth. My staff earns money for me. I handle money and wealth well. You see, most of the beliefs you have were given to you when you were a child. You simply absorb them. Now you are becoming awakened. You are at choice. You can choose to let go of the beliefs you don't want, and you can choose to replace the beliefs with ones that better serve you. Other beliefs come from our culture itself. I was sitting in a movie theater just today, explaining to a friend how we can consciously choose new beliefs when over the speakers came the song, It Ain't Easy. It kept repeating the same words, It Ain't Easy, It Ain't Easy, It Ain't Easy. That song was followed with the Rolling Stones classic, You Can't Always Get What You Want. My friend and I started laughing, realizing the cultural brainwashing at work. Unfortunately, no one else in the theater seemed to realize they were being programmed with limiting beliefs. I remember that I used to have the belief, the more I spend, the less I have. Seems logical, doesn't it? If you spend your money, you will have less of it. But I decided to change that belief. Instead, I accepted the new belief. The more money I spend, the more money I receive. Now, I know I'll receive money whenever I write a check. Why? Because I choose to believe that. You can do this, too. As you become aware of the beliefs you have about wealth, ask yourself if you want to continue believing them or if you would prefer new beliefs. Then, consciously choose the belief you prefer. You may have to do this a few times at first, but the end result will be attracting the results you prefer. Isn't that a wonderful feeling, to know that you can now create your life the way you want it to be? Remote Clearing Clearing beliefs can be an easy process. The easiest time I ever had was when I wanted to overcome my sinus allergies. I had suffered terrible sinus infections and sinus headaches for years while I lived in Houston. I can't begin to describe how miserable they made me feel. I took herbs. I had acupuncture treatments. I wore air purifiers. Everything helped, but nothing worked permanently. Then one day, I asked my dear friend Kathy Bolden, a remote healer, if she would try to help me. While having dinner, I looked her in the eyes, slammed my fist on the table, and said, I don't want relief. I want healed. I want this thing gone. Well, my intensity shook her. But she also realized how sincere I was and how much pain I had been in. 
she said she would try to help. And she did. She went home, got quiet, and used her skills to clear my body. I was not present as she did this. I wasn't even aware that she did anything. But within a few days, I noticed that I could breathe again. I called her and asked what she had done. You had some negative energy in you, and I scared it off, she said. Apparently, she was able to use her remote healing skills to clear my beliefs and my energy from a distance. Talk about making things easy for me. I loved it. Releasing the Past Here's another example of clearing beliefs. This one still amazes me because it happened to my ex-wife and I saw the dramatic change right before my eyes. Marion never learned to drive a car. I was her chauffeur for more than 15 years. Oh, I'm not complaining. That's just the way it was. But after seeing my changes with my work with Jonathan and other healers, Marion wondered if she could get clear about driving. She booked a session with Jonathan. Within one hour, she was clear. What happened? Marion remembered being a little girl and being in the back seat of her mom's car as her mom learned how to drive. Her mom was naturally nervous. Marion picked up on that energy and locked onto it. While Marion went on to grow up, the little girl who sat in the back seat of her mom's car remained alive in her. As an adult, that little girl kept Marion from driving. Under Jonathan's guidance, Marion was able to remember that experience and release it. She realized it was an old memory and it no longer served her. She let it go. Her energy was now clear. And today, Marion drives her own car, a new one to boot, and she loves it. I remember one night, there was a terrible storm in Houston with lots of flooding. I was worried about my wife and how she would handle the weather. When she got home late that night, I ran to the garage to greet her. What I saw amazed me. Marion was smiling ear to ear. Her face was beaming. She rolled down her window and said, I had an adventure. Even being stuck in traffic is something Marion now feels grateful for. She simply sits there and listens to music. And one day we went to lunch in separate cars. After it, I was behind her at the stoplight. I saw her moving her lips and tapping her fingers on the steering wheel. I wondered if she were getting impatient. Then I pulled up closer and realized she was singing and tapping her fingers to the music. Talk about a transformation. Later, Marion was in a bad car accident. She was hit by a van and hit hard enough to break the back axle on her car. Despite the shock of it all, Marion was fine, although her car wasn't. Now here's the juicy part. Two days later, Marion was ready to rent a car and start driving again. I couldn't believe it. I told her I was proud of her, that many people are too nervous to drive so soon after an accident. Marion just looked at me, smiled, and said, Why? Driving is too much fun not to do it. Free your past. Jonathan has a saying, It's all energy. What he means is that we are energy systems. If we are clear, the energy moves in one direction. If we aren't clear, the energy moves in several directions and without full power. Carolyn Mace a medical intuitive and author of Anatomy of the Spirit, talks about being plugged into the past. If there was a situation in your life where you were hurt, abused, or anything unfinished, you are probably still carrying around that unfinished business. You are still plugged into that old event. That means a part of your energy is still back there, reliving and probably recreating the old event. I know this is tough to understand, but let's use another example from Mace. Think of the energy you get each day as cash. You wake up in the morning with $500 available for the day, but you are still mad because your spouse said something mean to you last night. Well, that's going to cost you. You are spending $50 to keep that energy alive in you. And say you are still upset because a friend owes you money from five years ago. 
Now you are spending $100 to keep that memory alive. And let's further assume you were abused as a child. You are spending another $100 to keep that memory in you. You woke up with $500 to spend, but before you get out of bed, you have spent half of it on old memories. When you try to attract something today, you won't have all of your energy available to make it happen. When you get clear of the old events, hurts, memories, and beliefs, you will have more energy to attract what you want now. And the more energy you have now, the more you will get. You will end up like the supermodel who once said, I don't wake up for less than $10,000 a day. Your Results Another saying Jonathan has is, The energy you give out is the result you get. Oh yes, he's great at coming up with mind benders like that. But I think he means that the beliefs you have create the results you get. If you are unconsciously sending out vibes that attract lousy conditions, you will experience lousy conditions. If you find yourself recreating similar events, like my friend who has been married seven times so far, you know you are stuck in an energy pattern that will continue to create those events until it gets dissolved. My dear friend Carol Truman, author of the great book, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die, put it this way, It's the continual suppression of unresolved feelings and emotions that cause the problems we experience in our lives. I can hear you now. How can I get out of this pattern? One of the fundamental principles of Jonathan Jacobs' work is that everything is energy. It's not a new idea. Stuart Wilde writes about it in his books. Joseph Murphy refers to it in his works. Bob Proctor talks about it in his seminars. Scientists are discovering it as well. Nothing exists but energy formed into things we then name, like tables, chairs, houses, cars, people. The thing is, you and I are different from tables, chairs, houses, and cars because we are spiritual. That's the miracle of our lives. As Bob Proctor once told me, although everything is energy, the difference between people and objects is that we are spiritual. That means we have the means to alter and influence other energies. We can change the energy of a table, chair, house, car, or even other people. Taken a step further, it means we are all connected. If we're nothing but energy and we are all one, then what you do affects me and what I do affects you, even if we're miles or even continents apart. Got it? Oh, well, neither did I at first. So let's look at a couple of stories that may help. How to Change People One day, a client of mine hired me to be his marketing wizard. He gave me a lot of money, and I hired some folks to help me. All went well. Months passed. Then one day, the bomb dropped. My client suddenly sent me a letter saying I had lied to him. It was two pages of pain for me to read. It got pretty confusing, and it made me dizzy, confused, and shocked. I had meetings with my staff, and I even called my client. I couldn't figure out why this was happening. I sent the client a two-page letter explaining my position. The next day, I got another two-page letter from him, almost as shocking. Finally, I went to Jonathan. The key word is trust, Jonathan pointed out. You keep saying he didn't trust you. Let's look at how that applies to you. Where in your own life aren't you trusting, Jonathan asked me. Now, this is typical of Jonathan. He'll have you look at your own life to see how what you are complaining about is relevant. In a way, you use your experiences as mirrors. You use the outer to see what you are doing inside. Now, stay with me on this. I thought and I said to Jonathan, Well, I've never done marketing like this before. He's hired me to direct his entire marketing campaign and expects me to lead his staff to victory. I guess I don't trust that I can do it. Jonathan then said, And that's what your client is picking up on, on an energy level. 
That's the signal you are sending out. What do we do, I asked. Jonathan said, are you willing to release the fear and feel the trust? Yes, I said. And that's about all it took. I felt a shift inside me, and I felt that I knew I could trust myself to do the job. I let go and breathed a sigh of relief. I feel it happened so easily because most of me was already clear with the problem. I didn't have a lot of work to do in clearing old beliefs. Now here comes the good part. I went home and called my client. He answered and sounded remarkably at peace. I told him I was going to do a great job for him. I know you are, he said, stunning me. I decided a little while ago to trust the man I hired to do his job. You decided a little while ago, I asked. When? Yes, he had decided to trust me about the time Jonathan and I looked at the trust issue in me. Once it was clear in me, my client felt it. Once I sent out a different signal, my client picked it up. Coincidence? Hmm, then let me tell you another story. Where money comes from. Another client of mine went on to great fame and fortune. He's a 25-year-old stockbroker who wrote a book on wealth. I knew it would be a success before he did. I acted as his literary agent and marketing consultant and went to work to find a publisher for his book. As it worked out, he left me and went to an agent in Dallas, thereby cutting me out of the $45,000 in profits I would have earned from his $300,000 advance. But he's a very honorable guy, and he said he would pay me some money when he got his big advance. Days passed. Weeks passed. Months passed. Nothing. I wrote him a few kind notes. I sent him copies of my articles to share my own successes. I called him a few times and left messages. Still nothing. I asked Jonathan about it. He suggested I write a letter to the client and state my feelings, state what I want, and forgive him. I went home and did that. It felt pretty good. But still nothing. I went to Jonathan and said I did what he told me, but still no reply. Well, what does that mean? Jonathan asked me. Well, it means he hasn't contacted me yet. And? And it means he may rip me off, I said. Well, there it is, Jonathan announced. There what is, I asked. Jonathan said, it's the fear of being ripped off that is blocking your energy. That's the belief in your way. How do I let go of that, I asked. Jonathan said, feel that feeling of being ripped off. I closed my eyes and did so. Jonathan said, let it take you back to the other times when you may have been in experiences where you decided on beliefs about money and people. I recalled being taken by a Dallas company for money I had nearly died to earn. I had felt cheated. I held a grudge against that company for nearly eight years. I breathed into that feeling and felt a shift inside. I opened my eyes and smiled. Jonathan explained, the money he owes you doesn't have to come from him. The universe is prosperous and can give you money in a wide variety of ways. Release the need for him to pay you, and you allow the money to come. Wow, accepting that concept is a biggie. It means totally letting go of any and all grudges against people. It means trusting that you will get what you want as long as you aren't attached to how it comes to you. I felt like the release was there. I felt lighter and clearer. And when I got home, there was a message from my client. After six months of nothing, suddenly a call. He was very polite, very friendly, and said he was mailing me a four-figure check. He did, too, as I received it the next day. I feel that only a fool would call that experience a coincidence. The connection is too obvious and happens to me too often to blow over as mere chance. As Jonathan says, it's all energy and we're all connected. Clean the energy pathways and you can have, do, or be 
anything you want. What runs your life? If you feel that you have cleaned your energy circuits and are free from the past, and yet you aren't attracting money or miracles or anything else, then you haven't cleaned your energy circuits or gotten free from the past. Now, this happened to me a few years ago. After doing several sessions with Jonathan by phone, I realized that my income wasn't increasing. Oh, my bills were being paid, and money was arriving just in the nick of time to pay them, but it was too close for my comfort. I began to get worried. That's not a good sign. My worry was evidence that I had some unfinished business to clear up. I wanted to contact Jonathan, but he was not available. Then one day, Bill Ferguson offered to give me one of his sessions. Bill is a former divorce attorney who has created a way to help people release the key core issue that sabotages their lives. He's been on Oprah, and he's written several books, including Heal the Hurt That Sabotages Your Life. I was helping Bill with his publicity, and he wanted me to experience what he does. When he said I could have a session with him, I accepted especially since it was free. Now that I have had it, I would have been willing to pay anything for it. People are starving to learn how to find peace, Bill told me when I went to his Houston suite. But they keep looking outside of themselves and blaming people or circumstances for how they feel. That's not how life works. Bill asked me to think about a recent event that pushed my button. Well, that was a snap. I had just fired a client of mine who didn't agree with my ideas on how to promote his business. I was insulted and angry. Bill said, Note that how you felt had nothing to do with the other person. All the person did was reactivate your hurt by pushing the right button. Once you disconnect the hurt, your hot button for emotional pain won't be there. Every one of us has a hurt from the past that runs our life, Bill added. For one person, the hurt is failure. For another, it's the hurt of feeling worthless, not good enough, not worth loving, or some other form of not feeling okay with who they are. Bill added that avoiding these feelings creates emotional pain. Bill went on to say, until a person releases the core issue, it will continue to operate. You could be 90 years old and still recreating painful experiences because of a core belief you accepted when you were six years old. Although many psychotherapies believe people have unresolved past issues, few claim that they can be healed quickly. Bill developed a new technology that helps people release their emotional pain, and in under two hours. You might say he has created a way to achieve push button healing. Pick another event where you were upset, Bill told me. I did. Again, it was easy. While I hadn't thought about it before, I suddenly began to see a pattern. Almost every time I was upset with someone, it was because I felt insulted. What does it mean that you feel insulted, Bill probed? After a moment, I realized it meant that I didn't feel good enough. I must not be good enough, went my logic, because these people don't like what I am doing, and I end up being insulted. Bill now started to rub my nose in it. How's it feel to not be good enough, he asked. Oh, I was getting depressed. I looked into Bill's boyish face, wondering if he really wanted me to feel this bad. He did. Bill went on to say, until you can fully feel the hurt that's been buried alive inside you, it will continue to operate and sabotage your life. Whew! By now I was feeling like life itself wasn't worth living. Bill went on to say, if you are truly feeling the key issue for you, you should be feeling like life isn't worth living. Oh, I'm there, Bill. I'm there, I said slowly. Well, good, Bill declared. So how's it feel to be not good enough? Like the worst feeling I've ever felt, I said. And Bill asked, can you accept that you really aren't good enough? I struggled with that one. 
well, I could look at my life and clearly find evidence that I was good enough, I had to admit that I wasn't good enough in all areas. And I had to further admit that this belief that I wasn't good enough was unconsciously causing me to be upset with clients and friends. I had been losing many opportunities, even money. Yes, I can admit it, I finally said to Bill. Something shifted right there. I somehow felt lighter, more relaxed, free. Where before I felt tense and even angry, now I felt relaxed and calm, even happy. It was as if some giant electrical wiring had been disconnected and I suddenly looked at life differently. Bill and I did some additional work before I left, but after the session I noticed major differences. Nothing seemed to irritate me the way it used to. The next day I had a client argue about an ad I wrote for him, and this time I didn't fly off the handle. I calmly stated my case, and I noticed that I looked at each moment with love and optimism, and I saw that I wasn't afraid to do things that I used to not do at all, like play the guitar in front of friends or perform magic over dinner. Before, I didn't feel good enough, and I also noticed that money started to roll in. One morning, a few days after my work with Bill, a woman faxed me that she was sending me a check for several thousand dollars to begin promoting her business. What had happened? Now that the core belief was disconnected, I had opened the energy centers in me to allow the abundance of the universe to flow my way. And flow it did. The Science of Getting Rich in Wayne Dyer's book, Manifest Your Destiny, he says if you aren't manifesting what you want, there probably is an absence of love somewhere in your inner world. That's another way of discovering where you may not be clear inside. Think of how you feel about the people involved in what you want to create. If there is a negative charge or uncomfortable feeling about someone, you aren't clear with that person. Forgiveness is the best way I know for getting clear by yourself. And the best way to become forgiving is to feel gratitude. I'll talk more about gratitude a little later, but for now know that if you focus on what you like about people, you will feel grateful, and then you will begin to forgive, and then you will get clear. And when you get clear, you can have, do, or be whatever you want. Here's one more easy way for you to get clear, and it's something you can do on your own. I learned it from my friend Bob Proctor at one of his famous Science of Getting Rich seminars. Take two sheets of paper out. On the first sheet, describe the negative condition you are in. Describe the picture of the situation as it is now, and really feel the emotions associated with it. This probably won't feel great. But you want to get into that feeling, because the more you feel it, the more you will release it. In other words, whatever emotion you suppress will sooner or later need to be expressed. While it's suppressed, it's clogging up your inner vibration. Release it, and you free your energy to go out and attract what you want. Let your feelings come to the surface as you describe the situation or condition that you don't want. Do that now. Now put that first sheet aside. Take the second sheet of paper and begin to write out how you want the situation or condition to be. Get into the joyful feeling associated with having or doing or being the thing you desire. Really immerse yourself in this good energy. Describe the situation the way you want it to be, and paint this wonderful picture so completely that you can feel it as you write it. Just as you wanted to experience the negative emotion so you could release it, you now want to experience the positive emotion so you can create a new picture to anchor in your subconscious mind. The more you can fall in love with this new image and these new feelings, the faster you will manifest them. 
Now take the first sheet, look it over, and burn it. Take the second sheet, fold it up, and carry it with you for a week. You're done. You probably just cleared yourself of your negative block. And if it should ever resurface, just do the exercise again. See? It's easy. The Mustard Seed Years ago, I gave a talk about spirituality at a business conference. At one point, I told the audience that I carry a souvenir coin with a mustard seed in it. The coin has a saying engraved on it, reading, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible for you. I then asked the crowd, Have you ever thought about a mustard seed? I paused and then added, A mustard seed has no doubts. It doesn't second-guess its goal. It doesn't worry, wander, or fret. It is clear. This is the essence of this step in the attractor factor. You want to be clear within yourself, no doubts, so you can attract the very thing you say you want. As Ernest Holmes wrote in Creative Mind and Success, you can attract only that which you first mentally become and feel yourself to be in reality without any doubting. But how do you get clear? Karmic Surgery Dr. Marcus Gitterly is an emergency room physician and anti-aging specialist. We met after he read one of my books, loved it, and emailed me saying he lived in the same small town I do. We had lunch and became quick friends. One day, he told me about a way to do karmic surgery. Now, this was news to me and made me aware of a new tool that was almost magical. It could help you release any troubling problem or heal any condition or achieve any intention and do it without your doing anything. In fact, others did it for you. Mark explained it like this. Just as you have a problem and go into the surgery, the problem is taken out while you are asleep. When you awaken, the problem is no longer there. You might be told to rest more, to drink more fluids, but in essence you are now free of the problem. All you did was agree to let others remove it for you. What Mark is talking about are yogiyas or yognas. These are known in the East and little known in the West. They are not surgery, but instead a way to have spiritual masters perform rituals on your behalf with the intent to achieve your intention. I know this may sound strange, but yagyas have a long history. A yagya is a religious or spiritual ceremony performed by a Hindu priest in order to alleviate karmic difficulties. Basically, a yagya is the chanting of specific Vedic mantras, sounds, by professionally trained and dedicated Vedic pandits. This is generally the most preferred method to dissolve a crisis situation or a dangerous, life-threatening one. But you can also use yagyas to get clear, so you can have, do, or be whatever you want. Rather than continue trying to explain what a yagya is, let me instead give you a testimonial on how one influenced my best friend. Saved from Death My best friend of two decades was on her deathbed a year ago. After being in a near-fatal car accident, having both knees replaced, her back broken, suffering from depression, then becoming suicidal and anorexic, Due to medication she never should have accepted, she was taken by ambulance to the hospital, where she lay unconscious and dying. We had already tried everything. She had gone to healers, doctors, therapists, and psychiatrists. I hired home health care for her. She prayed, meditated, listened to tapes. I asked 500 friends of mine to pray for her and send her healing energy. Nothing was breaking her free. I feared I would lose my best friend of 25 years. In desperation, I arranged for a two-month-long yagya to be done for her. 
Within two days, she woke up in the hospital, sat up, and stood up. The day before, she could not move or even turn over in bed. Now she was ready to go home. The hospital was stunned. The doctors couldn't explain it. They kept her for further testing and observation. But she just got better and better. A week later, the same woman who was near dead was released from the hospital. She is now walking, talking, smiling, driving, and very glad to be alive. I saw her yesterday. I thought I might never see her again. This is a genuine miracle. And that's the power of a yagya. Publishing Miracle Dr. Gitterly does yagyas for himself, wife, and son. I have done them several times for myself. Let me give you an example. As you know by now, this recording you are listening to is based on a popular little work I released a few years ago called Spiritual Marketing. I knew the book contained a powerful five-step process for manifesting your heart's desires, and I knew it from all the people who emailed me every day telling me their miraculous stories. What frustrated me was the fact that the book was basically available only online. I knew that it needed to reach a wider audience. So I set the intention to find a strong publisher with distribution abilities and the power to get my book out there into the world. To help make that intention happen more quickly, I arranged for a yagya. I went to www.jyotish-yagya.com and asked for a yagya to be done on my behalf. I didn't know how this would work or if it would work, but I trusted. I took action. Within a few weeks, I received an email from the senior editor at J. Wiley Publishers in New Jersey, who is now the publisher of my book, The Attractor Factor. Now stop and think about this. My original book, titled Spiritual Marketing, had been a number one bestseller at Amazon twice. Its success had been written about in the New York Times. The ebook version of the book had been downloaded an estimated one million times. The ebook had been translated into seven languages. Thousands of people wrote me about it. The best agent in the country shipped the book to major publishers for two years. Yet, nothing. Nothing ever happened to bring the book to a global audience until I arranged for a yagya to be performed to help my intention and to clear me of any inner blocks preventing my goal from manifesting. This is karmic surgery. A yagya is a way to clear you of any current blocks, whether those blocks are from this lifetime or another, so you can go on to attract what you want. Talk about effortless healing. The script. Finally, let me give you one more method for clearing yourself. This one doesn't cost any money, doesn't take more than a minute to do, doesn't hurt at all, and is guaranteed to work every time. Interested? The method involves a simple script that you say out loud to release a belief or a feeling you no longer want and to replace it with something you prefer. I learned it from my friend Carol Truman, author of the truly amazing book, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. I'll give you the script in a moment. First, understand that this powerful tool is so simple it's easy to dismiss. All you're asked to do is say a couple paragraphs of words. That's it. Yet what the script does is reprogram your basic DNA structure. It speaks to your spirit and asks it to help you get clear on the most fundamental levels of your own being. Now, I don't want to complicate things here by trying to explain how this process works. My job is to give you the tools and show you how to use them. After all, you don't need to know how a fax machine works in order to send or receive a fax. All you do is insert the paper and it does the rest. 
The script is the same way. All you do is say it, inserting in the appropriate place what you are feeling at the time that you want to get clear, and inserting in the appropriate place what you prefer to feel. Now this will make more sense once you know the words in the script, so here they are. Spirit, please locate the origin of my feeling, thought, of feeling negative about, insert the feeling or belief you want to release here. Take each and every level, layer, area, and aspect of my being to this origin. Analyze and resolve it perfectly with God's truth. Come forward in time, healing every incident based upon the foundation of the first, according to God's will. Until I'm at the present, filled with light and truth, God's peace and love, forgiveness of myself for my incorrect perceptions, forgiveness of every person, place, circumstance, and event which contributed to this feeling thought. With total forgiveness and unconditional love, I delete the old from my DNA, release it, and let it go now. I feel, insert the way you want to feel, I allow every physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual problem and inappropriate behavior based on the old feelings to quickly disappear. Thank you, Spirit, for coming to my aid and helping me attain the full measure of my creation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and praise God from whom all blessings flow. Simple, isn't it? Now, if you don't believe the script will work for you, use the script on that belief. In other words, insert... Help me release my doubt about the power of this script in the first open spot in the script. That's where you insert the belief or feeling you desire releasing. In the second spot in the script, insert the belief you prefer, which might be, I now understand that any belief can be changed in just a moment, even with such a simple tool as this script. Now, just before recording this book, Carol told me that she had a new and improved version of the script. She said this was even more powerful than the previous one. Here it is. Spirit, Superconscious, please locate the origin of my feelings, thoughts of, fill in the blank, take each and every level, layer, area, and aspect of my being to this origin. Analyze and resolve it perfectly with God's truth. Come through all generations of time and eternity, healing every incident and its appendages based on the origin. Please do it according to God's will until I'm at the present, filled with light and truth, God's peace and love, forgiveness of myself for my incorrect perceptions, forgiveness of every person, place, circumstance, and event which contributed to this, these feelings, thoughts. With total forgiveness and unconditional love, I allow every physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual problem and inappropriate behavior based on the negative origin recorded in my DNA to transform. I choose being fill in the blank. I feel fill in the blank. I am fill in the blank. Basically, use the same appropriate positive feelings for each blank line to replace the negative feelings. It is done. It is healed. It is accomplished now. Thank you, Spirit, for coming to my aid and helping me attain the full measure of my creation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and praise God from whom all blessings flow. Again, either script is powerful. Read Carol's wonderful book for a detailed explanation of it. The book is called Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. Meanwhile, use the script whenever you feel the need to get clear. It works almost like magic. And once you are clear, you can truly attract virtually anything you can imagine. Isn't this a fun, exciting, and even exhilarating way to live?
Step 4. Nevilleize Your Goal One of my favorite spiritual teachers is Neville Goddard. He wrote such classics as Out of This World and The Law and the Promise. He was a charming character who seemed to have access to a world most of us don't see. He taught people how to use their imaginal mind, add feeling, and create results. He once said in a lecture, I urge you to use your imagination lovingly on behalf of everyone and believe in the reality of your imaginal acts. If you have a friend who would like to be gainfully employed, listen carefully until you hear his voice tell you of his new position. Feel his hand clasp yours. See the smile on his lips. Use every sense you can possibly bring to bear into the imaginal scene. Persist until you feel the thrill of reality. Then drop it and let that scene fulfill itself on the outside. You may have noticed that Neville didn't say just focus on the image of your friend getting a job. He also advised you to hear your friend's voice and to feel your friend touch you and to feel the thrill of reality of the scene having taken place. Neville's great contribution to the science of attracting your own reality was the idea that you must first feel the thing you want as if you already had it. I call this Nevilleizing your goal. In one old book I have by Neville, he signed it with the phrase, Assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. That's the key. That's the secret. You have to learn how to nevilize your goal by assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled. How? Begin right now by answering the question, What do I want to have, do, or be? Now, get into the feeling of having already accomplished it. In other words, if your goal is to make $200,000 in sales this year, what does that feel like when you consider already having achieved it? You assume the feeling of that intention already fulfilled. What Neville was suggesting is that you must feel whatever it is you want to attract. You might see it in your mind, but until you feel it as already complete, you will be missing a key step in the attraction process. This is a step missing from virtually all self-help books. This is the step missing in most hypnosis, visualization, and other mind-expanding programs. This is step four in the attractor factor. Emotion has power. Marketing specialists know that people don't act for logical reasons, but for emotional ones. Emotion has power. Emotion also has the power to create what you want. Find within yourself what it will feel like to have, be, or do the thing you want, and you will begin to manifest the thing you want. The energy in the emotion will work to pull you toward the thing you want while also pulling the thing you want toward you. I know, I know, I'm getting philosophical again. But I'm talking about spiritual concepts which few people can relate to. It's easy to see why. We are taught from the crib to pay attention to reality, to obey the laws of man, to worship books and leaders. While that can help our society run smoother, Actually, it hasn't worked, but that's another book and another recording. It limits you. Belief in leaders, rules, and outside authorities limits you from creating the life you want. I once told a friend that a belief in a guru can limit her own power to manifest what she wanted. You'll see how this was true for me when you hear the shocking later section on the shocking true story of Jonathan. When you give your power away to anyone, you are spending your own energy in their direction. If you want to attract wealth and anything else, you need to own your own power. You need to own your own energy. You can ask everyone what they think about any of your goals, but in the end, you have to decide. You are the best authority on you. As my friend Mandy Evans often asked, after you read all the books and hear all the lectures, 
how do you know what to do for you? In short, you have to own your own energy and decide for yourself. This energy is a key ingredient in the attractor factor. A powerful energy. One of the most powerful energies you can ever experience is gratitude. Feel gratefulness for anything and you shift the way you feel. Feel thankful for your life, your lungs, your home, this recording, it doesn't matter. Once you feel grateful, you are in an energy that can create miracles. Jonathan taught me this. I remember going to see him when I was broke and depressed. One of the first things he did was guide me into realizing that I had plenty in my life. When you compare your own life to that of people living in third world countries, you quickly see that you are living like a king or queen. You probably have food, water, and shelter, as well as a refrigerator, a television, a radio, and probably a computer. Millions of people don't. Realize you are blessed with enormous abundance right now, feel grateful for it, and you will attract even more abundance. During illness. My friend Jonathan Morningstar, a completely different Jonathan, once cured himself of a terrible illness with a simple one-line statement of gratitude. Jonathan got double pneumonia. Nothing seemed to help him. Then he felt inspired to write down one simple but potent sentence that he repeated every hour, recorded on audio tape and played back to himself, and wrote on signs that he hung around his home. He made this one-liner part of his very being. And within 24 hours, Jonathan was healed. What was the one line he used? Thank you, God, for all the blessings I have and for all the blessings I am receiving. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I won't pretend to explain how this works. Somehow, your energy sends off signals that attract more of what you are sending off. Change your signals, and you will change your results. Change your energy, and you will change what you experience. The energy you give out is the results you get. That's the attractor factor. Again, gratitude can shift everything. Just start feeling sincerely grateful for what you have. Look at your hands, or this recording, or your pet, anything you feel love and gratitude for. Dwell on that feeling. That's the energy that can help you manifest whatever you want. Imagine the outcome. Another energy you want to experience is the energy that comes from imagining what it will feel like to have, be, or do the thing you want. Now, this can be fun. Imagine how good it will be to have what you want, to be what you are wanting, to do what you dream. Feel the electrifying feelings that come with the images. These feelings can create the life you want. They can manifest it for you. Somehow, those feelings lead you, guide you, direct you to the things that will make the events. The great German thinker Goethe may have said it best when he wrote the following inspiring message. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and endless plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance which no man could have dreamed would come his way. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. The Camera I was in Seattle once to see friends. 
One night, I turned on the television and caught the ending of a fascinating Larry King interview with the famous actor and singer Andy Griffith. Andy was talking about one of his first motion pictures. He said something unknowingly relevant to the attractor factor process when he talked about a director who told him, "The camera is just a machine; it picks up what you give it. All you have to do is think something and feel it, and the camera will record it." They then cut to a scene from the movie Griffith was referring to, when he was to look at a woman with a heart full of lust. You can tell from the actor's eyes that he was projecting thoughts that were pretty hot. Larry King later said it was one of the most X-rated looks in movie history. Well, the universe is like the movie camera: think something and feel something, and the universe will pick it up and project it. The advice Andy Griffith was given as a young actor is advice I want to give to you. When you know what you want, all you really have to do is think it and feel it. That's it. The universe, the spirit of all that exists, will pick up your signal and project it. Catching fire. This is powerful stuff. When Jonathan Jacobs and I practiced this, our energy levels shot skyward. We had so much energy surging through us that the very electrical outlets in our homes burst into flames. This is the truth. When I lived in the dump I could barely afford to pay rent for, the electrical system there fried. It cost the landlord over seven thousand dollars to repair it. When Jonathan was first experimenting with energy, the fuse box in his garage caught on fire. Although this isn't why they call me Mr. Fire, it does demonstrate that when you make changes internally, you'll see changes externally. Jonathan had to have a new fuse box put in. My landlord replaced the entire electrical system in the house, but as my energy increased, I also had to move into a bigger home with better wiring. Again, what you embrace in your inner world creates what you experience in your outer reality. Your inner becomes outer. Jonathan and I were having lunch at a favorite Chinese restaurant one day when I noticed there was hardly anyone in the place. The owners looked worried. They were huddled around their cash register and talking. Usually they came over to us, smiled, talked, and treated us like royalty. It was clear something was wrong. I mentioned this to Jonathan, saying they seemed concerned about money. Jonathan replied, "That's why they're concerned." Well, at first my mind screeched to a halt, but then I started laughing. Jonathan asked me what was so funny. I explained as best I could. Were you a Zen master in a past life or something? I began. What you just said was one of those unanswerable mind stretchers that Zen masters come up with. What do you mean? Jonathan asked. I said those people look worried about money, and you said that's why they're worried about money. To the outside world, that makes no sense. But it's the truth, Jonathan explained. Their concern for money was something already in them that got manifested. Now they notice it in the outer world. They manifested their belief. Jonathan then went on to tell me about a man he had worked with who ran an Indian restaurant and was failing at it. Business was lousy. He did a session with Jonathan and realized he didn't want to run a restaurant at all. Once he was clear, he let go of the restaurant and sold it. As a result, people started going to it under its new owner. Jonathan says, "Once you take care of the inner, it will show results in the outer." Cut through pain. Another time, Jonathan told me, "When you get the lessons, you don't need the experiences." As bizarre as all of that dialogue might seem to you, it's been the truth in my experience as well. One time, a company hired me to help promote one of their Dallas seminars. I advised them on what to do, and then I got angry when I saw that they did the opposite. They were, in essence, screwing up their own success. 
I talked to Jonathan about it. He asked me what I got out of this. In other words, what was the benefit to me? Assuming a part of me did create the company doing everything wrong, how would it serve me? I thought about it and had an answer. Their screw-up takes the pressure to succeed off of me, I explained. They hired me to help them make the seminar a success. I wasn't sure I could do it. By their not listening to me, they have almost guaranteed that the seminar will fail. When it does, I can point my fingers at them and say, you did it, not me. It keeps coming back to what we are doing and feeling inside plays a giant hand in what we end up experiencing. No matter what the situation you are in, some part of you helped create it. Get in touch with it, release the old beliefs and energy, and you can move toward creating what would serve you better and bring you more joy. One of the best ways to do just that is to focus on what you want, on how it would feel to have it, be it, do it. In this way, you can begin to attract it to you. Write your future. One wonderful technique to help you in this area is called scripting. I first heard of this method from my longtime friends Jerry and Esther Hicks. The concept is deceptively simple. Just imagine that you already have what you want and write out a scene that describes it. Describe in such detail that you can feel it. Pretend you are a movie director and write a script for what you want to experience. Really get into it as you write it, feel it, sense it, experience it. I have a notebook full of scripts. Every one I have written has come into reality. Again, when you think it and feel it, it comes to be. Why not take a few minutes and write your own script right now and right here? Just stop the recording, get some paper, and spend a little time writing out your future. Neville's advice may help you here. This is from his book, Immortal Man, and it works for both men and women. He says, First, have a dream. And by a dream, I mean a daydream, a gloriously wonderful daydream. Then ask yourself, what would it be like if it were true that I am now the man I am dreaming I would like to be? What would it be like? Then catch the mood of the wish fulfilled and drench yourself with that feeling. Now, choose what you want to experience. Whatever it is, write up a description of it as if it already happened. Instead of writing, I want a customer to call me with a big order, you write, a brand new customer just called and ordered $5,000 from me. I feel fantastic. The call came a few minutes ago. I'm still smiling about it as the customer was a delight to work with. They even gave me their credit card and I'm running it right now. You get the idea. Pretend the day is done and you are recording the experience of what you want to have happen in your journal after it happened. Be detailed, be joyful, enjoy the process. Describe it the way you want it just after the fact. Go ahead, stop the recording, and do it right now. Why not? If you didn't write a script right now, why not? You create your next moments out of this moment. What you do right now is the energy you send out that attracts what you get later. That's the attractor factor, remember? When you write a script, being sure to do it with emotion, you create a powerful thought form or ball of energy that goes out into the world to make your script come true. This is too important to pass over. We are all connected on an energy level. In 1943, Lucius Humphrey wrote in his rare little book, On the Beam, While we think of ourselves as individuals, we are not cut off from the whole. We are separate beings, but not separated beings.
Because we are all connected on this behind-the-scenes energy level, we can put requests into the universe at large, and if we're not too attached to the outcome, and we are open to receiving the outcome we requested, we will receive it or something better. The people involved in manifesting your request will feel your energy on an energy level. We're all connected, remember? They will be nudged by their own spirit within to help you achieve your goals. This is the spiritual formula for success that never fails. Guaranteed. This is the attractor factor. So again, stop the recording and write your script right now. You're printing your energy. It's worth mentioning right here that your business cards, letterhead, flyers, sales letters, and ads, everything you produce or hire someone to produce to market your business, all carry your energy in them. As a result, they will attract or repel the clients you say you want. Think back to some flyer or letter you received in your mail. As soon as you glanced at it, you felt one way or another about the service. You may have had an instant feeling that said, this looks interesting, or an instant one that told you, trash this. I'm not just talking about the look of the marketing piece, although that is part of it. When you or anyone you hire creates a marketing document, they put their thoughts and feelings into what they create. People don't have to be psychic to pick up on this vibe. If you unconsciously don't believe in your product or service, that belief will appear in your marketing materials, and people will sense it, and you won't get business. Again, feeling attracts miracles. When you know what you want, are clear about having it, and can feel the energy of what you want, you will begin to attract or pull it to you. And when you clearly feel this energy, you will create marketing pieces that convey it. Here's an example of what I mean. When I wrote a sales letter for a software product that I totally believed in, I got staggering results. People read the letter and sensed my sincerity and the product's benefits. As a result, over 6% of them sent in checks. In the world of direct mail marketing, that is excellent. But when I wrote a sales letter to offer a service I did not believe in, I got nearly no replies. Why? The same writer created both letters. But my lack of belief in the second item was conveyed to people. They picked up on my vibe and just knew they had better not order. Another example is the flyer I received to attend a workshop in Seattle. All I saw was a dark photocopy of the original flyer. So I wasn't dazzled by bright colors or fancy type, clever copy, or incredible graphics. But something about the flyer said, sign up for this event. I did. When I spoke to others at the seminar, all of them said they had the same feeling. Many added, I don't even know why I'm here. I saw the flyer and knew I was supposed to be here. Well, the people who put on the seminar were clear about what they wanted. That confidence appeared in their brochures, and the people came. Contrast that with a company I worked for at one time who wanted to put on a seminar about Internet marketing. This company was after only profits. There was no caring in their business and no sincere desire to serve people. That attitude showed up in their brochures. When they put on their event, they expected over 200 people to attend. Only 20 people showed up. You can't fool the attractor factor. Advertising works. I've noticed that many people have a negative attitude toward advertising. I think that's a limiting view. An ad can help you market your business. It can become another voice working on your behalf. It can be spiritual, too. One day, I was having dinner with Jerry and Esther Hicks and a friend. We were talking about marketing in general and advertising in particular. 
My friend said, you don't have to advertise. Well, you don't have to, I said, but you might want to. A good ad can increase your business. And Jerry Hicks said, the last time we ran an ad in a magazine, we got so many replies we couldn't handle them all. I dropped the ad until we hired more staff. Esther added, it doesn't matter what you put in the ad. People will sense who you are and what you are offering and make a decision from that feeling. Jerry and Esther have hired me to write their ads because they know I believe in their work. If I didn't believe in them, the ads I create for them would show it. And if they didn't believe in their work, the person they hired to create their ads would reveal that attitude. My friend Sandra Zimmer, who runs the Self-Expression Center in Houston, also knows the power of spiritually based advertising. Sandra consciously infuses her ads with her energy. She actually sits and meditates over her ad, sending her energy into the ad. As a result, her ads have a magnetic quality to them. She once told me that people hold on to her ads for as long as seven years. I know I had seen Sandra's ads for many years before I finally met her in person. Although her ads didn't look different, they felt different. There was just something about her ads that made them memorable. That something was Sandra's own energy. Sandra once told me advertising is important, but it's the energy you put in the ads that does the work. It's really the law of attraction at work. Again, who you are inside creates the results you get outside. Your inner attracts your outer. Even your marketing pieces carry your energy. Get clear, feel the energy of what you want to do, be, or have, and you will naturally go in the direction of attracting what you want. Jonathan's Method since I worked with Jonathan Jacobs for more than 10 years, seeing him almost weekly, I have a good idea of his method for creating results. As you know by now, he was able to help me and others achieve miracles. I think his three-step method is worth a closer look. So here's a typical session with Jonathan. 1. We meet, and he asks me what I want. This is the setting the intention stage. Once you decide on your outcome, the rest almost falls into place. So, Jonathan always began by focusing on your desire. What do you want? Two, we then focus on what is in the way of achieving my desire. Obviously, this is the getting clear stage of the process. Jonathan used his verbal skills to help me recognize what was blocking me from my success. What's in the way of your success? 3. We then channel energy to the intention. In other words, since we had a target and we had identified and cleared everything blocking the pathway to manifesting it, we now basically sent energy to the goal through us. So ask yourself, how can you receive energy to help you achieve success? As you can probably see, Jonathan used feeling in his last step to help magnetize the desire. That's how you use the attractor factor. In other words, he helped me bring in energy through my body with the idea that it would help manifest my intention. I'll try to explain this by using my Qigong education. Ancient Chinese Secrets Qigong is an ancient Chinese healing art. It resembles Tai Chi in that it uses slow movements, body awareness, and the intentional channeling of internal energy to produce results. Qigong is used to heal, rebuild, improve energy and circulation, and achieve and maintain a healthy body and mind. You can use a simple Qigong type of exercise to pull energy into your body, aiming it to attracting your goal. It looks like this. 1. Decide on what you want. 2. Get clear of anything in the way of having that goal. 
three. Bring energy into your body while holding your intention in mind. This is easier than it may first appear. All you have to do is breathe. As you breathe in, imagine the air is energy. See it travel into your body and to the achievement of your desire. Much of Qigong relies on you using your mind while you breathe and move your body. That's what I'm asking you to do here. In your mind, see your goal. Maybe you see it already accomplished. Maybe you can't see the goal, but you know on some level what it looks like when it's complete. Go there. Use your mind to experience your intention. As you breathe, imagine the air is energy going to that mental experience. See the energy fueling it, making it live. Just pretend your energy is magic that will breathe life into your intention. Let go. You don't need to do much more. And as you'll see in the next section on the final step in the Attractor Factor formula, letting go is very important. Burning Desire When I was in Australia in May 1999, I learned that many seeds don't open up and grow unless they are first burned. In the human body, you open your seeds of desires with the heat of emotion. Whenever you feel love or fear, two very strong emotions, you are turning up the heat. That heat reaches your deeper mind and opens the seed, the image, of what you want. How you do that is through feeling. The point of this step is that you must joyfully feel the energy of the thing you want to do, be, or have. As Joseph Murphy wrote in his little book, How to Attract Money, the feeling of wealth produces wealth. Or, as William Town wrote in 1920, a thought is powerful only when it is backed by feeling. Feeling gives thought its reactiveness. To merely make an affirmation of what you desire without faith or feeling will accomplish little. And Judge Thomas Troward, in his book, The Hidden Power, wrote, Our thought as feeling is the magnet which draws to us those conditions which accurately correspond to itself. Feel the joy of having what you want. Feel it right now and you will begin to attract it to you, and you to it. Step 5. The Ultimate Secret Here's a secret that may surprise you. When you want something, but can live without having it, you have upped the odds of your having it. This is one of the ironies of life. As long as you are playfully desiring something, but not addicted to your having it, the universe will most likely quickly bring it to you. But as soon as you say, I must have this, you begin to push it away. Why? Because you are sending out an energy to repel what you say you want. Because you are focused on need and not in the moment. Because you haven't learned the ultimate secret. Step 5. Let go. The Ego's Love Years ago I discovered that most of us, myself included, don't like to let go and allow because there's nothing for us to grapple with. There's no drama. Most of us feel that if we can't get in there and fight and struggle, we don't feel like we're accomplishing anything or getting anywhere. The struggle gives a sense of accomplishment. At least you can say, hey, I tried. The ego gets a big rush out of struggle. The ego gets to feel that it is doing something worthwhile. Well, that's okay. If your ego needs a pat on the back, let it struggle for some of the things that you desire. But the truth is, you don't have to struggle at all. Again, it can be another way, an easier way. I used to teach a class called The Inner Game of Writing. 
It was modeled after the work of Tim Galway, who wrote The Inner Game of Tennis and co-authored several other Inner Game books. What I discovered was that we have at least two distinct beings within us, not personalities so much as aspects of our mind. Galway called them Self-1 and Self-2. Self-1 can be likened to your ego, the part of you that wants to control. Self-2 can be likened to the inner master within you, the part of you that is connected to all things. The job of Self-1 is to select what you want and let go. The job of Self-2 is to bring it to you. Galway learned that when people learn to let go and trust, they got what they wanted more often than not, and it came much easier than if they fought for it. The same concept works in your life. Choose what you want and let God or the universe, whatever that means to you, bring it to you. Let it orchestrate the events that will manifest the thing you desire. Give up needing to know how you will manifest anything. Knowing how can become a limitation. If you choose to manifest something but can't consciously see a way to create it, you may give up. The conscious mind can't see all of the possibilities. Surrender control and you free the universe to bring you whatever you want. Tough to swallow? Well, let me tell you a story. Lost Secrets Miracle When I was working on one of my earlier books, The Seven Lost Secrets of Success, I was obsessed. I spent two years of my life on a mission to pay homage to Bruce Barton, a man who influenced our country but somehow fell through the cracks of history. One day, I received a call from a medical doctor in West Texas. He wanted to hire me to ghostwrite a book for him. Although I was reluctant, going to see him felt like the right thing to do. I flew there, visited with him, negotiated a contract, and flew back to Houston with a large check in my hands, a non-refundable retainer to hire me to write his book. Weeks passed, then months. During this time, I spent most of my energy working on my Bruce Barton book. I rarely worked on the Doc's book and never heard from him. I finally decided I should fly up to see him and that I should present some material to him. So I made a flight reservation and started writing his book. But an odd thing happened. Whenever I called the doctor's office, no one answered the phone. This went on for days. Then, a day before my flight was to leave, someone answered the phone. It was the doc's business manager. Bill, this is Joe Vitale, I began. Hi, Joe, he said, his voice sounding sheepish. What's going on, I asked. No one has answered the phone there for days. Well, Bill said there's been a change in plans. What, I asked. Bill mumbled something. I asked him to repeat it. I couldn't believe what I heard. He said, the doc's in jail. Well... To say I was stunned would be a lie. I was shocked. I was speechless. The doc's in jail, I blurted. Bill, what's going on? Well, he said the doc violated his parole. Again, I was shocked. You mean he's been in jail before? Well, Bill went on to say that the doc sent a bomb to his ex-wife, and he was caught and sent to prison. He was allowed to come out and be a doctor again, but he couldn't play with guns or bombs anymore. Oh, don't tell me, I said. Yeah, Bill said they found bombs in his desk. Well, it took me a while to recover from this event, but I want you to notice the miracle here. When I signed a contract with the doctor, I was given a large sum of money, non-refundable money money that enabled me to work on my Bruce Barton book. And then, when the doctor went to jail, I was free from his contract. I didn't have to write his book at all. Even trying to give his money back, which I wasn't obligated to do, was pointless. The doc was gone. 
somehow God or the universe or whatever you want to call the invisible powers that be set the stage for this grand event. Could I have orchestrated such an event? It's highly unlikely. How would I have written the ad? Doctor wanted. Must be ex-con, wants to write a book, and be ready to go back to jail in six months so I can keep his money. Uh, I don't think so. Your partner needs clear, too. Again, when you know what you want and are clear, you will be drawn to the thing you want and events will pull it to you. Jonathan sees this happen all the time. When two doctors in Seattle couldn't agree on office space they needed, they went to Jonathan. After one session, they were clear. Within 24 hours, they found the space they needed and signed a lease for it. I saw the same thing happen when my ex-wife and I wanted to buy a house together many years ago, while we were still married, of course. If you are trying to manifest something that involves another person, both of you have to be clear before you'll manifest the event. I had worked on myself to buy the house I wanted, but things still weren't working out. Finally, my ex-wife went to see Jonathan. She cleared up some old beliefs she had about self-worth and money. The very next day, the real estate people called. Three days later, we moved into the house, and this was after nearly 12 months of delays. Would you like an example from the world of business? Change the inner to change the outer. Dan Pointer is a dear friend and internationally recognized expert on self-publishing. He's written several books, including the famous Self-Publishing Manual. Dan also conducts weekend seminars in his home on how to self-publish and market your own book. He's been offering this seminar for over 10 years, has helped hundreds of people, but has always struggled to get people to register for the event. One day, Dan called me for my help. Joe, he said, I want you to write a brochure for me that is so powerful that people sign up for my seminar without my having to do a thing. Well, notice what Dan was doing. He knew what he didn't want, to pull teeth to get people to come to his seminar, and he knew what he did want, to have people call and register easily and effortlessly. From those two steps, he was led to calling me. When I agreed to create a new brochure for Dan, what did he have to do? Let go. He had to let go. He had to trust that he hired the right guy and all would be well. Although he didn't know it, letting go is a key step in the attractor factor process. He was intuitively following it. So I designed a flyer for Dan. He loved it, and he printed it. A few weeks later, I called him, and he said, my seminar is already sold out. It is, I yelled, delighted, but Dan stopped me in my tracks. But it isn't due to your flyer, he said. It isn't? Dan went on to say, the seminar sold out two weeks ago, but I only mailed out the new flyer last week. There had been a delay in the mailing. I asked, then what happened? Why did it sell out? Dan didn't know. But here's my guess. As you know by now, the energy you give out brings the results you get. When Dan stated his new intention and allowed me to create a new flyer for him, he was changing the inner signal he was sending out. Once you change the way you are inside, the outer world changes. Dan didn't even have to mail his flyer out. People picked up on the signals in the air and responded. Crazy? Well, maybe so. But as I've pointed out throughout this recording, the energy you give out attracts and creates the results you get. Change your inner energy, and you change your results. And for the record, I later saw Dan in Chicago, where he told me that due to my new brochure for him, his August seminar sold out in the previous June. My Nightingale Conant Miracle The following story reveals how one of my greatest dreams came true. 
I am sharing it with you in the hope that it will inspire you to go for your own dreams. It's all about the power of setting an intention and then letting go of it. If you've never seen the famous Nightingale Conant giant catalog of audio tapes on business, motivation, self-help, relationships, health, and spirituality, reach over to your phone right now and call 1-800-525-9000 or visit their site at www.nightingale.com. Request the catalog. It's free and well worth browsing. I wanted to have an audio program of my own in the Nightingale Conant catalog for many years. I wanted it for the prestige as well as for the profit. I wanted to be among their roster of greats. Tony Robbins, Tom Peters, Deepak Chopra, Bob Proctor, Brian Tracy, and Wayne Dyer. But until autumn 1998, this desire had only been a dream. Despite the fact that I always sent Nightingale Conant my new books as soon as they were published, I could never seem to ignite their interest in my work. But I never gave up. I simply held on to the dream, trusted that something would give sooner or later, and kept doing my thing, writing what I hoped were inspiring and informative books. And then something amazing happened. One day... A man began sending me email asking numerous questions about marketing in general and P.T. Barnum in particular. He was a fan of Barnum's and loved my book, There's a Customer Born Every Minute. I answered all of his questions, glad to help. Then one day I received a shock. The man sent me an email saying, If you ever want your material considered by Nightingale Conant, let me know. I'm their marketing project manager. You can't imagine my surprise or my delight. I immediately FedExed all of my books, my video, and my home study course, six audio tapes, and a workbook to my new friend at Nightingale Conant. He didn't like anything I sent him. Instead, he loved everything I sent. And right then and there, he began the long process of selling Nightingale Conant on me. He became my guardian angel. At Christmas time, he took down the star from the top of the company Christmas tree and replaced it with a photo of me. He took pictures of me and placed them throughout the offices of Nightingale Conant, including the men's and women's bathrooms. After 11 months of calls, faxes, many FedExes, and lots of photos of me, I am proud to announce that Nightingale Conant is carrying their first product by me. It's called The Power of Outrageous Marketing. It has been a bestseller for them for about three years now. This amazing story illustrates many lessons. The Power of a Dream I held my vision of what I wanted for years. The Networking Potential of the Internet My Nightingale Conant contact found me at my website at mrfire.com. The miracle that comes from having someone who believes in you. My contact believes in me to a staggering degree and told me so over and over again for 11 months. The true magic that occurs when you are in alignment with your life's purpose and doing what makes your heart sing. And the power of letting go. I'm sure there are other lessons in this story, lessons that you see and I don't. Again, I am sharing this with you in the hope that it sets your own heart on fire, awakens something in your soul, and urges you to go for and get your own dreams. And here's something else to think about. Thy will be done. According to research done at Spindrift Foundation on the power of prayer, a Thy Will Be Done prayer gets more than twice as many results as a specific Give Me This prayer. That's why it's so important to end your request for anything you want with the magic words, This or Something Better. When I was writing my book on P.T. Barnum, There's a Customer Born Every Minute, I went to the famous showman's grave in Bridgeport, Connecticut. 
I had a moving experience there, which I wrote about in my book. But what I want to share with you here is what I saw written on P.T. Barnum's gravesite marker. To my surprise, carved in his simple concrete headstone were these magical words, words that Barnum relied on throughout his colorful life. Not my will, but thine be done. Those magic words worked for Barnum, helping him to survive personal and professional disasters and to become one of America's first millionaires. And those words can work for you, too. In other words, trust the universe. Want something better? You can ask for whatever you want to do, be, or have, but also be willing for the universe to give you something better. End all of your requests with the phrase, this or something better, and you will be letting the universe know that thy will be done is of highest importance. Why is this so? Because the universe can see the big picture while your ego can't. Your job is to ask for what you want and then to act on the inner nudges you get to do things like make phone calls, write letters, visit a certain person, or whatever. Bob Proctor, in his wonderful book, You Were Born Rich, puts it this way. Learn to follow the quiet voice within that speaks in feelings rather than words. Follow what you hear inside rather than what others may be telling you to do. The universe itself will act to move you to what you want and move what you want to you. All you have to do is let go while acting on your inner prompts. Let go of fear, doubt, worry, disappointment, and any other negative emotion that might make you feel low. The famous poet and sage Rumi wrote something that may help you here. Some things that don't happen keep disasters from happening. Now think about it. What you're being asked to do is trust. Trust that when something happens, it's good. And trust that when something you want doesn't happen, it's good too. Wayne Dyer has an interesting book out called The Power of Intention. It claims to teach you how to get whatever you want. A friend read the book and said the title should be How to Get What You Want by Wanting What You Get. Well, exactly. The trick to manifesting whatever you want is to trust that whatever you get is what you wanted to manifest in the first place. You attracted it. The more you can understand this balance of wanting and allowing, or desiring and letting go, the more you will be happy in every moment. Let me explain this with a story. The Swan Terry Levine is a world-famous coach, best-selling author, and dear friend of mine. Early in 2004, she was contacted by Fox Television Studios about becoming the coach for one of their new shows. Terry would be seen weekly by a national television audience. Her name would become famous. She wanted to be selected as the coach, and as her marketing consultant, I wanted it for her as well. After weeks of interviews, email exchanges, and hints from the network leading Terry to believe she was going to be the coach for the show, she got a sad call one day. She was turned down. The executives at Fox had decided to go a different route and use a different coach. Terry was upset. You have to understand that Terry is one of the most positive people I know. She is upbeat bubbly, cheery, and always looking for the positive in every situation. But the news of her rejection crushed her. Nothing I could say made her feel better. In time, she let go of the experience, but she would always feel disappointed. Then, months later, the new Fox show Terry had been considered for was finally aired. It was about average to homely women who were transformed with plastic surgery, counseling, and coaching. Terry saw the show and was repulsed by it. She said, it doesn't stand for anything I believe in or would want to be associated with. I'm relieved I wasn't chosen to be on it. 
I sent Terry an email that day that she so loved, she told me she was keeping it in her wisdom folder. I had written the following. Some things that look like they are in our best interest are often not going to serve us when we see the big picture. We have to trust and let go, realizing that everything that happens is for our highest good. The Secret of T-I-I-S-G I'm riveted by the book A Lifetime of Riches, the biography of Napoleon Hill, the author of the classic book Think and Grow Rich. Not only did this man struggle for 20 years to write the definitive guide to success, but he experienced poverty, his life was threatened, his backers were murdered, he suffered from bouts of hopelessness, and his family suffered beyond all understanding. He was not an overnight success. One thing that stood out in Hill's life story was his ability to turn the negative into the positive. He always looked for what some people call that silver lining in the dark cloud. As I thought about Hill's life, I realized I'd been noticing this ability to see the good in the bad practiced by others, too. I was at a meeting with my friend Mark Joyner, Internet pioneer and best-selling author. I overheard Mark talking to a man who had just gone through hell due to the FTC. Mark listened to the man's sad story and then said, Turn it into something good. Now this is remarkable advice. It's the kind of thing Napoleon Hill would have said. It goes against what most people ever even attempt to try. The whole idea of taking whatever happens to you and turning it into something good seems, at first glance, preposterous. But this also seems to be a key to success. I remember P.T. Barnum offering to buy a rival's elephant. He sent a telegram stating his offer. His competitors took Barnum's telegram and ran it as an ad, saying, here's what Barnum thinks of our elephant. Well, instead of being upset, Barnum decided to join with those competitors. That gave birth to the famous Barnum and Bailey Circus. Barnum took the experience and turned it into something good. The other day, Nerissa, my love, released her first ebook at freevideoediting.com. She had a small mistake on her site. When I went to promote her site, I used the mistake as a way to get attention for her ebook. Now, I could have said, correct your site. Instead, I sent out an email that said, there is a mistake on her site. If you can spot it, I'll give you a gift. This caused people to be curious, a powerful motivator. It drove traffic to her site. Sales jumped. What I, Barnum, Joyner, and Napoleon Hill are doing is one thing. Taking the so-called negative experiences in life and turning them into something good. I call this T-I-I-S-G. It stands for Turn It Into Something Good. You have the ability to do this. It's a choice. No matter what happens, take a breath and ask, how can I turn this into something good? The question redirects your mind. Instead of looking at the problem, you are now looking for solutions. This is a brilliant way to learn how to operate your own brain. You become the master, not the slave, of your life. Andrew Carnegie, that tycoon who challenged Napoleon Hill to undertake his 20-year quest to uncover the secrets of success, confessed that the principal key to his own staggering success was the ability to operate his own mind. He told Napoleon Hill, I am no longer cursed by poverty because I took possession of my own mind and that mind has yielded me every material thing I want and much more than I need. But this power of mine is a universal one, available to the humblest person as it is to the greatest. It all begins with the basic T-I-I-S-G question. How can I turn this 
into something good. The answer will bring you new choices, happiness, and may lead to wealth you never dreamed of before. Just remember, T I I S G. Good. I attended Bob Proctor's three-day course called "The Science of Getting Rich" in Denver during 1999. It was a mind-expanding experience. I urge you to take the course live, if at all possible, or at least to invest in the home study course. There are so many things you'll get out of the material that where you are now will seem like poverty after you absorb the materials and become wealthy. But one idea that I got from Bob's course that I want to give you right now is this quote: "Everything that happens in your life is moving you in the direction of your goals." Now think about this. That statement says that everything, without fail, without exception, is moving you toward your dreams. So if something happens that you feel is bad, remember that it happened to move you forward. Your job is to find the positive in the negative, or at least to trust that there is a positive there, even if you can't see it at the moment. Now this might be tough to accept at first. But the truth is, it is an enlightened way of living your life. I love the statement and thank Bob Proctor for saying it. What it tells me is that I have to let go and trust that life itself is taking me to the things I desire. And as I let go, trust, and give thanks for my life, I feel different. I radiate a different vibration to the world, and better things and experiences come to me. Again, the whole secret is in learning to simply let go. But what do you do? Ever since my book *Spiritual Marketing* became a number one bestseller at Amazon, people have been writing me. Most of the time, people are just praising the book. Sometimes, people have questions about the five-step process in the book for creating wealth from the inside out. By far, the most common question is about step five, the one called "let go." But what do I do if I let go? Is the question I get the most. If I let go, don't I just sit there? What I didn't fully explain in that book is that you usually still have to do something to achieve your dreams. That something might be as little as answering the phone, or making a call, or buying a book. Or joining an association, or answering an email, I have no idea what that action will be for you to achieve your dream, but you usually have to do something, however small or large, a step. But the magic answer to the question of what action to do next is this: you want to take what I call inspired action. Inspired action is any action you take based on an inside nudge. In other words, an inspired action is when you suddenly get a desire to drive to the store. You may have no idea why you need to go to the store right now, but something within you is urging you out the door. Follow that hunch. It may lead to your goal. At the store, you may meet the right person or find the right product. Or pick up the right magazine that will lead you to completing your dream. For example, about 20 years ago, I was working for a major oil company. When I left for lunch, I always went to the food court at the closest mall. Always, talk about being stuck in a rut. One day, I decided to do something different. As I left for lunch that day, I felt an impulse to turn left where I always turned right. Now this may sound like nothing to you, but it meant the world to me. It was like leaving the planet and going to Mars. I was suddenly on an adventure. To my sheer amazement, only a few blocks away was an Italian deli. Now try to picture this. I'm an Italian living in Texas. I hadn't had good Italian food since leaving Ohio about 20 years earlier. To stumble across an Italian deli by Accident during lunch hour was almost miraculous. I went inside and met the owner. He was from Italy. 
He made me a sandwich that was so good I still drool today as I think about it. I was so grateful that I took his menu back to my office, shut my door, and created a whole new menu for him. I wrote new copy, designed it, and then printed him 500 copies. I then posted that new menu all over the company building. The next day, when I went back to the deli, the owner met me with tears in his eyes. His business had been booming all day. His lunch hour was packed with customers. He didn't know how to thank me. Well, I didn't need to be thanked. All I wanted was another sandwich. But this miracle didn't stop there. We became friends. When my ex-wife and I needed to move, and we began looking for a place to move to, the owner of the deli sold us his house. He wanted to move, but because he built that house for himself, he didn't want just anyone in it. When he learned I needed a new home, he arranged for us to buy his house. We lived in it for ten years, and Marion still lives in it today. And all because I took inspired action. Watch the signals. Once you state your intention and work the other steps in the attractor factor process, you need to watch the signals you get and act instantly on them when you see them. When I was working for a major oil company and hated my job, I used to pray for a way out. This was 20 years ago, and I felt lost. I felt trapped in my 9 to 5 prison. I would drive 35 miles each way, to and from a job I hated so much I would cry as I drove. It was pretty sad. But I stated my intention to break free. I then looked for the signals. Every day I would pass a street sign named Quitman. I never thought much of it until I realized it was a signal for me. The sign was on the freeway for people to know where to exit. But for me it meant quit, man. And I did quit my job. I've been happier ever since. Today I'm a well-known author, speaker, internet celebrity, and so much more. All because I took inspired action. Infinite Mind Here's another example. While writing my book, The Attractor Factor, a dear friend paid us an unscheduled visit. Now you have to realize that this is highly unusual. We live in the hill country outside of Austin, Texas. We are not easy to get to. And we don't usually appreciate people dropping in unannounced. After all, we work at home and would prefer not to be interrupted. I could be doing a radio show by phone, or Nerissa might be editing a video project. Our home is usually buzzing with activity. But our friend called at the right time, saying she was in the area, so we told her to come on over. The conversation was mostly about energy, remote viewing, mind over matter, and other such esoteric conversation. During our talk, our friend raved about a book called Infinite Mind. She told us she read and reread the book, underlined passages, and thought it was pure genius. I immediately took that as a signal for me to get the book. Why? Because the whole situation reeked of synchronicity. The fact that our friend appeared while I was writing that book seemed odd. The conversation directly applied to some of the principles in The Attractor Factor, and the book seemed like a must-have for my research. I immediately took inspired action. As soon as our friend left, I ran upstairs, jumped online, and ordered the book from Amazon for overnight delivery. Not only that, but while in this buying mode, I also ordered Manifesting Your Heart's Desires, Book 1, and Manifesting Your Heart's Desires, Book 2. They all turned out to contain key information to help me better communicate the attractor factor process to you. And all this from an innocent event that others might have dismissed. How to do this. So here's how to make inspired action work for you. Step 1. Set an intention. An intention is your declaration about your dream or goal that you want to be, do, or have. 
This is your request of your subconscious, unconscious, and the universe itself. The clearer your intention, the better your results. One of my intentions was, I intend to have a best-selling audio tape program with Nightingale Conant. Another was, I intend for my spiritual marketing book to become a number one bestseller at Amazon. Yet another was, I intend to find a new place to eat lunch. Step 2. Follow your hunches. Watch the signals. Listen to your intuition. If you get a desire to make a plan of action, well, so be it. Do it. But if you get a desire to go for a walk, or to watch television, or to surf the web, then do that. You never know where your inspired action will take you. But because you set an intention, step one, your intuition will find a shortcut to your dreams. Inspired action works because your ego can only see limited terrain while the universe can see it all. Your ego might say, write a business plan. Inspired action comes from the bigger picture, which you can't always see until you've taken the actions you're being inspired to take. Finally, the more you can quiet your mind, steal your thoughts, and relax your body, the more you will hear the inner voice nudging you in the direction of your dreams. When it speaks, move. That's inspired action. Do it, and you'll find amazing new shortcuts direct to the fulfillment of your stated desires. It's an easy path, more fun, more relaxed, and usually more profitable than planned action and constant struggle. Try it and see. A Secret About Money Let me tell you a secret about money. One day, Pat O'Brien, a wonderful Texas musician, well-known in Europe, walked into a mastermind group we are in and announced, One day I'm going to write a book titled The Myth of Passive Income. Well, he was joking. Everyone laughed. He had been working hard on his site at instantchange.com, and realized from first-hand experience that there is little passive about passive income. But I heard an opportunity. I said, you ought to write that book right now. Everyone shut up. They looked at me. It's a great idea, I explained. People think passive income is doing nothing all day and making money while you sleep. It isn't quite like that. So let's blow the whistle and tell people the truth. Well, Pat was beginning to learn how to act when opportunity popped up. I'll do it, he said. We met in the parking lot after the group meeting. He asked me, would you go ahead and write a letter asking people making money online if they would contribute an article to our book? We just want to know what a typical day for them is like. I bet they don't sit around doing nothing. Well, suddenly I was the co-author in this project. I see opportunities and jump on them, too. I agreed. I went home, went to my computer, and drafted a letter. It was simple. I asked successful business people online if they would tell us what a day was like in their passive world. I sent the letter to Pat. He approved it almost instantly. I then sent it out to every list owner I knew. This all happened within maybe three hours. Within 24 hours, we had wonderful articles by David Garfinkel and Tom Antion. Later the same day, I heard from Jim Edwards, Yannick Silver, Johan Mock, and other online giants, all agreeing to send articles for our book. Now note what happened here. A spontaneous joke became a project. That project began to take form within three hours. And within one day, the book was being written, and not by Pat or me. This process is how I created such money-making digital products as my online e-classes, several best-selling e-books, and even a few online promotional campaigns. I came up with the ideas and within minutes acted on them. The result? Success. So what does money like? Money likes speed. That's the secret few know about money. 
money comes to those who act fast. If you think, wander, question, doubt, plan, meet, discuss, or in any other way drag your feet, money goes to the next person in line. If you want to know how I've managed to write so many books and articles, it's because I act fast. This very section is an example. Twenty minutes ago, I got the idea to write something about money liking action. I thought I should write it some day. Then I thought, why not write now? Well, here you go. It's done. You now know the secret too. When you get an inspired nudge to take action, then take action. Don't wait. Act. Act right now. What are you waiting to do? Tend your garden. Many people say they don't want to take any action; that they just want to let go and let God. That reminds me of the story of the man with a beautiful garden in his backyard. One day, a man walked by, saw it, and stopped to admire it. The stranger said, "You have an amazing garden here," and the owner said, "Thank you." It's really God's garden, isn't it? The stranger asked. Yes, it is, replied the owner. But you should have seen it when God had it all by Himself. The point is, God, universe, spirit, or whatever name feels right for you, provides us with the basics, and we have to do something with what we've been given. If we just allow things to grow in the backyard, we'll have a jungle, not a garden. Someone has to tend to the earth. Take Jesus for example. According to Bruce Barton, author of the 1925 bestseller *The Man Nobody Knows*, Jesus was a businessman. He hired 12 employees, inspired them, and sent them out to spread his message. That's sound marketing. That's inspired action. Or take Phineas Parker Quimby. The man credited with being the father of New Thought or modern spirituality, Martin Larson calls Quimby the advertising therapist in his book *New Thought or a Modern Religious Approach: The Philosophy of Health, Happiness, and Prosperity*. He wrote, "From 1847 to 1859, the tireless searching Quimby went from town to town offering mental therapy through the power of faith." He distributed a brochure in 1855, which repudiated the mesmeric hypnosis technique, and which read in part, "Dr. P. P. Quimby would respectfully announce that he will attend to those wishing to consult him in regard to their health, and as his practice is unlike all other medical practices, it is necessary to say that he gives no medicine and makes no outward applications." But simply sits down by the patients, tells them their feelings and what they think is their disease. If the patients admit that he tells them their feelings, then his explanation is the cure. And if he succeeds in correcting their error, he changes the fluids of the system and establishes the truth or health. The truth is the cure. As you can see, even the great father of metaphysical healing. Handed out flyers in order to get new business. He didn't sit and do nothing. The point is, letting go doesn't mean do nothing. It means take action based on your inspiration. If you feel moved from within to make a call or run an ad or take a walk or build a community, then do so. Just have the spirit of non-attachment as you do. Non-attachment. Is letting go. Again, when you want something and are fine if you get it or not, then you are most likely going to receive it. You must let go of your attachment to success to attract success. Go to the light. Letting go doesn't mean giving up. When I went to Italy in 2004, I visited many people and places. From Michelangelo's tomb in Florence to the Pope at the Vatican, I found Italy to be a country rich in ancient history but poor in current prosperity. I met some snooty people and some warm ones. 
Sister Mary Elizabeth is one of the warm ones. She's the personal secretary to the Mother General of the Sisters of St. Philippini Order, which serves very poor women and children in third world countries. She is on my email list and a fan of my books. She once told me my ideas, as expressed in the ebooks Hypnotic Writing and Hypnotic Marketing, helped her raise funds to feed homeless and starving children around the world. It was a very gratifying thing to hear, to be sure. But odd things began to happen. While in Rome, I checked my email. I was stunned to see an email from my sound engineer telling me the master audio tapes to a program I had invested thousands of dollars to create had vanished. He had no explanation. He runs one of the best studios in the world, and he lost the masters. And here I am, on the other side of the planet, unable to do a thing about it. I couldn't believe it. Things got even stranger. We hired a driver in Italy to take us to Pompeii and Naples. We had a great day. But at the end of the day, while unloading the car, he suddenly told me he wanted more money than agreed on. He made the entire day feel ugly. Later that night, we went out to eat. It was our last evening in Rome. We had a nice dinner. But when we went to pay, we were told by an unfriendly French waitress, speaking only Italian, that their credit card machine was down. Well, we had no cash. We ended up leaving, promising to send them money for our meal. We got back to the States safely, but the strange world seemed to stay with us. I was told I owe thousands of dollars in back taxes on property I own. My agent was supposed to negotiate a deal with a publisher and ended up getting fired over it. We decided to go to Las Vegas and see some shows to relax. But on the flight there, I had chest pains and couldn't breathe very well. I thought I was having a heart attack. We landed safely, but the chest pain stayed with me. The next day, the house doctor at the Venetian took one look at me and sent me to the emergency room. I had never been in any hospital before, so this was scary. And with my chest pains, I thought I was never going home again. Several hours later, and $5,000 lighter, I was told I had asthma. We returned home, but the strangeness continued. One day, while I was typing a chapter in the book The Attractor Factor, an entire sentence repeated itself on my screen. At first I thought I imagined it. I deleted the sentence. But as I watched the screen, the sentence retyped itself on my monitor. Talk about bizarre. I assumed I had a virus and just shook my head. But what in the world was happening here? The Truth one day I drove out of town and spent the day with my chiropractor and dear friend, Dr. Rick Barrett, author of several books, including Healed by Morning. I needed to chill, to relax, to get some distance. I told him about these misadventures. I was feeling stressed to the max as I relayed all of what I just shared with you. I added, I feel like I picked up a curse in Italy. Nothing has been right since. Rick looked right at me and said, Maybe this all ties in. Huh? Maybe you are being attacked by the dark forces, he explained. You went to Rome. You went to the Vatican. You saw the Pope. These are all holy things. And you are focused on writing your new book, which could truly change the world. Yes, yes, go on. Well, Rick continued, maybe your move into the light is causing the dark to try to stop you. I'm not sure I follow, I said. Rick went on to explain, Whenever we go to Mexico to do our mission work, something bad happens. Me, my wife, other doctors, and other volunteers are planning to go to some truly impoverished areas and donate our time, medicine, and practice to help people there. It's a good cause. Yet every time we plan it, something happens. One time, I fell off a ladder one week before going. Another time, a woman was denied entry into Mexico because her papers weren't in order. 
it just seems like when you go to the light, sometimes the dark comes after you. I didn't agree with his assessment. From an attractor factor viewpoint, I'd say a part of us was showing its ugly head. When Rick fell off the ladder, it was the part of him that resisted the good another part of him wanted to do. He attracted the experience. It's the same with me. As I grew closer to completing my book, The Attractor Factor, I almost sabotaged my own efforts to make it a success. No evil force was out to get me. It was simply a part of me that resisted my intention. Dr. Valerie Hunt, writing in her book, Infinite Mind, put it this way. To acknowledge diabolical entities that possess power in and of themselves without the person's participation, I believe, is inaccurate and destructive. She adds, it assures protection from uncovering one's unfinished business because one is looking in the wrong place. In short, I had to get clear. I had to find out why a part of me was resisting what I wanted to actually attract. I did that, too, or else you would not be listening to this recording now. But back to the conversation with Dr. Barrett. How do we reinforce ourselves so the light wins, I asked him. Rick said, you have to tell yourself that nothing will stop you, that you won't give up, that you won't give in. Sometimes you just have to turn it over to God or the universe and say, I don't see the way. And there's the secret. You maintain your overall goal and you move toward it, always being sensitive to something better being offered, but you are not attached to the outcome either. The Ultimate Secret Again, the ultimate secret to attracting whatever you want is to want it without needing it. When you are detached to the outcome, you disconnect from everything that could sabotage your success. The attractor factor kicks into overdrive when you state your intention and are happy whether you achieve it or not. This is a delicate balance, but it's the major secret to how the universe works. In other words, in the world of everyday reality, struggling to achieve something causes the opposite forces within yourself to kick into play. But when you come from an inner place of serenity and you go with the flow towards your wishes, you have upped the odds of your achieving them. Your peace will attract peace. As Deepak Chopra wrote in his book, the spontaneous fulfillment of desire. Intention is not simply a whim. It requires attention, and it also requires detachment. Once you've created the intention mindfully, you must be able to detach from the outcome and let the universe handle the details of fulfillment. In short, you fully activate the attractor factor when you let go. Go. The Million Dollar Secret Formula What's the hardest part to creating life the way you want it? A friend asked me over lunch. I thought for a moment and replied, learning to stop figuring out how you will get what you want. My friend looked at me confused. She asked, what do you mean? I went on to say, if you try to figure out how you will get that new car, or that new house, or that new relationship, you'll limit yourself to what your ego can see and do. Turn your goal over to your unconscious, which is connected to the spirit of everything and everyone, and let it bring the goal to you and you to the goal. Just follow your inner promptings and act on the opportunities that come your way, and you'll get there. Well, I'm not sure if my friend understood what I was saying, but a few days later, I was sitting in a limousine, being driven to have dinner with eight wealthy, wonderful, self-made people. 
all of these people started with nothing. Many of them started as I had, with empty pockets and hope in their hearts. As I sat in the limo, a part of me couldn't believe I was there. How did I get here? I remember thinking to myself, I'm in a beautiful limo, with beautiful people beside me, going to have a beautiful dinner that some other beautiful person is going to pay for. I'm just a nobody kid from Ohio who left home to find fame and fortune. I used to dig ditches, drive trucks, work in the dirt, the rain, and the heat, and never enough money to pay my bills. How'd I get in this limo? As I thought about it, I knew the secret was the five-step formula I've revealed to you in this recording. It's the attractor factor. In short, the secret to increasing your business, finding your love, achieving better health, or manifesting whatever you want is as follows. Step 1. Know what you don't want. Step 2. Select what you do want. Step 3. Clear all negative or limiting beliefs. Step 4. Feel what it would be like to have, do, or be what you want. And Step 5. Let go as you act on your intuitive impulses and allow the results to manifest. Yes, that's it. The truth is, there's no one way to achieve anything in this world. Some people get new cars by winning them, others by struggling to pay for them, others by happily paying for them, others by other means. What I told my friend at lunch is the truth. You can't orchestrate the world to do your bidding. Instead, state your intentions and let the world arrange itself to bring your goals to you. In other words, you don't manufacture your outcomes, you participate in them. And you participate best when you allow your inner spirit to do most of the work. I was in that limo because I didn't plan to be in it. I allowed, acted, trusted, and accepted. I followed the five-step formula. I activated the attractor factor. And when the limo pulled up, I got in. Six Key Points Before we end this recording, let's go over some final key points in the attractor factor process. One. You are totally responsible for your experiences in your life. That doesn't mean you caused them, but on some level you attracted them. You are responsible for them. That's not good or bad. Simply use the experiences to learn about yourself. Get clear and choose what you prefer to experience. Two. You are absorbing beliefs from the culture itself. If you are watching movies about violence, or reading the papers, or watching the news, you are filling your mind with the very vibe that will attract more of what you soaked up. Mother Teresa said she would never attend an anti-war rally. Why? Because it contains the very energy that creates more war. Watch what you absorb. Choose what you want to attract. Be aware. 3. You are not ruler of the earth, but you have more power than you ever realized. You can move mountains with the right thought and action. Keep a balance of ego and spirit in your life, always striving to let your ego obey spirit. 4. You can change your thoughts. This often feels impossible to believe because it's not normal for the vast majority of people. But what you think is largely habit. Start noticing what goes through your head. If you don't like it, start consciously changing it. Choose new thoughts. 5. You can do the impossible. 
What you believe to be the restraints of time and space right now may simply be the limits of our current understanding. No one knows what is impossible. If you have an inclination to try something new and different, then so be it. Go for it. Make it so. You may be creating a path never seen before. Dare something worthy. 6. Whatever image you add feeling to will manifest. If you fear something or love something, you are adding energy to it. Anything you fear or love will tend to be attracted into your life. Choose your passions wisely. When your limo pulls up. Finally, I can't find any better way of ending this recording than with this quote from Francis Larimore Warner, written in 1907. When I was interviewed on a late-night talk show one evening, they asked me to read this quote to them twice. Then they were silent for a moment while the meaning of these words hit home. I'll end this recording with these same words and wish you Godspeed in making all your dreams come true. And when your limo pulls up, Get in. If we plant a seed in the ground, we know that the sun will shine and the rain will water, and we leave it to the law to bring results. Well, the desire you image is the seed. Your occasional closing of the eyes in imagery is the sun, and your constant, though not anxious, expectation is the rain and cultivation necessary to bring absolutely sure results. The Shocking True Story of Jonathan Nearly every day I get a call, an email, or a letter from someone asking, What happened to Jonathan? Every person asking the question marveled at the stories of my miraculous and even shocking work with Jonathan Jacobs, which is not his real name, and now they want to know what happened to the man himself. The thing is, Jonathan is no longer available. I'll tell you why, but you had better brace yourself. This may not be easy to hear. Jonathan clearly made a difference in my life. He was my miracles coach and my best friend for more than ten years. The stories you heard about in this recording are all true. Jonathan was a true helper in co-creating miracles for me and for lots of other people. But Jonathan was also human. Along the way, he started to let his ego take control of his success. I noticed little things at first. In conversation, he appeared more smug. He wanted the attention on himself, and he talked about his work more than most people wanted to hear. I let that slide because I was too involved in enjoying the results I was getting from my work with him. But it got worse. He started to have intimate relations with a few of his female clients. At one point, he was working at a clinic, doing his healing work, and was fired for inappropriate conduct with his clients. I supported him during that dark phase of his life because he was my friend. But it didn't stop there. Jonathan lost his father and went into a depression. He considered suicide. I was his lifeline and did my best to help him. I went and stayed with him. I counseled him. I used the very healing methods I learned from him to help him. After a few months, Jonathan came around moved back into life, and started to see clients again. But he was still stuck in his self. He again seduced his female clients. At least one was married, and her relationship with Jonathan caused her to fall into depression over her own guilt. But even that didn't end this downward spiral into hell. The turning point for me came when one day Jonathan manipulated and then molested the friend closest to me in my life at that time. Words cannot convey how badly this hurt me. I felt betrayed. My best friend, my guru, had become a criminal. 
The woman he molested couldn't handle this experience. Her healer and friend had manipulated and molested her. You can imagine what it did to her thinking. She called the suicide hotline. She called the rape crisis hotline. She began a long series of bouts with depression, then car accidents, then hospital visits, and more, ending with a near-fatal car accident. It didn't stop there for her, either. She then saw medical doctors who kept prescribing medication to numb what she was feeling. Later, the medications caused her to have seizures. She was hospitalized repeatedly and nearly died in the emergency room. At one point, she actually flatlined. It was a horrible time. During it, Jonathan hid. He never offered help. He never apologized, and he disappeared from our lives. My guru had stabbed me and left me bleeding. The pain was beyond words. I had to seek counseling myself. Even today, the memory still stings. This is my first time to record about the experience in such an open way. By now, you should know, I tend to look at life's experiences as a symbol. So I wondered why this happened. Why did Jonathan become evil? Why did he hurt me and others who loved him? What was the positive in this negative? How can I turn this into something good? I remember reading a helpful passage in one of my favorite books, Breaking the Rules, by Kurt Wright. It goes like this. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to look back on events that happened a year or more in the past and see the perfection in them? For most of us, this is true even for situations which seem tragic, horrible, or even devastating at the time. Now, if it is possible to see the perfection in those things a year later, doesn't it make sense that the perfection must be there in the moment it happens, too? Wow, what a freeing statement. It causes you to look for the positive in everything and to look for it right now. So I turned my light on the situation with Jonathan. All I could conclude was this was a gift of freedom. For over ten years, I had turned to Jonathan when I needed help. Well, now it was time for me to be my own healer, my own best friend, and my own guru. I was free. I feel better than ever before. I am grateful for Jonathan helping me during my time of need, and I wish him well wherever he is. I no longer want or need him in my life, but I am grateful for the time we had together. As for my abused lady friend, she died on October 2, 2004. She never fully recovered from the betrayal, the pain, or the humiliation of her experience with Jonathan. She tried to heal herself, and she tried to forgive him. But for the last three years of her life, she suffered. She only found peace in death. Meanwhile, my adventures continue, and my life is one of magic and miracles. How do I stay clear and focused? I work with several people these days to keep myself on track. There are healers around, of course. My only advice is for you to trust your intuition and not become addicted to a healer or a healing. The goal is freedom. The only path is your connection to spirit. Trust yourself. The Experiment Intentional Meditation Foundation Will you join me in transforming the world? I am looking for people all over the world to help lift the energy of the planet. With enough people practicing the attractor factor and using the meditation I plan to teach you in a moment, we can reduce crime, lower violence, and raise the wealth and prosperity of everyone near us. 
When I was on a radio show one night and announced my colossal plan to change the world, I was amazed to later hear from people in Africa, India, Ireland, New Zealand, Australia, and all over the United States, all volunteering to help. I got the idea for this rather noble project while reading the book Permanent Peace, How to Stop Terrorism and War Now and Forever by Robert Oates. That book reveals 19 scientific studies that proved when groups of people meditate that crime and violence in their area goes down. Oates writes in his book, The basic idea is simple to state. Like ripples on a pond radiating outward from a pebble's splash, ripples of orderliness and harmony radiate outward from concentrated groups of meditation experts. And the evidence for this idea has been repeated and statistically significant. Not only do signs of social disorder go down, such as violent crime, fires, traffic accidents, warfare, and terrorism, but signs of coherence and progress go up. Patent applications, for example, stock market levels, and economic indicators have all been shown to rise. Now, notice his last sentence. It suggests that meditation helps increase wealth. With that in mind, I decided to create a global set of hubs where people learn how to meditate to intentionally attract wealth. The idea is, the more you help yourself, the more you also help those around you. And as you help them, you help the planet. This is the noble purpose of the Intentional Meditation Foundation. It is a non-profit foundation designed to teach a specific meditation technique to people all over the globe with the purpose of lowering violence and increasing wealth wherever it is practiced. At the core of this movement is a 30-day event I'm calling The Experiment. When I told a close friend that I planned to run a 30-day experiment to see if meditation could raise the prosperity level of the people meditating as well as influence everyone near them, she asked me something interesting. Do you care that you are running this experiment during a war when people are worried about their jobs, their next payday, and maybe even their lives? Actually, that's why I'm running this experiment, I replied. This brief conversation intrigued me because her question assumed that outward events have the control. On the contrary, your income doesn't have to be affected by war, recession, pay cuts, or layoffs. You don't have to be a victim of circumstances. In my mind, outward events are simply the result of what we have already done inside ourselves. I'll repeat that. Outward events are simply the result of what we have already done inside ourselves. Maybe we attracted our current economic situation unconsciously, but we certainly attracted it. There is no right or wrong in that perspective. It simply is. Now, the really wonderful thing is that once you realize you are the creator, you can create the kind of life you prefer. And that leads me to the subject of this section. I'm asking for people to help me in what I am calling the experiment. This 30-day event is designed to bring you more money, almost by magic, but only if you do three things. One, record where you are now in your finances, and then, when the experiment is over, record the changes. Two, Meditate every day for 20 minutes using the technique I'm about to teach you. Three, act on the insights that you receive and or the opportunities that come your way afterward. That's it. Now, before I tell you the I am technique, let's cover a few basics to set the stage for what is about to happen. One, you are the creator. Now, just as I pointed out to my friend, you are the predominant creative force in your life. What is happening to you is being created in part by you. 
you are attracting it. This is good news. It means you can change those appearances to match what you consciously prefer. It also means you can be, do, or have anything you can imagine, because the person responsible for any of it is you. Two, your belief creates your reality. If you do this I am technique every day, but still believe it won't work for you, then it won't work for you. You have to believe that change is possible. Belief rules. Intention is king. We are belief beings, and the results are belief creations. Change your beliefs, and you change your life. Three, your feelings are the fuel. Your feelings are what fuel your beliefs, desires, hopes, and dreams. When you worry, you are fueling a belief in a negative outcome. When you have faith, you are fueling your belief in a positive outcome. Your feelings are the motivators that make things happen. A belief without feeling is a thought. With feeling, it's an intention. Four. Whatever you say after "I am" defines you. You create yourself by how you define yourself. Ask yourself, "Who am I?" and pay attention to your answers. That is what you are creating. Change your answers, and you change your results. Now, let's look at the "I am" process itself. I am stands for intentional meditation. Most meditation is not request oriented. That is, the meditation is simply a quieting of the mind. In and of itself, that is wonderful. I once had a T-shirt that read, "Meditation is not what you think." <laughs> exactly. If you're thinking, you're not meditating. Traditional meditation is beyond thinking or behind it, but intentional meditation is a departure from traditional meditation. In the I M method, you are focused on a specific outcome. You are thinking, and you are thinking with feeling. An I M is a request to the universe through your conscious intent. To attract a particular result, in other words, traditional meditators would sit and simply watch their thoughts. That is the meditation of my T-shirt. Meditation is not what you think. It's a wonderful method. I encourage you to do it. The Beatles made a form of meditation popular in the 60s called TM or Transcendental Meditation. In TM, you are given a mantra or special phrase to repeat over and over again as you sit. This mantra keeps your mind busy so your being can settle down and relax. TM is powerful. When people use meditation to lower crime rates, as reported in 19 separate studies in Oates' book, they were doing TM. But I M is different. I am is focused on achieving a result. You go into the meditation with a mental request and a feeling, which you amplify in your meditation. In other words, an I am meditation might be something like this: I see myself at the end of our 30-day experiment with my business goals for the month achieved. I'm feeling great, smiling, maybe singing or whistling, as I feel the exhilaration of having magically attracted more money easily and effortlessly. This statement is your intention. Your intention is what you use as a type of mantra in your meditation. So, are you with me? I'll walk you through an I am method to help make this clearer for you. Step one. Decide on what you want to achieve. Make it believable to you. Remember, belief rules. If you don't believe you can do it, you probably won't. Let it be a stretch, but be honest with yourself too. Again, what do you want to achieve at the end of the 30 days? How much more business or income do you want? Step two: 
write it down in one clear statement. For example, at the end of the 30-day experiment, I have an extra $15,000 in the bank from unexpected sources. Or maybe you would write down, at the end of the 30-day experiment, I have 20 new clients. Whatever it is, write it down for you. Step 3. Feel what it will be like to have achieved your intention. If you already had what you say you want, what would that feel like right now? Get into those feelings. Relish them. Roll around in them. How would you look? How would you act? How would you smile? Feel the feelings now. That's it. In short, here it is again. You simply take your intention, what you wrote down that you want, and you take the feelings of already having accomplished it, feel the success now, and spend 20 minutes a day soaking it up, pretending it's all happening right now. Again, that's it. So how does this simple method work? How does it make your intentions come true? In short, you are putting in a request with the universe. You are placing your order. Because you are clear about what you want, and you feel what you want, you have streamlined the process. The universe will hear you and will begin to orchestrate events to help you attract your intended desire. All you have to do is pay attention and act on your hunches. Trust the process. As I mentioned earlier, 19 separate studies proved that meditation can lower crime rate. Those studies were all about a form of transcendental meditation. In short, the meditators created a peaceful field, which radiated out and calmed everyone, including many potentially violent people. In the I am formula that I just described to you, you are quieting the mind as in meditation and even merging with all that is, but you are also placing a request with the universe. That request will radiate out and reach the people who could help you achieve it. From there, magic happens. I know much of this may seem strange, but I'm calling it an experiment so you can find out with me just how powerful this system can be. Yes, you can create change in your life. It all begins right now. Finally, for more information about this method, including recent research and case studies, go to www.intentionalmeditationfoundation.com. Gildan Audio presents your Coach in a Box. And I scared it off, she said. Apparently, she was able to use her remote healing skills to clear my beliefs and my energy from a distance. Talk about making things easy for me. I loved it. Releasing the past. Here's another example of clearing beliefs. This one still amazes me because it happened to my ex-wife and I saw the dramatic change right before my eyes. Marion never learned to drive a car. I was her chauffeur for more than 15 years. Oh, I'm not complaining. That's just the way it was. But after seeing my changes with my work with Jonathan and other healers, Marion wondered if she could get clear about driving. She booked a session with Jonathan. Within one hour, she was clear. What happened? Marion remembered being a little girl and being in the back seat of her mom's car as her mom learned how to drive. Her mom was naturally nervous. Marion picked up on that energy and locked onto it. While Marion went on to grow up, the little girl who sat in the back seat of her mom's car remained alive in her. 
As an adult, that little girl kept Marion from driving. Under Jonathan's guidance, Marion was able to remember that experience and release it. She realized it was an old memory and it no longer served her. She let it go. Her energy was now clear. And today, Marion drives her own car, a new one to boot, and she loves it. I remember one night there was a terrible storm in Houston with lots of flooding. I was worried about my wife and how she would handle the weather. When she got home late that night, I ran to the garage to greet her. What I saw amazed me. Marion was smiling ear to ear. Her face was beaming. She rolled down her window and said, I had an adventure. Even being stuck in traffic is something Marion now feels grateful for. She simply sits there and listens to music. And one day we went to lunch in separate cars. After it, I was behind her at the stoplight. I saw her moving her lips and tapping her fingers on the steering wheel. I wondered if she were getting impatient. Then I pulled up closer and realized she was singing and tapping her fingers to the music. Talk about a transformation. Later, Marion was in a bad car accident. She was hit by a van and hit hard enough to break the back axle on her car. Despite the shock of it all, Marion was fine, although her car wasn't. Now here's the juicy part. Two days later, Marion was ready to rent a car and start driving again. I couldn't believe it. I told her I was proud of her, that many people are too nervous to drive so soon after an accident. Marion just looked at me, smiled, and said, Why? Driving is too much fun not to do it. Free your past. Jonathan has a saying, It's all energy. What he means is that we are energy systems. If we are clear, the energy moves in one direction. If we aren't clear, the energy moves in several directions and without full power. Carolyn Mace, a medical intuitive and author of Anatomy of the Spirit, talks about being plugged into the past. If there was a situation in your life where you were hurt, abused, or anything unfinished, you are probably still carrying around that unfinished business. You are still plugged into that old event. That means a part of your energy is still back there, reliving and probably recreating the old event. I know this is tough to understand, but let's use another example from Mace. Think of the energy you get each day as cash. You wake up in the morning with $500 available for the day, but you are still mad because your spouse said something mean to you last night. Well, that's going to cost you. You are spending $50 to keep that energy alive in you. And say you are still upset because a friend owes you money from five years ago. Now you are spending $100 to keep that memory alive. And let's further assume you were abused as a child. You are spending another $100 to keep that memory in you. You woke up with $500 to spend, but before you get out of bed, you have spent half of it on old memories. When you try to attract something today, you won't have all of your energy available to make it happen. When you get clear of the old events, hurts, memories, and beliefs, you will have more energy to attract what you want now. And the more energy you have now, the more you will get. You will end up like the supermodel who once said, I don't wake up for less than $10,000 a day. Your results. Another saying Jonathan has is, the energy you give out is the result you get. Oh yes, he's great at coming up with mind benders like that. But I think he means that the beliefs you have create the results you get. If you are unconsciously sending out vibes that attract lousy conditions, you will experience lousy conditions. If you find yourself recreating similar events, like my friend who has been married seven times so far, you know you are stuck in an energy pattern that will continue to create those events until it gets dissolved. My dear friend Carol Truman, author of the great book, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die, put it this way. 
It's the continual suppression of unresolved feelings and emotions that cause the problems we experience in our lives. I can hear you now. How can I get out of this pattern? One of the fundamental principles of Jonathan Jacobs' work is that everything is energy. It's not a new idea. Stuart Wilde writes about it in his books. Joseph Murphy refers to it in his works. Bob Proctor talks about it in his seminars. Scientists are discovering it as well. Nothing exists but energy formed into things we then name, like tables, chairs, houses, cars, people. The thing is, you and I are different from tables, chairs, houses, and cars because we are spiritual. That's the miracle of our lives. As Bob Proctor once told me, although everything is energy, the difference between people and objects is that we are spiritual. That means we have the means to alter and influence other energies. We can change the energy of a table, chair, house, car, or even other people. Taken a step further, it means we are all connected. If we're nothing but energy and we are all one, then what you do affects me and what I do affects you, even if we're miles or even continents apart. Got it? Oh, well, neither did I at first. So let's look at a couple of stories that may help. How to Change People One day, a client of mine hired me to be his marketing wizard. He gave me a lot of money, and I hired some folks to help me. All went well. Months passed. Then one day, the bomb dropped. My client suddenly sent me a letter saying I had lied to him. It was two pages of pain for me to read. It got pretty confusing, and it made me dizzy, confused, and shocked. I had meetings with my staff, and I even called my client. I couldn't figure out why this was happening. I sent the client a two-page letter explaining my position. The next day, I got another two-page letter from him, almost as shocking. Finally, I went to Jonathan. The key word is trust, Jonathan pointed out. You keep saying he didn't trust you. Let's look at how that applies to you. Where in your own life aren't you trusting, Jonathan asked me. Now, this is typical of Jonathan. He'll have you look at your own life to see how what you are complaining about is relevant. In a way, you use your experiences as mirrors. You use the outer to see what you are doing inside. Now, stay with me on this. I thought and I said to Jonathan, Well, I've never done marketing like this before. He's hired me to direct his entire marketing campaign and expects me to lead his staff to victory. I guess I don't trust that I can do it. Jonathan then said, And that's what your client is picking up on, on an energy level. That's the signal you are sending out. What do we do, I asked. Jonathan said, Are you willing to release the fear and feel the trust? Yes, I said. And that's about all it took. I felt a shift inside me, and I felt that I knew I could trust myself to do the job. I let go and breathed a sigh of relief. I feel it happened so easily because most of me was already clear with the problem. I didn't have a lot of work to do in clearing old beliefs. Now here comes the good part. I went home and called my client. He answered and sounded remarkably at peace. I told him I was going to do a great job for him. I know you are, he said, stunning me. I decided a little while ago to trust the man I hired to do his job. You decided a little while ago, I asked. When? Yes, he had decided to trust me about the time Jonathan and I looked at the trust issue in me. Once it was clear in me, my client felt it. Once I sent out a different signal, my client picked it up. Coincidence? Hmm, then let me tell you another story. Where money comes from. Another client of mine went on to great fame and fortune. He's a 25-year-old stockbroker who wrote a book on wealth. I knew it would be a success before he did. 
I acted as his literary agent and marketing consultant and went to work to find a publisher for his book. As it worked out, he left me and went to an agent in Dallas, thereby cutting me out of the $45,000 in profits I would have earned from his $300,000 advance. But he's a very honorable guy, and he said he would pay me some money when he got his big advance. Days passed. Weeks passed. Months passed. Nothing. I wrote him a few kind notes. I sent him copies of my articles to share my own successes. I called him a few times and left messages. Still nothing. I asked Jonathan about it. He suggested I write a letter to the client and state my feelings, state what I want, and forgive him. I went home and did that. It felt pretty good. But still nothing. I went to Jonathan and said I did what he told me, but still no reply. Well, what does that mean? Jonathan asked me. Well, it means he hasn't contacted me yet. And? And it means he may rip me off, I said. Well, there it is, Jonathan announced. There what is? I asked. Jonathan said, it's the fear of being ripped off that is blocking your energy. That's the belief in your way. How do I let go of that? I asked. Jonathan said, feel that feeling of being ripped off. I closed my eyes and did so. Jonathan said, let it take you back to the other times when you may have been in experiences where you decided on beliefs about money and people. I recalled being taken by a Dallas company for money I had nearly died to earn. I had felt cheated. I held a grudge against that company for nearly eight years. I breathed into that feeling and felt a shift inside. I opened my eyes and smiled. Jonathan explained, the money he owes you doesn't have to come from him. The universe is prosperous and can give you money in a wide variety of ways. Release the need for him to pay you and you allow the money to come. Wow, accepting that concept is a biggie. It means totally letting go of any and all grudges against people. It means trusting that you will get what you want as long as you aren't attached to how it comes to you. I felt like the release was there. I felt lighter and clearer. And when I got home, there was a message from my client. After six months of nothing, suddenly a call. He was very polite, very friendly, and said he was mailing me a four-figure check. He did, too, as I received it the next day. I feel that only a fool would call that experience a coincidence. The connection is too obvious and happens to me too often to blow over as mere chance. As Jonathan says, it's all energy and we're all connected. Clean the energy pathways and you can have, do, or be anything you want. What runs your life? If you feel that you have cleaned your energy circuits and are free from the past, and yet you aren't attracting money or miracles or anything else, then you haven't cleaned your energy circuits or gotten free from the past. Now, this happened to me a few years ago. After doing several sessions with Jonathan by phone, I realized that my income wasn't increasing. Oh, my bills were being paid, and money was arriving just in the nick of time to pay them, but it was too close for my comfort. I began to get worried. That's not a good sign. My worry was evidence that I had some unfinished business to clear up. I wanted to contact Jonathan, but he was not available. Then one day, Bill Ferguson offered to give me one of his sessions. Bill is a former divorce attorney who has created a way to help people release the key core issue that sabotages their lives. He's been on Oprah, and he's written several books, including Heal the Hurt That Sabotages Your Life. I was helping Bill with his publicity, and he wanted me to experience what he does. When he said I could have a session with him, I accepted especially since it was free. Now that I have had it, I would have been willing to pay anything for it. People are starving to learn how to find peace, Bill told me when I went to his Houston suite. 
but they keep looking outside of themselves and blaming people or circumstances for how they feel. That's not how life works. Bill asked me to think about a recent event that pushed my button. Well, that was a snap. I had just fired a client of mine who didn't agree with my ideas on how to promote his business. I was insulted and angry. Bill said, note that how you felt had nothing to do with the other person. All the person did was reactivate your hurt by pushing the right button. Once you disconnect the hurt, your hot button for emotional pain won't be there. Every one of us has a hurt from the past that runs our life, Bill added. For one person, the hurt is failure. For another, it's the hurt of feeling worthless, not good enough, not worth loving, or some other form of not feeling okay with who they are. Bill added that avoiding these feelings creates emotional pain. Bill went on to say, until a person releases the core issue, it will continue to operate. You could be 90 years old and still recreating painful experiences because of a core belief you accepted when you were six years old. Although many psychotherapies believe people have unresolved past issues, few claim that they can be healed quickly. Bill developed a new technology that helps people release their emotional pain, and in under two hours. You might say he has created a way to achieve push-button healing. Pick another event where you were upset, Bill told me. I did. Again, it was easy. While I hadn't thought about it before, I suddenly began to see a pattern. Almost every time I was upset with someone, it was because I felt insulted. What does it mean that you feel insulted, Bill probed? After a moment, I realized it meant that I didn't feel good enough. I must not be good enough, went my logic, because these people don't like what I am doing, and I end up being insulted. Bill now started to rub my nose in it. How's it feel to not be good enough, he asked. Oh, I was getting depressed. I looked into Bill's boyish face, wondering if he really wanted me to feel this bad. He did. Bill went on to say, until you can fully feel the hurt that's been buried alive inside you, it will continue to operate and sabotage your life. Whew! By now I was feeling like life itself wasn't worth living. Bill went on to say, if you are truly feeling the key issue for you, you should be feeling like life isn't worth living. Oh, I'm there, Bill. I'm there, I said slowly. Well, good, Bill declared. So how's it feel to be not good enough? Like the worst feeling I've ever felt, I said. And Bill asked, can you accept that you really aren't good enough? I struggled with that one. Well, I could look at my life and clearly find evidence that I was good enough. I had to admit that I wasn't good enough in all areas. And I had to further admit that this belief that I wasn't good enough was unconsciously causing me to be upset with clients and friends. I had been losing many opportunities, even money. Yes, I can admit it, I finally said to Bill. Something shifted right there. I somehow felt lighter, more relaxed, free. Where before I felt tense and even angry, now I felt relaxed and calm, even happy. It was as if some giant electrical wiring had been disconnected and I suddenly looked at life differently. Bill and I did some additional work before I left, but after the session I noticed major differences. Nothing seemed to irritate me the way it used to. The next day I had a client argue about an ad I wrote for him, and this time I didn't fly off the handle. I calmly stated my case, and I noticed that I looked at each moment with love and optimism, and I saw that I wasn't afraid to do things that I used to not do at all, like play the guitar in front of friends or perform magic over dinner. Before, I didn't feel good enough, and I also noticed that money started to roll in. 
One morning, a few days after my work with Bill, a woman faxed me that she was sending me a check for several thousand dollars to begin promoting her business. What had happened? Now that the core belief was disconnected, I had opened the energy centers in me to allow the abundance of the universe to flow my way. And flow it did. The Science of Getting Rich In Wayne Dyer's book, Manifest Your Destiny, he says if you aren't manifesting what you want, there probably is an absence of love somewhere in your inner world. That's another way of discovering where you may not be clear inside. Think of how you feel about the people involved in what you want to create. If there is a negative charge or uncomfortable feeling about someone, you aren't clear with that person. Forgiveness is the best way I know for getting clear by yourself. And the best way to become forgiving is to feel gratitude. I'll talk more about gratitude a little later, but for now know that if you focus on what you like about people, you will feel grateful, and then you will begin to forgive, and then you will get clear. And when you get clear, you can have, do, or be whatever you want. Here's one more easy way for you to get clear, and it's something you can do on your own. I learned it from my friend Bob Proctor at one of his famous Science of Getting Rich seminars. Take two sheets of paper out. On the first sheet, describe the negative condition you are in. Describe the picture of the situation as it is now and really feel the emotions associated with it. This probably won't feel great, but you want to get into that feeling because the more you feel it, the more you will release it. In other words, whatever emotion you suppress will sooner or later need to be expressed. While it's suppressed, it's clogging up your inner vibration. Release it, and you free your energy to go out and attract what you want. Let your feelings come to the surface as you describe the situation or condition that you don't want. Do that now. Now put that first sheet aside. Take the second sheet of paper and begin to write out how you want the situation or condition to be. Get into the joyful feeling associated with having or doing or being the thing you desire. Really immerse yourself in this good energy. Describe the situation the way you want it to be and paint this wonderful picture so completely that you can feel it as you write it. Just as you wanted to experience the negative emotion so you could release it, you now want to experience the positive emotion so you can create a new picture to anchor in your subconscious mind. The more you can fall in love with this new image and these new feelings, the faster you will manifest them. Now take the first sheet, look it over, and burn it. Take the second sheet, Fold it up and carry it with you for a week. You're done. You probably just cleared yourself of your negative block. And if it should ever resurface, just do the exercise again. See? It's easy. The Mustard Seed Years ago, I gave a talk about spirituality at a business conference. At one point, I told the audience that I carry a souvenir coin with a mustard seed in it. The coin has a saying engraved on it, reading, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible for you. I then asked the crowd, Have you ever thought about a mustard seed? I paused and then added, A mustard seed has no doubts. It doesn't second-guess its goal. It doesn't worry, wander, or fret. It is clear. This is the essence of this step in the attractor factor. You want to be clear within yourself, no doubts, so you can attract the very thing you say you want. As Ernest Holmes wrote in Creative Mind and Success, you can attract only that which you first mentally become and feel yourself to be in reality without any doubting. But how do you get clear? 
Karmic Surgery. Dr. Marcus Gitterly is an emergency room physician and anti-aging specialist. We met after he read one of my books, loved it, and emailed me saying he lived in the same small town I do. We had lunch and became quick friends. One day he told me about a way to do karmic surgery. Now, this was news to me and made me aware of a new tool that was almost magical. It could help you release any troubling problem or heal any condition or achieve any intention and do it without your doing anything. In fact, others did it for you. Mark explained it like this. Just as you have a problem and go into the surgery, the problem is taken out while you are asleep. When you awaken, the problem is no longer there. You might be told to rest more, to drink more fluids, but in essence you are now free of the problem. All you did was agree to let others remove it for you. What Mark is talking about are yogiyas or yognas. These are known in the East and little known in the West. They are not surgery but instead a way to have spiritual masters perform rituals on your behalf with the intent to achieve your intention. I know this may sound strange, but yagyas have a long history. A yagya is a religious or spiritual ceremony performed by a Hindu priest in order to alleviate karmic difficulties. Basically, a yagya is the chanting of specific Vedic mantras, sounds, by professionally trained and dedicated Vedic pandits. This is generally the most preferred method to dissolve a crisis situation or a dangerous, life-threatening one. But you can also use yagyas to get clear, so you can have, do, or be whatever you want. Rather than continue trying to explain what a yagya is, let me instead give you a testimonial on how one influenced my best friend. Saved from Death My best friend of two decades was on her deathbed a year ago. After being in a near-fatal car accident, having both knees replaced, her back broken, suffering from depression, then becoming suicidal and anorexic, Due to medication she never should have accepted, she was taken by ambulance to the hospital, where she lay unconscious and dying. We had already tried everything. She had gone to healers, doctors, therapists, and psychiatrists. I hired home health care for her. She prayed, meditated, listened to tapes. I asked 500 friends of mine to pray for her and send her healing energy. Nothing was breaking her free. I feared I would lose my best friend of 25 years. In desperation, I arranged for a two-month-long yagya to be done for her. Within two days, she woke up in the hospital, sat up, and stood up. The day before, she could not move or even turn over in bed. Now she was ready to go home. The hospital was stunned. The doctors couldn't explain it. They kept her for further testing and observation. But she just got better and better. A week later, the same woman, who was near dead, was released from the hospital. She is now walking, talking, smiling, driving, and very glad to be alive. I saw her yesterday. I thought I might never see her again. This is a genuine miracle. And that's the power of a yagya. Publishing Miracle Dr. Gitterly does yagyas for himself, wife, and son. I have done them several times for myself. Let me give you an example. As you know by now, this recording you are listening to is based on a popular little work I released a few years ago called Spiritual Marketing. I knew the book contained a powerful five-step process for manifesting your heart's desires, and I knew it from all the people who emailed me every day telling me their miraculous stories. What frustrated me was the fact that the book was basically available only online. I knew that it needed to reach a wider audience. 
So I set the intention to find a strong publisher with distribution abilities and the power to get my book out there into the world. To help make that intention happen more quickly, I arranged for a yagya. I went to www.jyotish-yagya.com and asked for a yagya to be done on my behalf. I didn't know how this would work or if it would work, but I trusted. I took action. Within a few weeks, I received an email from the senior editor at J. Wiley Publishers in New Jersey, who is now the publisher of my book, The Attractor Factor. Now stop and think about this. My original book, titled Spiritual Marketing, had been a number one bestseller at Amazon twice. Its success had been written about in the New York Times. The ebook version of the book had been downloaded an estimated one million times. The ebook had been translated into seven languages. Thousands of people wrote me about it. The best agent in the country shipped the book to major publishers for two years. Yet, nothing. Nothing ever happened to bring the book to a global audience until I arranged for a yagya to be performed to help my intention and to clear me of any inner blocks preventing my goal from manifesting. This is karmic surgery. A yagya is a way to clear you of any current blocks, whether those blocks are from this lifetime or another, so you can go on to attract what you want. Talk about effortless healing. The script. Finally, let me give you one more method for clearing yourself. This one doesn't cost any money, doesn't take more than a minute to do, doesn't hurt at all, and is guaranteed to work every time. Interested? The method involves a simple script that you say out loud to release a belief or a feeling you no longer want and to replace it with something you prefer. I learned it from my friend Carol Truman, author of the truly amazing book, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. I'll give you the script in a moment. First, understand that this powerful tool is so simple, it's easy to dismiss. All you're asked to do is say a couple paragraphs of words. That's it. Yet what the script does is reprogram your basic DNA structure. It speaks to your spirit and asks it to help you get clear on the most fundamental levels of your own being. Now, I don't want to complicate things here by trying to explain how this process works. My job is to give you the tools and show you how to use them. After all, you don't need to know how a fax machine works in order to send or receive a fax. All you do is insert the paper and it does the rest. The script is the same way. All you do is say it inserting in the appropriate place what you are feeling at the time that you want to get clear, and inserting in the appropriate place what you prefer to feel. Now, this will make more sense once you know the words in the script. So here they are. Spirit, please locate the origin of my feeling, thought, of feeling negative about. Insert the feeling or belief you want to release here. Take each and every level, layer, area, and aspect of my being to this origin. Analyze and resolve it perfectly with God's truth. Come forward in time, healing every incident based upon the foundation of the first, according to God's will. Until I'm at the present, filled with light and truth, God's peace and love, forgiveness of myself for my incorrect perceptions, forgiveness of every person, place, circumstance, and event which contributed to this feeling thought. With total forgiveness and unconditional love, I delete the old from my DNA, release it, and let it go now. I feel, insert the way you want to feel, 
I allow every physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual problem and inappropriate behavior based on the old feelings to quickly disappear. Thank you, Spirit, for coming to my aid and helping me attain the full measure of my creation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and praise God from whom all blessings flow. Simple, isn't it? Now, if you don't believe the script will work for you, use the script on that belief. In other words, insert, help me release my doubt about the power of this script in the first open spot in the script. That's where you insert the belief or feeling you desire releasing. In the second spot in the script, insert the belief you prefer, which might be, I now understand that any belief can be changed in just a moment, even with such a simple tool as this script. Now, just before recording this book, Carol told me that she had a new and improved version of the script. She said this was even more powerful than the previous one. Here it is. Spirit, Superconscious, please locate the origin of my feelings, thoughts of... Fill in the blank. Take each and every level, layer, area, and aspect of my being to this origin. Analyze and resolve it perfectly with God's truth. Come through all generations of time and eternity, healing every incident and its appendages based on the origin. Please do it according to God's will until I'm at the present, filled with light and truth, God's peace and love, Forgiveness of myself for my incorrect perceptions. Forgiveness of every person, place, circumstance, and event which contributed to this, these feelings, thoughts. With total forgiveness and unconditional love, I allow every physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual problem and inappropriate behavior based on the negative origin recorded in my DNA to transform. I choose being fill in the blank. I feel, fill in the blank. I am, fill in the blank. Basically, use the same appropriate positive feelings for each blank line to replace the negative feelings. It is done. It is healed. It is accomplished now. Thank you, Spirit, for coming to my aid and helping me attain the full measure of my creation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and praise God from whom all blessings flow. Again, either script is powerful. Read Carol's wonderful book for a detailed explanation of it. The book is called Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. Meanwhile, use the script whenever you feel the need to get clear. It works almost like magic. And once you are clear, you can truly attract virtually anything you can imagine. Isn't this a fun, exciting, and even exhilarating way to live? Step 4. Nevilleize Your Goal One of my favorite spiritual teachers is Neville Goddard. He wrote such classics as Out of This World and The Law and the Promise. He was a charming character who seemed to have access to a world most of us don't see. He taught people how to use their imaginal mind, add feeling, and create results. He once said in a lecture, I urge you to use your imagination lovingly on behalf of everyone and believe in the reality of your imaginal acts. If you have a friend who would like to be gainfully employed, listen carefully until you hear his voice tell you of his new position. Feel his hand clasp yours. See the smile on his lips. Use every sense you can possibly bring to bear into the imaginal scene. Persist until you feel the thrill of reality. Then drop it and let that scene fulfill itself on the outside. You may have noticed that Neville didn't say just focus on the image of your friend getting a job. 
He also advised you to hear your friend's voice and to feel your friend touch you and to feel the thrill of reality of the scene having taken place. Neville's great contribution to the science of attracting your own reality was the idea that you must first feel the thing you want as if you already had it. I call this Nevilleizing your goal. In one old book I have by Neville, he signed it with the phrase, Assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. That's the key. That's the secret. You have to learn how to nevilize your goal by assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled. How? Begin right now by answering the question, What do I want to have, do, or be? Now, get into the feeling of having already accomplished it. In other words, if your goal is to make $200,000 in sales this year, what does that feel like when you consider already having achieved it? You assume the feeling of that intention already fulfilled. What Neville was suggesting is that you must feel whatever it is you want to attract. You might see it in your mind, but until you feel it as already complete, you will be missing a key step in the attraction process. This is a step missing from virtually all self-help books. This is the step missing in most hypnosis, visualization, and other mind-expanding programs. This is step four in the attractor factor. Emotion has power. Marketing specialists know that people don't act for logical reasons, but for emotional ones. Emotion has power. Emotion also has the power to create what you want. Find within yourself what it will feel like to have, be, or do the thing you want, and you will begin to manifest the thing you want. The energy in the emotion will work to pull you toward the thing you want while also pulling the thing you want toward you. I know, I know, I'm getting philosophical again. But I'm talking about spiritual concepts, which few people can relate to. It's easy to see why. We are taught from the crib to pay attention to reality, to obey the laws of man, to worship books and leaders. While that can help our society run smoother, actually it hasn't worked, but that's another book and another recording, it limits you. Belief in leaders, rules, and outside authorities limits you from creating the life you want. I once told a friend that a belief in a guru can limit her own power to manifest what she wanted. You'll see how this was true for me when you hear the shocking later section on the shocking true story of Jonathan. When you give your power away to anyone, you are spending your own energy in their direction. If you want to attract wealth and anything else, you need to own your own power. You need to own your own energy. You can ask everyone what they think about any of your goals, but in the end, you have to decide. You are the best authority on you. As my friend Mandy Evans often asked, after you read all the books and hear all the lectures, how do you know what to do for you? In short, you have to own your own energy and decide for yourself. This energy is a key ingredient in the attractor factor. A powerful energy. One of the most powerful energies you can ever experience is gratitude. Feel gratefulness for anything, and you shift the way you feel. Feel thankful for your life, your lungs, your home, this recording. It doesn't matter. Once you feel grateful, you are in an energy that can create miracles. Jonathan taught me this. I remember going to see him when I was broke and depressed. One of the first things he did was guide me into realizing that I had plenty in my life. When you compare your own life to that of people living in third world countries, you quickly see that you are living like a king or queen. You probably have food, water, and shelter, as well as a refrigerator, a television, a radio, and probably a computer. Millions of people don't. 
realize you are blessed with enormous abundance right now, feel grateful for it, and you will attract even more abundance. During illness. My friend Jonathan Morningstar, a completely different Jonathan, once cured himself of a terrible illness with a simple one-line statement of gratitude. Jonathan got double pneumonia. Nothing seemed to help him. Then he felt inspired to write down one simple but potent sentence that he repeated every hour, recorded on audio tape and played back to himself, and wrote on signs that he hung around his home. He made this one-liner part of his very being. And within 24 hours, Jonathan was healed. What was the one line he used? Thank you, God, for all the blessings I have and for all the blessings I am receiving. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I won't pretend to explain how this works. Somehow, your energy sends off signals that attract more of what you are sending off. Change your signals, and you will change your results. Change your energy, and you will change what you experience. The energy you give out is the results you get. That's the attractor factor. Again, gratitude can shift everything. Just start feeling sincerely grateful for what you have. Look at your hands, or this recording, or your pet, anything you feel love and gratitude for. Dwell on that feeling. That's the energy that can help you manifest whatever you want. Imagine the outcome. Another energy you want to experience is the energy that comes from imagining what it will feel like to have, be, or do the thing you want. Now, this can be fun. Imagine how good it will be to have what you want, to be what you are wanting, to do what you dream. Feel the electrifying feelings that come with the images. These feelings can create the life you want. They can manifest it for you. Somehow, those feelings lead you, guide you, direct you to the things that will make the events. The great German thinker Goethe may have said it best when he wrote the following inspiring message. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and endless plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance which no man could have dreamed would come his way. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. The Camera I was in Seattle once to see friends. One night, I turned on the television and caught the ending of a fascinating Larry King interview with the famous actor and singer Andy Griffith. Andy was talking about one of his first motion pictures. He said something unknowingly relevant to the attractor factor process when he talked about a director who told him, the camera is just a machine. It picks up what you give it. All you have to do is think something and feel it, and the camera will record it. They then cut to a scene from the movie Griffith was referring to when he was to look at a woman with a heart full of lust. You can tell from the actor's eyes that he was projecting thoughts that were pretty hot. Larry King later said it was one of the most X-rated looks in movie history. Well, the universe is like the movie camera. Think something and feel something, and the universe will pick it up and project it. The advice Andy Griffith was given as a young actor is advice I want to give to you. When you know what you want, all you really have to do is think it and feel it. That's it. 
The universe, the spirit of all that exists, will pick up your signal and project it. Catching Fire This is powerful stuff. When Jonathan Jacobs and I practiced this, our energy levels shot skyward. We had so much energy surging through us that the very electrical outlets in our homes burst into flames. This is the truth. When I lived in the dump I could barely afford to pay rent for, the electrical system there fried. It cost the landlord over $7,000 to repair it. When Jonathan was first experimenting with energy, the fuse box in his garage caught on fire. Although this isn't why they call me Mr. Fire, it does demonstrate that when you make changes internally, you'll see changes externally. Jonathan had to have a new fuse box put in. My landlord replaced the entire electrical system in the house. But as my energy increased, I also had to move into a bigger home with better wiring. Again, what you embrace in your inner world creates what you experience in your outer reality. Your inner becomes outer. Jonathan and I were having lunch at a favorite Chinese restaurant one day when I noticed there was hardly anyone in the place. The owners looked worried. They were huddled around their cash register and talking. Usually, they came over to us, smiled, talked, and treated us like royalty. It was clear something was wrong. I mentioned this to Jonathan, saying they seemed concerned about money. Jonathan replied, that's why they're concerned. Well, at first, my mind screeched to a halt. But then I started laughing. Jonathan asked me what was so funny. I explained as best I could. Were you a Zen master in a past life or something, I began. What you just said was one of those unanswerable mind stretchers that Zen masters come up with. What do you mean, Jonathan asked. I said those people look worried about money, and you said that's why they're worried about money. To the outside world, that makes no sense. But it's the truth, Jonathan explained. Their concern for money was something already in them that got manifested. Now they notice it in the outer world. They manifested their belief. Jonathan then went on to tell me about a man he had worked with who ran an Indian restaurant and was failing at it. Business was lousy. He did a session with Jonathan and realized he didn't want to run a restaurant at all. Once he was clear, he let go of the restaurant and sold it. As a result, people started going to it under its new owner. Jonathan says, once you take care of the inner, it will show results in the outer. Cut through pain. Another time, Jonathan told me, when you get the lessons, you don't need the experiences. As bizarre as all of that dialogue might seem to you, it's been the truth in my experience as well. One time, a company hired me to help promote one of their Dallas seminars. I advised them on what to do, and then I got angry when I saw that they did the opposite. They were, in essence, screwing up their own success. I talked to Jonathan about it. He asked me what I got out of this. In other words, what was the benefit to me? Assuming a part of me did create the company doing everything wrong, how would it serve me? I thought about it and had an answer. Their screw-up takes the pressure to succeed off of me, I explained. They hired me to help them make the seminar a success. I wasn't sure I could do it. By their not listening to me, they have almost guaranteed that the seminar will fail. When it does, I can point my fingers at them and say, you did it, not me. It keeps coming back to what we are doing and feeling inside plays a giant hand in what we end up experiencing. No matter what the situation you are in, some part of you helped create it. Get in touch with it, release the old beliefs and energy, and you can move toward creating what would serve you better and bring you more joy. 
one of the best ways to do just that is to focus on what you want, on how it would feel to have it, be it, do it. In this way, you can begin to attract it to you. Write your future. One wonderful technique to help you in this area is called scripting. I first heard of this method from my longtime friends Jerry and Esther Hicks. The concept is deceptively simple. Just imagine that you already have what you want and write out a scene that describes it. Describe in such detail that you can feel it. Pretend you are a movie director and write a script for what you want to experience. Really get into it as you write it, feel it, sense it, experience it. I have a notebook full of scripts. Every one I have written has come into reality. Again, when you think it and feel it, it comes to be. Why not take a few minutes and write your own script right now and right here? Just stop the recording, get some paper, and spend a little time writing out your future. Neville's advice may help you here. This is from his book, Immortal Man, and it works for both men and women. He says, First, have a dream. And by a dream, I mean a daydream, a gloriously wonderful daydream. Then ask yourself, what would it be like if it were true that I am now the man I am dreaming I would like to be? What would it be like? Then catch the mood of the wish fulfilled and drench yourself with that feeling. Now, choose what you want to experience. Whatever it is, write up a description of it as if it already happened. Instead of writing, I want a customer to call me with a big order, you write, a brand new customer just called and ordered $5,000 from me. I feel fantastic. The call came a few minutes ago. I'm still smiling about it as the customer was a delight to work with. They even gave me their credit card and I'm running it right now. You get the idea. Pretend the day is done and you are recording the experience of what you want to have happen in your journal after it happened. Be detailed, be joyful, enjoy the process. Describe it the way you want it just after the fact. Go ahead, stop the recording, and do it right now. Why not? If you didn't write a script right now, why not? You create your next moments out of this moment. What you do right now is the energy you send out that attracts what you get later. That's the attractor factor, remember? When you write a script, being sure to do it with emotion, you create a powerful thought form or ball of energy that goes out into the world to make your script come true. This is too important to pass over. We are all connected on an energy level. In 1943, Lucius Humphrey wrote in his rare little book, On the Beam, While we think of ourselves as individuals, we are not cut off from the whole. We are separate beings, but not separated beings. Because we are all connected on this behind-the-scenes energy level, we can put requests into the universe at large, and if we're not too attached to the outcome, and we are open to receiving the outcome we requested, we will receive it or something better. The people involved in manifesting your request will feel your energy on an energy level. We're all connected, remember? They will be nudged by their own spirit within to help you achieve your goals. This is the spiritual formula for success that never fails. Guaranteed. This is the attractor factor. So again, stop the recording and write your script right now. You're printing your energy. It's worth mentioning right here that your business cards, letterhead, flyers, sales letters, and ads, every modern spirituality... Martin Larson calls Quimby the advertising therapist in his book, New Thought or a Modern Religious Approach, The Philosophy of Health, 
happiness, and prosperity. He wrote, From 1847 to 1859, the tireless searching Quimby went from town to town offering mental therapy through the power of faith. He distributed a brochure in 1855 which repudiated the mesmeric hypnosis technique and which read in part, Dr. P. P. Quimby would respectfully announce that he will attend those wishing to consult him in regard to their health and, as his practice is unlike all other medical practices, it is necessary to say that he gives no medicine and makes no outward applications but simply sits down by the patients, tells them their feelings and what they think is their disease. If the patients admit that he tells them their feelings, then his explanation is the cure. And if he succeeds in correcting their error, he changes the fluids of the system and establishes the truth or health. The truth is the cure. As you can see, even the great father of metaphysical healing handed out flyers in order to get new business. He didn't sit and do nothing. The point is, letting go doesn't mean do nothing. It means take action based on your inspiration. If you feel moved from within to make a call, or run an ad, or take a walk, or build a community, then do so. Just have the spirit of non-attachment as you do. Non-attachment is letting go. Again, when you want something and are fine if you get it or not, then you are most likely going to receive it. You must let go of your attachment to success to attract success.